The NAEB Radio Network presents Aldous Huxley with the first lecture in a series entitled What a Piece of Work is a Man. This lecture, a consideration of ancient views of human nature, was recorded at Kresge Auditorium for broadcast at this time. Here now is Dean John E. Burchard of the School of Humanities and Social Studies to introduce Mr. Huxley. Ladies and gentlemen of this intimate gathering, <laughs> It is nearly 40 years now since chrome yellow revealed itself to the admiring eyes of English reading people, including undergraduates, of which company I was then one. In the 40 years since, our lecturer has steadily produced new and important books covering a wide range of ideas, using many different literary treatments, and generally attaining a distinction of such an order that it is ludicrous for me to try to explain it to you. I suppose we all know that he was born in England, that he studied in Eton and Balliol, and that Balliol was endowed by a man who had a penance to pay, and that he lives at present in California, and I refrain from comments on that penance. Uh, <clears throat> We have a very good convention in the Western-speaking world when it comes to introducing presidents and queens. This is a convention that prevents the introducer from delivering a long biography. The name, same convention should, in my view, apply to introductions of great artists. You all know who Aldous Huxley is, or you would not be here. And at this point, I could properly turn the meeting over to him, except for the fact that if I may betray my antiquity by my simile, a dean on a rostrum is like a fire horse who fancies he has heard an alarm bell. And so I will perhaps tell you why Mr. Huxley is here. He is here as a centennial visiting Carnegie professor in the humanities. He will be here most of this semester and a small part of next semester in the spring at the time of our centennial conclave. Aldous Huxley represents a large section of the surfaces of contact between the sciences and the humanities. He's the right kind of man to have on this campus, and so I'm honored to present him to you to deliver the first of the seven lectures entitled as a whole, with his usual reference to Shakespeare, What a Piece of Work is a Man. We will begin tonight with a discussion of ancient views of human nature, Mr. Huxley. Let me begin by thanking the previous speaker and also to parody the title of this series and say what a piece of impertinence it is for a, an encyclopedically ignorant man to come and talk to extremely learned people. But there is a, a certain justification for this. Uh, <laughs> Which is this, that uh, really genuinely learned people are inhibited by their vast amount of special knowledge from straying beyond the boundaries of their own particular province. But fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And it is, I think, part of the function, perhaps, of the ignorant but uh, widely interested uh, literary man uh, to go crawling about on the woodwork between the pigeonholes and to look in here and look in there and to try to make some kind of a coherent picture of the whole elaborate uh, system of compartments which has grown up in our academic world. Well, to, in this series I propose uh, to talk very imperfectly and uh, and. Um, partially, about this, what is our most profound and searching and difficult problem, the problem of human nature. Uh, what a piece of work is a man, as Shakespeare said. And, of course, he illustrated uh, this uh, remark by the whole corpus of his plays. He, he showed us what a piece of work a man was, 
and uh, from uh, Falstaff to Cassius and from Malvolio to Hotspur, from um, Iago to Cordelia, he showed us the entire range of what this extraordinary multiple amphibian can do and be. Now, in uh, what is to follow, tonight what is to follow, I propose uh, to uh, talk about what sort of a piece of work uh, this uh, strange creature is. And before we come to uh, the contemporary views on the problem, I think it's worthwhile uh, to devote an hour uh, to what our fathers thought about themselves and about human nature. After all, they were no stupider than we are. The, the difference between us and them is that we know more than they did. But uh, perhaps by knowing more, in some respects, we don't know as much about certain things as they did. They chose to pay attention to certain things which we don't pay attention to. So that in some ways, it may be that they, they made up for their general scientific ignorance by certain insights which perhaps we have uh, shut ourselves off from. Well, I shall begin by talking first about the, uh, the view of man which we find uh, in Homer, the father of uh, Western poetry. We find Homer, of course, is not a philosopher and not a psychologist, but he was an extremely shrewd observer and he evidently represented the general point of view of his times. And I shall begin by quoting a very interesting passage from the uh, 19th book of the Iliad, which describes the reconciliation of Agamemnon and Achilles. Agamemnon, if you remember, enraged Achilles by taking away his, uh, uh, his captive, Briseis. And uh, finally, when it became necessary for Achilles to come back into the battle, uh, Agamemnon made a handsome apology in public to Achilles and explained what, why he had done what he had done. And he says there, <clears throat> I was not to blame. It was Zeus and my bad luck and the fury that walks in the darkness that blinded my judgment that day when I confiscated Achilles' girl. What could I do? At these moments, there is a power that takes command. Ate, the eldest daughter of Zeus, who blinds us, a cursed sprite that she is, flitting through men's heads, corrupting them, bringing down now one, now another. Why, even Zeus was blinded by her once, and he is known to stand above all men and all gods. Achilles accepts this explanation without any hesitation at all. It seems to him completely rational. And he says, how utterly a man can be blinded by father's use. Now, who and what is Arte? In the Greek tragedies, the word stands for disaster. But in Homer, the word stands for the state of mind which brings on disaster, the state of blindness, the state of infatuation, the state of mind which leads us to do all kinds of absurd things against our own interest, things which make no sense to us whatever, and yet we still do them. And uh, Homer uh, personified this, uh, this strange state of mind as an alien supernatural force which came into man. This, uh, sometimes the gods themselves in their more malicious moments would come in and upset a man's judgment, but more often they sent this uh, strange kind of fury, this daughter of Zeus, Arte, uh, to carry out their vengeances upon human beings. And now Homer, of course, makes it quite clear that there are also positive interventions from the supernatural world. Uh, 
in general, these positive um, interventions are made through the medium of something that he calls menos. And menos is that kind of accession of power and eagerness and strength and vitality which permits us to do the impossible. Uh, even animals are capable of uh, experiencing menos. Their horses every now and then get a tremendous influx of menos and do the most extraordinary things in the Iliad. And uh, in general, Homer would have said that any particularly good idea, any anything above our ordinary level of intelligence, uh, any remarkable action or, or great insight is given to us uh, from the outside uh, by a, a god who hands out uh, the, his menos to us. And the god sometimes has a name. We know which god is, is at work uh, within us. But uh, occasionally, and this is particularly true in the Odyssey, uh, the, no, the god has no name. He is just called a daimon. He is some sort of a, of a supernatural being. And in general, in Greek, until much later times, any supernatural being to whom one couldn't give a name, uh, Zeus or Aphrodite or Athene, was just called a daimon. Uh, for example, the monitions which uh, Socrates received were given him by a daimon, a, a nameless uh, supernatural being. And it is interesting to note that uh, Socrates, who is, after all, the father of Western rationalism, uh, says in so many words, the greatest blessings come to us by way of madness, provided always that the madness is given to us as a divine gift, so that uh, he himself uh, recognized this supernatural influx which uh, constantly influenced uh, human beings. Now, Homer's daimons and gods are not mere fairy tale fantasies. Uh, they are principles of scientific explanation. He had to account for the very odd facts of human psychology, the fact that human beings are constantly doing things which are obviously against their interests, which they know to be stupid and bad. Uh, similarly, they every now and then do things which seem to be far beyond their normal capacities of, uh, of action or thought. And it seemed quite rational in the absence of any other hypothesis, I mean, such a hypothesis as we have now of the dynamic unconscious, it was only rational to suppose that these uh, uh, strange events of, of which we are all conscious were due to the to the influx of, um, uh, of supernatural powers. And it's interesting to realize that this idea of possession for good or for ill by supernatural powers went on being used as a principle of explanation right on almost to the end of the 17th century. But contemporary with Galileo and even with Newton, we find the, this, this Homeric idea of possession being used as in currently as an explanation of many forms of the odder, many of the odder forms of human behavior. You will find, for example, in that compendium of, uh, of um, 17th century psychology, the Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, an extremely good discussion of this uh, whole problem. I mean, he points out that most cases of strange behavior, of madness, uh, of madness and what we would call neurosis, most cases have a physical origin, but a, a quite a good proportion of them are probably due to some kind of supernatural possession. And it's very interesting to notice that in the 18th century, when the idea of demonic possession had completely evaporated, nothing was brought in to take its place. We have a curious kind of interregnum, so to speak, in the history of psychology during the 18th and early 19th centuries, when the stranger aspects of human nature simply had no 
valid explanatory principles to account for them. For example, when the case of Mesmer was examined by the French Academy with the assistance of Benjamin Franklin, the only explanation that they could bring up for the strange phenomena which occurred in Mesmer's neighborhood was imagination. Well, imagination, such as, as we know it, quite clearly doesn't account for the kind of queer things which were happening in, this, uh, in these early days of uh, the hypnotic experimentation. And strangely enough, it is not until quite late in the 19th century uh, that a satisfactory substitute for the old idea of possession uh, comes into the world. Um, it comes in, of course, with the um, uh, development of the idea of a dynamic, unconscious self, uh, uh, what uh, would be called the unconscious and the pre-conscious, or in general, the subliminal self. And the opening of the new period of psychology is dated by William James with the, by, with the publication of a paper by F. W. H. Myers in, I think, 1882, so that it is extraordinarily recent that we have any satisfactory substitute for this ancient Homeric and afterwards Christian idea of uh, demonic and divine possession uh, as agents to account for the odder aspects of human behavior. Now, let us pass now for a moment to the practical side of, the, of Greek psychology. Now, the Greeks were very realistic people, and they knew very well that the more distressing uh, aspects, the more distressing consequences of possession could be warded off if some kind of satisfaction, either direct or indirect, were found for the instinctive drives and the frustrations and uh, miseries uh, of normal life. And the two great methods which they used, but to both of which they applied the term catharsis, well, the first of them, historically, was the method of the Dionysian orgy and dance. Uh, Dionysus, in this context, was called Lucius, the liberator. And he did liberate these people who lived a, an extraordinarily miserable life if they were slaves from a great deal of their sense of frustration and unhappiness by, first of all, giving them alcohol, and in the second place, uh, encouraging these congregational dances. Uh, at a later period, the Dionysian rites seemed to lose their uh, interest, and they were, but their place was taken by the Corybantic dances in honor of the Great Mother. And here, there was a specifically uh, therapeutic uh, value was set upon these, uh, these dances. Uh, for example, the uh, people suffering from what we would now call anxiety syndromes or various types of uh, neurosis were actually diagnosed by the way they responded to certain types of music. And it, in this way, one could judge what d daimon or god was possessing them. And suitable dances and, and religious rites were then prescribed for them. And they worked off in this way a great deal of the uh, neurotic uh, tension which uh, was uh, upsetting them. At this time, <coughs> the, the present day, of course, in many parts of the world, one can find exactly the same procedures uh, being carried out. I was greatly struck, for example, two years ago when I was in Brazil by the what may be called the Latin American menadism of what is called in Rio Macumba and what is called in uh, Bahia Candomblé, which are essentially adaptations of West African dances. And uh, when, when you go and see these, uh, one sees uh, very clearly uh, what the Greeks were up to and how effective this kind of, of therapy was. 
these unfortunate uh, Negroes living in the most frightful conditions in the favelas of, uh, of Rio or of, uh, of Bahia, on Saturday nights work off uh, their frust sense of frustration and misery by this night-long dancing. And interestingly enough, in all the dances that I witnessed, uh, there was no question of alcohol involved. The, the whole procedure was one of this tremendous uh, muscular activity through which immense accumulations of tension and misery were worked off, and by the end of the night, many of the participants, of course, had fallen down in a kind of ecstatic stupor and were prepared to go on with their miserable life during the following week. And it was, to me, very, very interesting to see in these dances actual gestures which are exactly described in the Greek literature about the menads, the tossing of the head, for example, which occurs again and again in descriptions of menadism in Greek, Greece, was clearly exemplified in the um, Candomblé and uh, Macumba dances. There was a great deal of this tossing, uh, which I imagine the physiological reason for which is that it uh, drives a great deal of blood into the head by a centrifugal force, and probably produces this kind of uh, ecstatic state very rapidly. Now, come back to the possession theory. The interesting thing about it is that, subjectively, this is a very realistic theory, because, quite clearly, these sudden impulses, either for evil or for good, are experienced subjectively as alien impulses. After all, we, we see this constantly uh, in, our, <clears throat> uh, in our idiomatic use of language. We say, what came over me? I can't have been myself at the moment, and things like this. Uh, or a, a good idea occurred to me. It, I, it, we'd never say, I have invented a good idea. We say, it has come to me, it has occurred to me. There is this subject, subjective sense that it does come to us from the outside. And in this sense, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, possession idea was an extremely, uh, extremely realistic one, until one had a better theory, such as we have, or we think we have anyhow, now, this seemed to me, seemed to be uh, the most sensible explanation of both normal and abnormal behavior. The idea being that uh, there was a self which was invaded from the outside by these alien supernatural forces and was made to do things, either evil things or exceptionally good things, of which the normal self would be quite incapable. And now let us briefly consider how did Homer envisage the self that was invaded from the outside. He uh, did not envisage it as a unitary soul or personality. There is no word in Homer for, for the soul. The psyche, he speaks of the psyche, but the psyche is something which exists only at the moment of death. It's the thing that leaves the body and that will become the future shade which people can contact in, uh, if they go down to Hades. Uh, but uh, during life, the psyche is not there at all. During life, the, the self is a kind of symbiosis of a number of psychophysiological factors working together and living, to get, living in a rather uneasy consensus and, and organization, rather unstable and rather uh, uncomfortable all the time. And the factors which, uh, which um, uh, Homer describes as being components of the self are, uh, first of all, there are these half-physiological factors. There's something which he calls the thumos, which is the seat of feeling which lives in the chest. And then there is the frame, 
which quite literally is the midriff, which is the organ of passion and of life. Then the, there is the noos, which is the reasonable, sensible ego, more or less. We would call it, I suppose, the ego. Uh, but anyhow, it is the reasonable side of man. Uh, then there is the heart, which fulfills more or less the same kind of functions as, uh, as the heart does in colloquial language today. And also the belly, which is, is quite important. Uh, so that we see there is this kind of committee which uh, uh, works. Uh, um, and the I, the, the Noos, is merely one member of this committee, not necessarily the, the chairman. It, he, is a, he just is there, and he may be at the mercy of the other members of the committee, or he, he may control them, but it's no, never uh, quite certain which, uh, which position he will occupy. And one of the things which is striking in the Homeric psychology is that there is no con word for will, no conception of will. In this, uh, the Homeric psychology closely resembles the Hindu and Buddhist psychology, where will plays a completely negligible part. It seems to us very strange to get on without the idea of a will, and yet one can do it. Uh, for example, I mean, take the, the marriage service. Uh, wilt thou have this woman to be thy wife? Well, instead of saying, I will, we can say, well, uh, uh, my thumos is all for it, and uh, uh, so is my frain. Uh, my noos has certain misgivings, uh, but uh, I'm prepared to go along with what the others say. Uh, all the more so as I, I feel distinct symptoms of possession by Aphrodite. I mean, uh, this, is a, this is an answer which uh, uh, we could sum up in terms of the will, and perhaps in some ways is more realistic than, uh, than our idea of the will doing something. And it's uh, worth quoting in this context a remark by an eminent historian of ideas, Professor Nielsen, who says that pluralistic thinking about the nature of the soul is founded in the nature of things, and only our habits of thought make it surprising that man should have several souls. Well, uh, Homer, uh, as I've said before, was, uh, was not a philosopher, um, uh, nor um, a psychologist, but a, a very good observer, and uh, his, uh, his view of the, of the personality built up out of these uh, multiple factors uh, is, um, is a workable one. And uh, interestingly enough, it's remarkably close in some ways uh, uh, to the uh, Buddhist conception, which uh, was developed, I suppose, about three or four centuries after Homer, uh, and which was developed, of course, much more systematically by philosophical writers. But there, you see, the Buddhist conception uh, specifically affirms that man is anatta, that he has no unitary soul, and that uh, his personality is this group of loosely conjoined complexes, which in, uh, in Buddhist literature are called skandhas. And uh, they point out that all the phenomena of human behavior and thought uh, can be explained in terms of these skandhas, which are uh, partly physiological and, and partly psychological. You can't really separate the two. It's interesting to note that in the last 75 years, there has been in the West a considerable current returning towards the Homeric and Buddhist idea of man, away from the idea of the unitary soul, and towards the idea of a consensus uh, of um, numerous uh, factors uh, coming together. Um, this view uh, has been discussed by Bertrand Russell in various places, and uh, he says, I quote here, he says that um, from this view of human personality, it does not follow that there is no simple self. It only follows 
that we cannot know whether there is or not, and that <clears throat> the self, except as a bundle of perceptions, cannot enter into any part of our knowledge. Well, this is uh, certainly, if Homer had uh, thought about um, uh, the philosophy of what he was saying, I think he would have completely agreed uh, with uh, Bertrand Russell that, uh, that um, man was a bundle uh, of, uh, of elements. Um, and, of course, Bertrand Russell was preceded in this by, by Hume. Uh, now, it's a, a very interesting fact that the ideas of Homer did not persist into classical times in Greece. Within three to four centuries after Homer's death, uh, it seemed self-evident to uh, Greek philosophers and to all thinking men in Greece that there was a unitary soul and that it inhabited uh, the body. The idea of the of the multiple uh, causation, the, the multiple factors which made up a personality, had given place to this idea of a psyche imprisoned within the body. Now, recent scholarship has suggested that the reason for this uh, transition from the older idea of a multiple, loosely uh, um, federated personality to the idea of the unitary soul, um, that the influence which produced this in Greece came not from the Orient, as used to be supposed, but rather came from the North, from the uh, Scythians and from the shamanistic religion of the North. But the Greeks had founded their first uh, colonies on the Black Sea in the 7th century BC and had come into contact with the Scythians, who, whose religion was the same as that which uh, still persists in large parts of Central Asia and in Siberia, the shamanistic religion. Or, or rather, which did persist until it would be, in very recent years, been replaced by Marxism. Uh, and this idea of the unitary soul, which came in with the shamanistic ideas, is based upon the fact that the shamanistic religion depends, really, on the activities of these specially gifted people who performed feats of what in modern mediumistic literature is called traveling clairvoyance. Uh, in this respect, the shamans were quite different from the uh, sibyls and prophetesses of Greece. Uh, these were possessed by the god, the Delphic oracle. She, the, she sat upon the, the tripod and was possessed. Uh, she was... Uh, the word enthusiasm, of course, which we use in a slightly different sense, means literally having the God inside you. And the, the prophetess had the God inside her, and the God spoke through her. Well, exactly, something exactly contrary took place in the shamanistic religion. Instead of summoning the God in, uh, the shaman went into a mediumistic trance and went out and explored the external world, uh, both on its mundane level and on its uh, supernatural levels, uh, looking for facts here below and looking for the deities uh, on the on the higher sphere. Well, obviously, if uh, uh, this naturally leads uh, to the conception of a unitary soul, if you can go out and wander about the world, there is something that goes out. You, you can't uh, uh, speak about a, a bundle of, of uh, unrelated, not closely related factors going out. You have to think of this uh, unitary personage going out into the world. And I don't think we have to discuss whether uh, traveling clairvoyance uh, is a fact or not. Uh, there are a number of quite eminent philosophers have taken it seriously. Um, Professor C.D. Broad of Cambridge is prepared to 
envisage the reality of travelling clairvoyance, and so do, in this country would, uh, I think, Professor Hornell Hart. But whether it's uh, whether we consider there is an objective reality to travelling clairvoyance uh, doesn't really matter in so far as subjectively it certainly uh, seems to be real to the shaman himself who goes out. It certainly appears to be a reality, and even to the observers it appears to be a reality. They see the shaman in this uh, uh, death-like trance, and when he comes back they hear him talking about adventures which he has had uh, in other parts of, of this world and in unknown areas of other worlds, so that it, uh, subjectively it, it, is a, it seems to have a complete a reality to it. And another significant fact in relation to later Greek thought was that the shamans remembered previous existences. They, part of their power was due to the fact that they had been shamans in previous lives and they could remember this and uh, they carried this over uh, into their, their present existence. Well, the theory now, which is held by Professor Dodds and others, uh, is that uh, this exercise, this, this shamanistic, these shamanistic ideas exercised a very considerable influence on the development of Greek Orphism and of the philosophy of Pythagoras. Uh, but um, the interesting point is that the, these ideas were developed in ways which they were not developed in the original regions where shamanistic religion was practiced. Uh, for example, the idea of, um, of detachable souls was, so to speak, democratized. Everybody had a detachable soul, not merely the shaman. And also, uh, the idea of reincarnation was democratized. Everybody had had previous lives. But this meant that the whole idea of reincarnation became entirely different in the hands of Pythagoras from what it had been in the shamanistic world. In the shamanistic world, only these especially gifted people had had previous existences, and this accounted for their power. But after all, if everybody had had previous existences, it followed that these uh, they were not being given extra power, because in fact they had very little power. They were miserable, they were feeble and impotent, and uh, there was... <coughs> uh, so that the um, reincarnation was not a special privilege, it was actually a punishment. And we get then the development in Pythagoreanism of the idea that the present life is the hell which we are suffering for our sins in a previous existence. Um, it is uh, close, of course, to the Indian idea of karma. Uh, and uh, nobody, therefore, is born innocent. Uh, we are all, in the Greek phrase, poneroi. And uh, from this uh, point of view, we get this uh, extreme dualism and puritanism which uh, arises in later Greek thought and which passes over into Christianity and which keeps on reappearing in Christian thought, these semi-Manichaean ideas of the um, evilness of the body, of the um, fact that we are all born with original sin, uh, um, of a kind of pervading um, as Puritanism and stress on asceticism. All this is fully developed before uh, the uh, Christian era, and as I say, it persists, comes up again and again in the history of Christian thought, in spite of the uh, its profound difference from the uh, original Hebrew ideas, which after all were the, the uh, basic source of Christianity. And here let me uh, speak very briefly about the um, uh, New Old Testament ideas of personality. Uh, here, of course, no distinction is made between soul and body. The body is an essential part of the uh, human personality, and uh, the, actually in the Old Testament Hebrew there is no word for soul, for body as apart from soul. The two to, 
are, are thought of always together. And one of the interesting features of uh, Old Testament and also even New Testament psychology is the constant reference uh, to the constant use of physiological terms uh, to describe um, uh, psychological facts, uh, the bowels of compassion. We get this, uh, this phrase occurring again and again. Joseph's bowels yearn for his brethren. We have the, the phrase is constantly repeated in St. Paul, the bowels of compassion and meekness, which he's, he constantly speaks about. And um, uh, again, another um, phrase which occurs very frequently in the Old Testament is the reins, the, the, the loins, the kidneys, which um, uh, are again and again the, the word is used in a psychological sense. And of course in its own way this is an extremely realistic uh, point of view because as we are finding more and more uh, these uh, physiological factors in the total uh, human makeup are of immense importance. So, I mean actually the reins which we find that the adrenals are of colossal importance in everything that happens to us, that uh, many of the seeming possessions, both for good and for evil, are due to the adrenals pouring extra quantities of uh, adrenaline or noradrenaline into the blood. Uh, so that uh, it is, uh, I find these things very interesting to find, to see the, the anticipations by a kind of empirical intuition uh, which these ancient uh, writers and, and thinkers uh, perceived. They, 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 one, can, uh, one, one could certainly show by quotation a very wide appreciation of the, uh, uh, of the role played by uh, physiology in um, uh, human personality. I, I think it's possibly worth mentioning too that uh, in many of these ancient uh, uh, religions, chemical substances other than those produced within the body were frequently used in religious rites. Uh, there was always this great mystery of the change of personality uh, due to the ingestion of a, of a drug. Uh, the Greeks, of course, made use of alcohol in the, in the Dionysian rites. And there are indications in the Old Testament that an attempt was made by schools of prophets who are not the, the, the respectable prophets to do the same thing in the Jewish tradition. And uh, the, the, the whole subject is one of the greatest interest. It has been treated at length by the French anthropologist Philippe de Felis in a book called Poison Sacre, which gives a complete uh, account of all the uh, chemical methods used in the various uh, religious traditions to bring about these changes. And uh, with the, uh, I, one has to correlate uh, um, this uh, rather materialistic uh, view of um, personality and its relationship with the divine, one has to correlate it with the definitely physiological psychology which uh, runs through uh, so much of, um, uh, of Old Testament and, and New Testament uh, uh, religion. Well now uh, I would like to conclude with a few remarks on some of the oriental conceptions of human nature. The, the basic Indian conceptions, which we find in Hinduism and slightly modified, but not very much modified, uh, in Buddhism. Uh, I won't go into the uh, psychophysiological details of, of Indian psychology, which are extremely complicated because they postulate a kind of, uh, what may be called, kind of occult physiology. Uh, parallel with the, the ordinary physiology, which may, as we're beginning to discover, have something in it. Uh, these subtle bodies and causal bodies which the Indians talk 
may indeed uh, represent some kind of intuitive grasp of the fact that there are fields, electrical fields, of various kinds around the, the human body, and that these fields may play a, a considerably more important part in our psychological life than we at present imagine. This is a, a, something which I think the future will either confirm or deny. <laughs> but I won't go into these things. I will merely uh, stress the most important uh, single psychological statement in, in uh, the Hindu tradition, which is, uh, which is summed up in the three portentous words, Tattvam Asi, thou art that, meaning that the basic foundation of the human personality, the Atman, the pure ego, as he's called in, in Western philosophy, is identical with the Brahman, with the uh, basic principle of uh, divine principle of all existence. Uh, this <coughs> runs through uh, Hinduism and is carried over in a slightly different form uh, into uh, Buddhism. And uh, it uh, represents, I would say, the great uh, oriental contribution uh, to psychology, or rather to what uh, Kumaraswami used to call autology, the science of the self with the large S. Well, um, the interesting fact about Oriental philosophy is that it is not primarily speculative as Western philosophy certainly is now, and, and although I think it was less so in the remote past. Oriental philosophy, as I say, is not speculative. It is essentially practical. It is a kind of transcendental operationalism. It insists that if you do certain things, certain states of mind will follow, and the nature of these states of mind uh, has to be explored speculatively, and the conclusions drawn from a speculative examination of these states of mind, uh, the conclusion that has to be drawn is precisely that thou art that, that the, the, there is ultimately a kind of, of identity between the deep self, which lies, so to say, upstream from the phenomenal ego, uh, there is an identity between that deep self and the divine ground of the world. And uh, this uh, insight uh, has, of course, uh, been repeated in the West. We find it again and again in the writings of the Western mystics, uh, and always with the insistence uh, that this is not a merely metaphysical uh, statement, it is the uh, description of a state of mind which is a state of immense value, which probably everybody is capable of, which in some obscure way we all live with, although we suppress it in some by our preoccupations with the immediate here and now, uh, but that we are sufficiently aware of it to be moved by any account of it, and even to be actually slightly aware of it uh, uh, as a direct experience. And uh, I, I think I shall have occasion to mention this, uh, um, this um, point of view again, but uh, I think it's worth uh, saying here that this um, conception of the uh, fundamental religious experience, this uh, uh, is in no way, I would say, incompatible with the uh, scientific attitude towards life. It is simply the account of a fact, of a, of a state of mind, uh, and uh, which is regarded by those who have it in its pl plenary fullness as of immense value. And it, uh, we are free 
either to accept the metaphysical explanation of it or not to accept the metaphysical explanation. But we are not free to deny the existence of the state of mind or the statements of those who have uh, experienced uh, this, the, this state of mind, that it has uh, an immense uh, practical value. It's, uh, when we look at the phrases in which um, Oriental philosophy describes these uh, states of mind, uh, we find, for example, in, in the Hindu literature, the word moksha, meaning liberation, and we find in Buddhist literature the word nirvana, which uh, is extremely difficult to give any adequate translation of, but it means evidently, practically, the same thing as moksha. And both of these may be regarded as the, simply as the operational name of the same state of mind as is described in the, uh, by the Christian mystics as union with God, uh, union with the immanent God of direct experience rather than as the transcendent uh, God of inference. And uh, for me, to me, this is a, uh, a matter of the greatest importance that, that uh, there is this uh, experiential form of religion which is in no way at odds, I would say, with either the facts of science or the uh, scientific point of view, which, uh, that it is perfectly possible to maintain a religious attitude on this basis, which is in fact a, an experimental basis, uh, without committing oneself uh, to anything which would uh, be at odds with the the general Weltanschauung of our time. And I, I, I would uh, will close uh, the, this lecture with the, the, this thought that uh, we have here uh, something which uh, is perfectly compatible, I would say, with either the uh, Homeric, Buddhist, Humean, Russellian point of view about uh, a human personality, or with the shamanistic, platonic, Christian view. Both of them seem to me to be compatible with uh, the existence of these states of mind and with their values. And um, it, it is also, it seems to me, compatible with um, a strictly theistic point of view, or a point of view like the Buddhists, which uh, is fundamentally atheistic, which I mean, which is not concerned anyhow with the problem of gods, but is concerned with the problem of liberation and of uh, of immediate experience. And with uh, this uh, final reference to the contribution of past psychologies, I will close this lecture. Thank you. You've heard the first tape-recorded lecture in a series delivered by Aldous Huxley at Kresge Auditorium while he was Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities at MIT. Next week, the second lecture, entitled The Contemporary Picture. The program was produced by WGBH-FM, Boston, for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters. This is the NAEB Radio Network. The NAEB Radio Network presents Aldous Huxley with the second lecture in a series entitled What a Piece of Work is a Man. This lecture, a consideration of the contemporary picture, was recorded at Kresge Auditorium for broadcast at this time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I want now uh, this... Uh, this evening to pass from the ancient world of Homer and the Old Testament and the Indians to some of the views, naturally I can't discuss them all, uh, which are current now about uh, human beings, about this piece of work which is a man. Well, 
the interesting thing is that the ego remains very much what it was in Homer's day. It is this uh, conscious, fairly rational creature uh, which uses words, which uh, is analytical, which uh, pursues its own self-interest. Uh, it is the person, in the words of Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, the person with a conscience and a variable bank balance. But around this uh, ego, around this person with the variable bank balance, there are a whole number of not eyes. The the eye is surrounded and to a great extent uh, uh, controlled and manipulated by uh, this whole series of not eyes. Well, as we saw in the ancient world, uh, these not eyes were classified by Homer under such names as uh, Thumos and Frain and Cardia, the the midriff, the heart, the, this power in the chest. Uh, in the Old Testament, we have such phrases as the, again, the heart, the reins, the bowels. And uh, on top of these uh, physical and psychophysical entities, uh, there were, in all the ancient conceptions, these supernatural uh, creatures which made inrushes and which... Uh, uh, affected the life of the ego. Uh, there were actual possessions by uh, named deities and by unnamed daimons, and there were also, uh, we get in the Old Testament too, we get uh, Samson being possessed by the Spirit of God and being able to perform these prodigies of strength in the battle. And um, we also have these kind of impersonal forces which are yet directed by supernatural powers from the outside, which uh, which um, Homer calls arte in regard to the negative forces which lead us to disaster, and menos, the positive forces which enable us to perform actions which normally in our normal state would be almost impossible for us. Well, today <coughs> we, of course, have... Uh, we still have uh, uh, the body with us, which we classify and talk about in a rather different way, and which I shall speak about towards the end of the lecture. Uh, but in regard to the, uh, to the menos and the arte and the supernatural possessions, we observe the same phenomena, but of course we speak about them in a different way. We speak about them in terms of an active, a dynamic, unconscious well, it's remarkable how recent uh, this idea is. We now take it completely for granted. But actually, uh, it is an idea which William James uh, dated exactly. Uh, William James attributed the beginning of the new psychology with its stress upon the dynamic unconscious uh, to the publication of a paper in 1886 by F. W. H. Myers. And uh, Myers was a profound, and I uh, regard him as one of the best uh, students and describers of the, of the unconscious mind. Uh, naturally, he has been, his fame has been completely eclipsed uh, by that of Freud, who in a sense I think was less complete than Myers. In the, we can generalize and say that whereas Myers was chiefly concerned with the positive side of the unconscious, with the unconscious as giving us menos, these accessions of strength and power and insight. Uh, Freud, who was a physician dealing with sick people, was mainly preoccupied with the negative side. Myers was concerned with menos, and Freud was concerned with arte. And uh, Freud says of his own theory of the unconscious, the, the, his words are, we obtain our theory of the unconscious from our theory of repression. His idea was, this is, I needn't go into it in any detail because it's perfectly familiar, that discreditable desires and drives uh, are pushed down out of consciousness because we don't want to confront the fact that we have such uh, uh, drives and desires which are at variance with the cultural pattern of our times. And they are pushed down, but they, they remain alive and cause a great deal of trouble 
uh, underneath the surface, express themselves in these symbolic and uh, roundabout ways, and altogether behave very much as the possessing uh, daimons of, uh, of um, Homeric times. Uh, it's interesting in this context to find that our colloquial language still preserves many of the ideas which we inherit from the Homeric days. Uh, for example, when we do something particularly stupid or delinquent, we say, I don't know what possessed me, uh, what can have come over me, or we say, uh, he can't have been himself when he did that. All these, that's very interesting as showing how strong this uh, ancient idea of being possessed by somebody else, uh, how strongly it persists in our minds, and of course, subjectively, the activities of the of the negative unconscious uh, definitely feel uh, like a possession. Then, of course, along with the discreditable drives which we repress, we also repress painful memories. Uh, traumatic experiences are also pushed down out of sight and also uh, create a great deal of trouble uh, in the uh, basement of the mind. Uh, Freud, so to speak, is uh, is talking all the time about uh, the basement downstairs with the rats and the bat black beetles, whereas um, uh, Myers is largely concerned with the floors above the ground floor where the ego lives, and uh, he would agree, I would think, with, uh, with the mystical point of view that the topmost floor of these upper levels has no roof to it and is, is open to the sky, but we will go into that later. Well, over and above the uh, negative unconscious due to repression, uh, there is, of course, a large negative unconscious and also a positive unconscious uh, due to early conditioning. Uh, conditioning, of course, is something which everybody undergoes in the course of childhood and is completely necessary to adapt the growing child to his, uh, uh, his social environment. But of course it can also be extremely dangerous and produce very bad results. Uh, Pavlov, in his classical studies of dogs, uh, showed that um, conditioning is particularly easy when the uh, resistance has been lowered by disease or by fear or indeed by any violent emotion, that at these times it's particularly simple to install a be behavior pattern, which is then very difficult to get rid of. We become in these uh, states of lowered resistance, um, we become what the poet describes as wax to receive and marble to retain. These, uh, these um, behavior patterns can be pushed into us at this time with an extraordinary force. And um, incidentally, d during the Second World War, the uh, whole Pavlovian theory of conditioning under stress and during moments of uh, lowered resistance was um, used in the uh, treatment of uh, what used to be called shell shock and now is called battle fatigue. Uh, and uh, it was, um, th they used this as the, as the explanatory principle for these processes which they called narco-hypnosis, which were very successful in, in getting rid of these, uh, of these conditionings installed under uh, distressing conditions. Uh, actually, when one looks at, the, uh, at what happens when, with people who have had a behavior pattern of a bad kind installed during a, a, a condition of lowered uh, resistance, they are reacting to the world uh, here and now as though uh, they were suffering from some kind of, uh, though laboring under some kind of post hypnotic uh, suggestion which had been given to them in the past. The uh, conditioning uh, in this uh, moment of traumatic experience acts as a kind of of post-hypnotic suggestion, which makes them do all kinds of things which are wholly irrelevant uh, to the facts of the 
the, of the present moment. I mean, this is, after all, one of the of the possible definitions of neurosis that uh, it is a behaviour which is not relevant to the present, but is relevant either to one of these uh, post-hypnotic suggestions induced by conditioning in a state of lowered resistance, or else uh, to uh, the response uh, to one of these um, uh, repressed uh, desires which are still festering in the lower levels of the mind. Now, Freud uh, has enormous merits and uh, I think also very great weaknesses. The, his enormous merit was, of course, to stress the in immense importance of the unconscious mind, to point out that it was a dynamic thing, that it con was continually active, that it continuously influenced the life of the ego, largely, in Freud's view, for evil, because Freud was, as I say, a physician and concerned with sick people, and he paid very little attention to the positive side of the unconscious. This was his greatest uh, merit. And um, his weaknesses, I would say, uh, first of all, that uh, he paid very little attention to the positive side of the unconscious, and he also paid very little attention uh, to the physical side, the bodily side of the personality. Now, these, I think, are his uh, two main weaknesses, and uh, I shall discuss the uh, the bodily side later on. And now let us get on to the to the positive unconscious, to the to the menos, the accessions of power which we receive uh, uh, from this uh, uh, this um, buried mind, this under under lower basement and um, upper stories of, of our mind. Now here again, let us look at the colloquial phrases that we use in regard to the positive unconscious. One of the interesting things is that we are curiously humble about our good ideas. Uh, colloquially, we very rarely claim a good idea as being originated by ourselves, by the I. We say, for example, a wonderful idea has just occurred to me. It suddenly flashed into my head. Or we say the violinist played as though he were inspired. Always this idea that there is uh, something which is not the I of our familiar um, ego life, which provides the good ideas. I mean, it may be actually that I never have a good idea, that... Uh, uh, the good ideas simply come to me from somewhere else. And uh, this is certainly a very common experience of, of things simply emerging from the blue into our consciousness. And uh, the, the, the source, of course, is this, uh, this huge area of the, uh, of the positive unconscious mind, which uh, in many respects is more accomplished than the, uh, and uh, we, with greater, has greater insights in many respects, I think, than the, than the positive, uh, the, than, the, uh, than the ordinary conscious ego. Uh, now, the ordinary process, I suppose, of, uh, of thought goes something like this. We take in material from the external world, the natural world and the social world, consciously. This material is then stored away in the memory and is worked upon by these, this, these not-eyes in the unconscious mind. And when we have good ideas, this seems to be uh, the transmission into the conscious mind of the results of this unconscious working under in the basement or anyhow in some area of the mind which uh, we are not normally in touch with. It, it sort of comes up to us uh, and we get the, the good idea and then the function of the, of the conscious mind is to verify the idea, to check it, to see if it is actually a good idea, if it's as good as it feels and if uh, if it seems to uh, be coherent and uh, 
consonant with what we know already. And uh, then after that, we can work out uh, the relationship between the new good idea with the other information and the other ideas which we have. This, as I say, seems to be uh, roughly the, the modus operandi of this, uh, of this um, uh, conscious and unconscious process. So in relation to the sciences, uh, uh, I suppose the best uh, account of the workings of the unconscious intuition are to be found in the writings of Henri Poincaré and more recently of Adama, who describe uh, uh, mathematical intuitions, these uprushes of, of uh, knowledge and insight which come out of the unconscious. I mean, generally the process is that the mathematician tries to wrestles with a problem and cannot succeed in solving it, leaves it alone, and then suddenly in a moment of distraction or of reverie, the answer will come into his head. Well, sometimes the answer is correct and sometimes it's not, but uh, it is the business of the uh, critical conscious mind to examine this answer and uh, in the cases when it's correct to see what the logical steps are between this conclusion which the conscious mind has arrived at in its subterranean state uh, and the premises from which uh, the whole thing starts. Uh, and uh, it is interesting uh, to remark that um, in his recently published book, Professor Bruner, in his book The Process of Education, devotes a chapter to the possibility of actually training the uh, uh, intuition, training children to retain and to sharpen their powers of intuitive thought. He says there probably is still a great deal of research to be done in this field, but he, he, he is very strongly of opinion that uh, this should be uh, taught to children. The children should not have this power of guessing, sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly, but above all, that they shouldn't have this repressed by the process of analytical education, and that they should be encouraged and trained to do the, their intuiting uh, in a, not exactly systematic, but uh, because it isn't systematic, but to, to do it in a, as a regular thing, to be, to be open to this uh, idea of uh, intuition. Uh, now, we pass now from the uh, positive unconscious in the sphere of science to the closely related um, operations of the positive unconscious in the spheres of art. Uh, here, of course, the, the whole idea of poetic inspiration has been around for centuries, for millennia. It's interesting, for example, to find that in several of the Indo-European languages, the word for poet and seer is the same. We have vates in Latin, we have fili in the Irish, and we have thul, uh, I think is the word, in Icelandic, uh, always meaning the same thing, that the poet is the seer. And we have in Homer phrases of, for example, that the minstrel sings out of the gods. And we have this, uh, this whole idea of inspiration running right through into modern times. I mean, it's interesting to find what numbers of great poets have said about the subject. I, for example, uh, Goethe says, uh, uh, the songs made me, not I the songs. And uh, Lamartine says, it is not I who think, it is my ideas that think for me. And Musset says, uh, Alfred de Musset, uh, one doesn't work, one listens. It is as if some stranger were whispering in one's ear. And then Shelley has a curious metaphor. He says, the mind in creation is like a fading coal, which some invisible influence, like an evanescent wind, awakens to transitory brilliance. In uh, relation to these uh, remarks, it's worth pointing out that the famous uh, summing up of philosophy by Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, was emended by the German Romantic philosopher von Bader to cogitor ergo sum, I am thought, therefore I am. Not I think, but I am thought, therefore I am. And there is, I think, a great deal 
And to be said for von Bardo's ideas that, that the the ego naturally retains its immense importance as a guiding critical uh, faculty within the, uh, the the total mind body, uh, but that the a great many of its best ideas come to it uh, from somewhere else. And obviously, I think one of the major problems of education uh, is to uh, keep open this uh, this uh, door into the other world where where these ideas uh, come from to help uh, the young person to remain open and aware of these kind of uh, intuitions coming from a, a deeper level the, this all this allows us i think to make a reasonable definition of what is genius. A genius, a man of genius, I suppose, is one who has a particularly active um, positive unconscious and a particularly good one, one which is, uh, furnishes him with a great many novel insights and brilliant new ideas. And at the same time, he must have, obviously, a very good and efficient conscious, critical mind, which can take the ideas which come to him in this way, by a kind of automatism, and examine them, see if they are really good, work them out, and uh, fit them into, build them up into structures, either scientific or philosophical or artistic, uh, which uh, shall be uh, satisfactory. This, I would say, is the, the definition of a man of genius, that uh, it is both inspiration and perspiration. I mean, there has to be the thing coming in and the tremendous hard work being done also. Of course, well, a thing which we must never forget is that uh, some, some of the uprushes from the unconscious world, in many cases, uh, they are not of the first quality. They may be extremely poor in quality. In this case, we have somebody you see, we're talking about the arts, who is uh, working, it might, might be said, in the mode of genius, but not with the consequences of genius. He's, what he does feels like being a genius, but objectively it looks like something nonsensical. And this, unfortunately, happens uh, quite frequently. Uh, there are tragic, tragic cases of this. I mean, one of the the classical tragic cases is the case of poor Benjamin Robert Hayden, who felt himself to be one of the greatest geniuses in painting that had ever lived. But his pictures are, in fact, deplorable, although he was an extremely intelligent man. And uh, oddly enough, we get another very curious case of this in a man much more intelligent even than Hayden, which is uh, Voltaire. Uh, Voltaire prided himself on being a writer of tragedies, and <clears throat> he wrote one of his tragedies, Catiline, a five-act tragedy in rhymed Alexandrines, in one week. And he wrote to a friend, oh, apropos of this feat, he was saying, uh, nobody who has not experienced poetic inspiration can possibly believe this to be true, but I have experienced this inspiration, and here is the tragedy. The only trouble is the tragedy is completely unreadable. Uh, so that we see that uh, we can have all the the functioning of genius without the uh, the results of it. Uh, in this case, the the uprushes resemble very much the the automatic writing which we find in in a number of mediums. Uh, and here again, if you look at the uh, output of mediums, most of it is is a kind of inspirational twaddle. Uh, occasionally, uh, there are messages which look as if they had some kind of veridical quality to them. Still more occasionally, there are utterances of very profound kind of mystical wisdom. And still yet more occasionally, uh, there are quite considerable works of art produced in this automatic way. I'm thinking of the very, very strange case which has been 
frequently quoted and analyzed. The case of Patience Worth, this, this historical novel, which was produced by a quite unlettered lady in the Middle West, who, um, who wrote in this uh, archaic English style, which uh, never really departing from the uh, spirit and the vocabulary of the century in which she was writing, uh, a book which is it's not a very good book, but it's quite an interesting book, and it, it, it remains one of the real puzzles of the work of the positive unconscious. Where on earth did this thing come from? She, of course, affirmed that it came from uh, the spirit of some dead person who was speaking through her, but it, this may or may not be true. But uh, anyhow, the, uh, there was something in her mind capable of spinning an extremely good yarn and bringing it out, and also, I mean, still more remarkable, of, uh, of maintaining this kind of uh, historical, archaic vocabulary uh, over uh, quite consistently over hundreds of pages. In relation to the storytelling faculty, um, it's um, uh, worthwhile to quote the uh, the case of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, which is one of the most remarkable cases of, a, of an excellent author, who relied almost entirely on the. Uh, unconscious mind for his material. Uh, he tells us in Across the Plains that all his stories came to him in dreams or in reverie uh, from something not himself. He called this uh, part of him the brownies. He says, the brownies in my head present me with this material and all I have to do is to work it up into literary form. Uh, in the one of the, in the lecture which I shall give in relation to um, visionary experience, I shall have more to say about this very odd storytelling faculty which seems to be at the back of every mind, but which in certain minds is developed, as I say, to an extraordinary pitch. And here again, this is, I, I do think, a, a most a fantastic phenomenon that, uh, that this power of, uh, of invention of fictional invention, of dramatization, should lie lurking here. Most of us are aware of it, of course, only during dreams or in delirium. But uh, there are certain people to whom uh, this storytelling faculty uh, provides uh, an endless wealth of, uh, of material, either for their amusement or if they happen to be uh, capable writers for the purpose of... Uh, of um, turning out uh, fiction or drama. Now, before we leave this subject, I would like to mention one of the oddest uh, uh, phenomena of, uh, produced by the unconscious mind, uh, the phenomenon of what is called the calculating boy. Uh, these, are, these children are really, I mean, they, they seem to be entirely inexplicable. You get these children who... <coughs> Uh, have these amazing capacities for uh, doing arithmetical calculations in their head with extraordinary rapidity uh, and with perfect accuracy. I want to read an anecdote which I'm very fond of about one of these calculating boys who was called Benjamin Blythe, who lived early in the 19th century. <coughs> and this is a story which his father wrote down about him. They were his, He used to go for father like going for a walk before breakfast always, and the little Ben, who was then six years old, went for a walk with him one day, and as they walked along, Ben said, Papa, at what hour was I born? And Papa said, at 4 a.m., my child. And then he said, and what is the time now? The time, my boy, is 7.52. Ben worked along for a few hundred yards in silence, then stated the number of seconds he had lived. His father took a note of the number, went home, took out pencil and paper, made very elaborate calculations for about 20 minutes, and came out triumphantly and said, Your answer is out by 172,800 seconds. Whereupon Ben said, Papa! You have forgotten the two leap years of 1820 and 1824. 
complete collapse of the power, of course. <laughs> well, Ben Blythe grew up to be a quite capable mathematician. And uh, there have been, uh, I mean, this is a very interesting thing. Some, uh, there are two cases of calculating boys who grew up to be men of genius. One is Ampere, and the other is Gauss. Uh, one or two others have grown up to be remarkable mathematicians, have lost their calculating faculty, but have grown up to be and have been quite intelligent and, and even well above the average. Perhaps the most extraordinary thing is that quite a number of them have been far below the average in intelligence. The most extraordinary case of them all was a, a German in the middle 19th century called Darze, who uh, he was so really completely half-witted. He was unable to the day of his death to understand the first book of Euclid, but he had this unbelievable capacity for doing sums in his head, and for the all his life, for about 40 years, he was paid a small pension by the Prussian government to find the factors of numbers between seven millions and eight millions, uh, which he did with the greatest of ease. Uh, uh, this, uh, I, I do think, presents one of these strangest mysteries. I mean, where on earth does this fantastic... Uh, uh, capacity come from it seems um, it seems really uh, quite inexplicable that uh, we should that some people should have built into their brains uh, this um, enormous uh, 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 this enormous power of uh, arithmetical calculation which they don't they don't know how they do it in many cases they many of them have been asked how do you do it some of them have some ideas of how they do it, but some of them simply don't know at all. They just say, "I get the I get the answer." We, I'm, that there is some kind of not I sitting down in the basement which performs these calculations and presents the result to the conscious self, and the conscious self may, as I say, be a complete idiot. It is. Uh, we just have to hold up our hands with a complete incomprehension. Well, so much for the <clears throat> the negative and the uh, positive unconscious. Now let us uh, consider what may be regarded as the uh, deepest of all levels of the unconscious, namely the bodily level. After all, we all go about uh, with a body, and uh, it profoundly influences our personal life. And we know remarkably little about most of its uh, functionings. For example, I give the order, I want to raise my arm. Well, this is a very simple order, and the arm duly goes up. But how on earth does it go up? After all, we have no idea we can give this general order, but there is some kind of physiological intelligence within the body which mobilizes the resources of the body to carry this order out. And we now, I mean, this has been analyzed, and we see that this process is of immense complexity. There has to be a coordination of, of nerves and muscles, and below the, uh, the, organ the level of um, the massive molar level, there is, of course, the, the cellular level and the subcellular level. There's an enormous organization of um, electrical impulses and chemical exchanges and changes going on, uh, none of which, of none of which do we as personal conscious egos have the slightest awareness, and nor does, as far as we know, does any part of our unconscious with which we ever come into contact I either have the slightest awareness of this, that this, this kind of physiological intelligence works within us uh, in ways which, of which we are perfectly ignorant. Uh, the Aristotelian philosophers of the of Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, they used to call this, uh, this physiological intelligence which runs the body, uh, used to call it uh, by the name of the, the two aspects of the soul, the vegetative soul and the and the um, sensitive or animal soul. Now, these are quite useful terms, 
um, we mustn't, of course, take them too seriously. We must, they are merely useful as, uh, as names of processes, but they are by no means the names of, of functional entities. I shall sometimes use the word vegetative soul as a kind of shortcut for uh, describing the certain things which happen um, within the body. And the, the interesting thing is that the, the, this kind of, uh, of physio physiological intelligence uh, has uh, two aspects. Uh, there is what may be called the biological intelligence, the sort of generalized specific intelligence which runs our heartbeat, our digestion, which heals wounds when we uh, uh, hurt ourselves, which uh, mobilizes the resources of the body against disease and so on. And there is also a kind of ad hoc physiological intelligence which mobilizes uh, resources of the body but to perform specific actions. And some of these actions appear to have no kind of evolutionary precedent, and some of them even seem to have no kind of utility. Um, a very strange and peculiar example of what the physiological intelligence of a quite lowly animal can do is um, provided by the parrot when it imitates something. Now let's try to analyze what happens when a parrot imitates uh, a human voice saying something. Presumably the parrot consciously hears the human voice repeating this phrase, whatever it may be, and after hearing it some time, and this evidently penetrates into its mind, such as it has, and then something inside the parrot gets to work and proceeds to organize a noise-making apparatus, which in the bird is radically different from the human noise apparatus, noise-making apparatus, we have, after all, tongue, teeth, soft palate. Uh, they have a tongue of a quite different shape. They have a beak. They have no soft palate. They have no teeth. And, um, and yet the imitation that a parrot can give uh, is sometimes so good that uh, dogs will be deceived by the, by the bird calling out and they think it's uh, their master's voice. And even occasionally, I think human beings can even be deceived uh, by the, the parrot's words and think that it is another human being speaking. Well, this is really most extraordinary when you, you, you try to think, uh, to analyze this. I mean, that you see that there is something in the parrot, some, some kind of physiological intelligence, performing an ad hoc act which has no evolutionary precedent and no biological value as far as one can see at all, uh, performing it uh, in a way inconceivably more difficult than anything that the conscious parrot can do. Uh, the, the, there is a, a part of the parrot's mind, this, this unconscious physiological intelligence, is infinitely uh, brighter than the parrot's conscious mind. Now, in human beings, there are certain analogies to this. I mean, uh, for example, the gain the question of imitation, the uh, a very tiny infant will imitate the smiles of, a, of, so, of somebody who bends over the crib and smiles. Again, here is something within the infant which uh, arranges the, the most elaborate uh, uh, display of muscles to produce, uh, play of muscles to produce this uh, smiling. And we have, uh, we have examples which are very, very strange. I mean, uh, some of you may have read a very curious book which came out, oh, I suppose about five or six years ago, by a German psychologist called Perigel, who spent some time in Japan and who, um, uh, who uh, studied uh, the art of archery. There's a special art of Zen archery in Japan. He, his book is called Zen and the Art of Archery. And this is a particularly interesting book because one sees that the whole technique uh, uh, of this art consists precisely in the ego getting out of it the way that when the ego interferes 
world. It just messes everything up. I mean, actually, uh, to make a small digression here, it's quite obvious that uh, the what may be called the physiological intelligence of the body is almost infallible, so long as it's not interfered with by the ego or by the personal unconscious. The moment some kind of personal anxiety or subconscious anxiety or some other uh, subconscious distressing emotion comes into play, then we are liable to get uh, psychosomatic disorders. That uh, all that the ego can do in relation to the these physiological intelligences is to mess them up, to prevent them functioning properly. Well, here in this curious art of archery, what is taught is simply a kind of of organized passivity, of a, a stepping aside of the personal self and permitting this uh, physiological intelligence to do a specific ad hoc act, which is uh, firing the bow. And uh, the, the bow is, um, is fired with a, uh, the most incredible uh, accuracy. Uh, and and um, Herigel describes this whole process, and it's extremely interesting, as showing that, uh, like the parrot, we have something within us which is, in, in a certain sense, much more intelligent than we are. Um, it, it's, uh, again, one of these extremely mysterious things that we should carry around with us, this, this kind of uh, extravagantly well-developed intelligence which uh, can do not merely the daily miracles of keeping the body uh, balanced and functioning, but also these strange ad hoc feats, which, as I say, don't seem to have any kind of evolutionary precedent, and which it just performs for, because it's able to perform them. Well, now let's uh, briefly consider another aspect of, uh, of the body. Now, the word here, of course, of the body is a is a very unsatisfactory word because, uh, in point of fact, there are actually on this planet at the moment, I forget about two point nine billion bodies. And the the interesting thing about human bodies is that they're sufficiently alike to one another for them all to be recognised as human, but they are also sufficiently unlike one another for each of them to be recognized as belonging to a unique individual. Um, in general, I think uh, biologists tell us that um, variability tends to increase uh, in species according to their position in the uh, evolutionary hierarchy, that the higher you go up the evolutionary ladder, the greater the degree of variability, and the highest degree of of variability in any species is found uh, in man, that uh, there is this enormous um, enormous variability between individuals, and this of course is extraordinarily embarrassing for uh, the people who want to develop a satisfactory science of man, because after all, the science as we in the ordinary natural sciences is in the words of Emile Myerson, the great French philosopher of science, I and mean, science is the reduction of diversity to unity, the, the finding of a kind of generalized idea which covers the behavior of all the members of a class. But uh, with the human beings, uh, the differences are just as important as the resemblances, so that to a really satisfactory the science of man will re require not only the development of um, general laws of behavior, but also some way of talking about the individual differences between individu between the uh, special differences between individuals and the way in which these general laws of behavior are applied in specific cases. Mm. Now, the plenty of recent work exists which shows that um, which stresses the importance of these differences. Um, I was thinking of a remarkable work done at the University of Texas by Professor Roger Williams, whose uh, book, uh, Biochemical Individuality, points out that uh, 
on on the biochemical level we are um, even more different than we are from one another in the shape of our faces and bodies that there are these profound differences and in his other books he's pointed out that there are striking anatomical differences in the structure of different organs in the structure of the nervous system and so on which uh, indicate quite clearly that uh, uh, this immense variability uh, exists among human beings and that uh, it is no wonder that uh, we there is so much misunderstanding between people in the world. I mean, that the, the fact that we are so very unlike uh, one another uh, is uh, accounts, of course, for the extraordinary difficulties we have in getting one another on with one another, and also, I think, is one of the good reasons why we should be tolerant and have some kind of democratic uh, form of government which permits a certain degree of free choice I mean, if, if everybody were alike, then some dictator at the top could perfectly legitimately dictate what was good for all of us, because what was good for him would be good for everybody else. But as we are profoundly different from one another, then some kind of regime in which there is a certain freedom of choice is clearly more biologically uh, sensible than, than, uh, than a dictatorship. I think this is, a, is an important fact to remember. <clears throat> uh, now we come from the from the um, biochemical dissimilarities to the morphological differences, and here I would uh, recommend you to examine an extraordinary book which came out uh, well, three or four years ago, W. H. Sheldon's Atlas of Men. And this is a volume of several thousand photographs. Uh, showing the entire spectrum of human variability. Sheldon has worked on a kind of systematization of the differences between men, and this, uh, this sets forth the evidence of his uh, theories. And we see here this extraordinary display of different types of creatures. I mean, it's almost unbelievable that people as different from one another as the people at the three polar extremes of uh, possible variability you see, it's almost incredible that they should belong to the same species. Incidentally, the, I'm sorry to say that when one looks at this book, one is struck by the curious ugliness of the human species. And um, uh, I look forward with horror to the publication of its companion volume, which will be the Atlas of Women. <laughs> I think it will probably be a book of such an extraordinarily anti-aphrodisiac nature that should never be put into the hands of a young man. Uh, but uh, uh, the again, as I say, that this uh, in the most uh, clear and uh, pictorial form indicates the extraordinary range of variability between individuals. Now, <clears throat> quite an interesting uh, point here I would like to make very briefly is that if you look back over periods of history, you can see that certain types of uh, of um, physique and uh, temperament, which undoubtedly to some extent is uh, conditioned by physique. I, for example, I mean, no novelist in his senses would put the character of Falstaff into the body of Cassius or the character of Pickwick into the body of Uriah Heep. There is a certain relationship between the physique and the temperament. Uh, and as I say, that I think in every period of history there is there are one or two types of physique and temperament which are fashionable and which seem to be particularly useful in that period, and that those who happen to be born not belonging to that uh, type of physique and temperament find themselves very unhappy. There's a there's a poem by William Blake where he says, um, "Oh, why was I born with a different face?" Why was I not born like the rest of my race? When I look, people stare. When I speak, I offend. Then I'm silent and passive and lose every friend. And this is a, a certainly, this is a, a state of things which many people have suffered from. I mean, they, who find themselves physically and temperamentally in a world which approves of other types of physique and temperament than they happen to have. Again, it's, a, it's another a very good reason 
uh, for um, uh, for tolerance and for freedom of choice. <clears throat> In this context, I would like briefly to touch on something which I think is of great interest in regard to physique and temperament. That is to say, the traditional rendering in Christian art of the figure of Jesus. Now, this is very curious. We shall find here that there is, on the whole, there is a fairly standardized traditional figure. In no case, as far as I know, I don't think there is any example of Jesus having been represented as round and comfortable like the Chinese god of luck. And there is no case, I think, either of his having been represented as a kind of bustling, roly-poly figure like uh, Santa Claus. Uh, uh, almost always uh, he, is, he is represented as, uh, I'm using Sheldon's classification, as a a two, three, five, that is to say, somebody somebody with almost the lowest amount of sort of soft roundness, with about the middle amount of muscularity and drive, and a rather high in, in linearity and slenderness and sensitivity. And this, uh, uh, very occasionally, uh, great artists have represented the figure of Jesus as powerfully muscled. Uh, for example, in the famous picture in, in San Sepolcro in Italy of the Resurrection, uh, Jesus is actually more powerfully muscled, more athletic than the Roman soldiers around the tomb. And uh, in many paintings by Rubens, he is represented as very powerfully muscled. Uh, and this generally we find offensive. Uh, there's again, there's a, an epigram by Blake after when he'd seen a picture by Rubens where he said, I always thought Christ was a carpenter and not a brewer's servant, my good sir. And again, I mean, this shows how uh, profoundly we are aware of this, uh, the importance of the, uh, of the bodily relation uh, to uh, temperament and to behavior in the, the, in the world. Now, here yeah, I have much more time, but I would like very, very briefly to uh, speak about this immemorial controversy which has been going on for many, many centuries between the proponents of, the, of nurture and the proponents of nature, the proponents of the heredity and the proponents of environment. But this, as I say, has been going on in different forms for an enormous time. We get it originally in, the, in a theological form in the problem of predestination uh, or of, uh, of, of works. Uh, Matthew Pryor uh, wrote a very amusing two couplets which sum up the whole problem of predestination. It goes like this. <clears throat> Could destined Judas long before he fell escape the terrors of a future hell? Could Paul resist, deny, or not embrace obtruded heaven and efficacious grace. And this, of course, the extreme Augustinians would say, no, that they, they couldn't uh, escape this, that uh, the Jesus, uh, the Judas on one side and Paul on the other were predestined to their different fates. And uh, there was this great controversy in the fifth century between St. Augustine and Pelagius. Pelagius was obviously an early British behaviorist, because he came from Britain. Is Pelagius is a fancy name for Morgan. And uh, whereas Augustine maintained that man was born hopelessly depraved, uh, Pelagius maintained, like J.B. Watson, that he was born completely blank. And there was a tabula rasa that uh, he was born without tendencies towards good or evil, and that the sin of Adam affected only Adam, and that every child was born as innocent as Adam had been born, whereas, and that even an unbaptized child would go to heaven, whereas uh, uh, Augustine insisted that hell was paved not with good intentions, but with unbaptized infants. Uh, well, then, in later centuries, the, the uh, 
uh, argument between nature and nurture shifts its ground, and we find in the 18th century, for example, a, uh, a revival of uh, pure Pelagianism. We get, uh, I mean, in Locke, where the man is born as a tabula rasa, with, uh, still further, it goes further in Helvetius in the middle of the century, asserting that uh, people, that all abilities are due to education and environment, and that you could take any shepherd boy from the mountains of the Savins and turn him into an Isaac Newton, which I am afraid is rather optimistic, to say the least of it. <laughs> then you get, at the end of the century, uh, Lamarck with his doctrine that uh, acquired characteristics were inherited, and then you get a sharp reaction in the 19th century uh, with Darwin and Mendel and the later eugenists uh, insisting on the uh, importance of, um, of hereditary factors. In recent times you have had another swing back towards the Pelagian position with uh, the uh, early writings of Watson who did, uh, who affirmed roundly at one time that he, he could see absolutely no evidence for uh, musical or mathematical ability being inherited, and that uh, again that that any child could be turned into anything by suitable uh, conditioning, and uh, we have had, of course, for a time in Russia there was the revival of Lamarckism under Lysenko, who insisted that you could manipulate uh, uh, plants in such a way that you could change. Uh, uh, you could cause acquired characteristics to be inherited. Well, I, it seems pretty obvious that uh, uh, neither of these extreme views is correct, uh, that uh, obviously it seems to me that the nature and nurture are synergic, they always act together all the time, and that it's uh, perfectly ridiculous to, to stress one at the expense of the other. And indeed, if you analyze the... Um, the, the realities of the case, you find that if you are a believer in the existence of hereditary factors and their importance, then ipso facto you must be a social reformer, because it is only under good environment uh, that the uh, good hereditary uh, factors can find their full expression uh, in a bad environment. The um, a, a good heredity will either be repressed completely, or masked, or distorted in some way. So that every good eugenist and every believer in heredity, as I say, uh, should be a um, a social reformer. And uh, conversely, it seems to me that every good social reformer should certainly take into account. Uh, the facts of hereditary differences in order to make his environmental training of the young effective. And with this I will, will close uh, this lecture, which has run a little bit too long, I'm afraid. Uh, needless to say, I've only touched on very few of the endless factors which, uh, uh, which modern research has uh, revealed about human beings, but I I hope I've touched upon uh, some of them which uh, are of more significance than others, and I trust that uh, you'll find these, uh, uh, the modern view valuable, I mean, this sketch of the modern view, useful to you in your thinking about individual behavior and about the uh, march of events in the world. You've heard the second recorded lecture in a series delivered by Aldous Huxley at Kresge Auditorium while he was Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities at MIT. This is the NAEB Radio Network. The NAEB Radio Network presents Aldous Huxley with the third lecture in a series entitled What a Piece of Work is a Man? This lecture, a consideration of the individual in relation to history, was recorded at Kresge Auditorium for broadcast at this time. Here now to introduce Mr. Huxley is Giorgio Di Santillana, Professor of the History of Philosophy, MIT. Gentlemen, 
and labels. I happen to say at times to my students, in moments of miscomprehension, Gentlemen, you are the men from Mars. You ought to get acquainted with this, our planet. We are only here to try and help you. I should like, therefore, to pay my special respects to Mr. Huxley, who was not only a master to my generation, but in the specific issue, is the one who perhaps did most to introduce us to this planet. If I play a little with the time coordinate, one name comes to my mind which makes us feel a parallel to his. It is the name of Plutarch with his moral essays. The parallel covers a great span of time, but I think, I think it is a deserved compliment. Sometime, someone should draw that parallel between Mr. Huxley and Plutarch. He would find, for instance, that Mr. Huxley has it harder, as he's caught in the toils of progress, while Plutarch is not. The easy lightness and indefiniteness which in Plutarch made past and present appear as one are not granted to Mr. Huxley, whose long trail of intellectual adventure leads him now to ask anxiously of himself and of us, what are we going to do with the next problem, which is the overpopulation of the globe? There are no such end-of-the-trail problems for Plutarch. All is quiet, curiosity, and serenity. On the other hand, if Plutarch seems to us so often vague and diffuse, it is because he lacks the definiteness that modern science has built into our thought and into our language. Of this consciousness of science, of the way to bring it together with humanistic tradition, Mr. Huxley has become a master in our own time. And he has shown us not only how the facts of science modify our life, but how the experience of science in those who can have it modifies the inscape of our consciousness, to use a word that he has used himself out of Hopkins. Of the great exponents of culture, he is the one who has remained closest through the years to the scientific awareness. This is what gives point and relevance to his criticism, to his doubts, to his mystical conclusions, which last in Plutarch's him impersonal, almost a matter of course, and of one piece with his background. Mr. Huxley is going to speak to us today of the problems of the individual. Here again, how tragically different is his predicament from that of Plutarch, who stands in history as the expression of unselfconscious, resplendent individuality. Mr. Huxley has shown us in his work many facets of the modern problem of individuality, both in his novels and in Brave New World. He has shown us also the historical pathology of it from high to low, from Père Joseph to the devils of Loudun, from perverse aestheticism to the gathering progress of mass civilization. I see him in that respect as the master of anatomy holding the scalpel in Rembrandt's famous painting. We are hoping now for further light. Mr. Huxley, with us, the men of his, gener of his and our generation, has been the witness to the decomposition of European rationalism in the period since 1914. There is a strange, disorganized, properly demented will to power underlying rationalism in that time, which by now has spread to the rest of the world, not sparing even this country. I should say a kind of reverie or fantasy which asks the intellect only to deliver the means whereby its own folly may become acceptable. Men caught in projection and reverie, disconnected sensibility, arbitrary rationalizations, action at all costs, this is the intellectual predicament in which we moved and which drove so many to surrender to pure power in totalitarian or other forms. This proves sufficiently that in our time we have lost the principle of truth, and with it the principle of individual existence. Nietzsche's Zarathustra once found a little old woman who had never heard yet that God was dead. In our time it has been discovered that man too was dead, and there was a frantic search for someone to whom to entrust his succession. Shapes, dreams and possibilities came up unchallenged, the only decision was whether, facing events, they would break through or fall. The test of the validity of our thought was and is, one and only one, the dreadful arbitrament of history. If Mr. Huxley has played subtly with that theme of demonic possession, and has been thanked for it recently even in the European press, as I have shown him, it is a proof of his insight. But Mr. Huxley has given us another and more striking image of our time, or at least I take it to be such, for he sometimes speaks in symbols and darkly. I refer to his essay on those wonderful engravings of Piranesi, that portrait, those portraits of the ruins 
and splendors of Baroque row. There is a series of those engravings which is called the prisons, and this is what he has to say. I'm going to quote out of his variations on the prisons. The most disquietingly obvious fact about all these dungeons is the perfect pointlessness which reigns throughout. Their architecture is colossal and magnificent. One is made to feel that the genius of great artists and the labor of innumerable slaves have gone into the creation of these monuments, every detail of which is completely without a purpose. Yes, without a purpose, for the staircases lead nowhere, the vaults support nothing but their own weight and enclose vast spaces that are never truly rooms, but only anterooms, lumber rooms, vestibules, outhouses. And this magnificence of Cyclopean stone is everywhere made squalid by wooden ladders, by, flint, by flinty gangways and catwalks. But even where the enclosure is more or less complete, Piranesi always contrives to give the impression that this colossal pointlessness goes on indefinitely and is coextensive with the universe. Engaged in no recognizable activity, paying no attention to one another, a few small faceless figures haunt the shadows. Their insignificant presence merely emphasizes the fact that there is nobody at home. This, I trust, is a good hint that we have still a lot to learn from him about this odd, exasperating, somewhat wonderful and unforgettable planet of ours. Mr. Hutch. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk tonight about a, a subject which looks on the face of it fairly simple and obvious, but which is not at all simple when one examines it closely, the relationship of the individual to history. Let me begin by making an analogy out of, uh, in the world of physics. The relationship between a gas and its component molecules. Now, the laws of gases uh, deal with volumes, pressures, uh, and temperatures, and their inter interdependence. But when we pass from the gases to the component molecules, we find that an individual molecule has no pressure, no temperature, and virtually uh, no volume. Uh, all that it has in this particular context is kinetic energy and a tendency to random movement. Uh, we see then that the laws of gases are profoundly different from the laws governing individual molecules. And I think that mutatis mutandis, we can say that something of the same kind is true in relation to societies enduring over long periods of history and the individuals composing those societies. Uh, a society is really not an organism, it is just an organization, it has no powers of perception, no powers of thought, no powers of will. Uh, and uh, in this respect, of course, it differs profoundly from the organisms uh, which compose it. Now, of course, one of the most uh, striking effects about the, the difference between individuals and societies is the extent to which their, uh, um, their life, their biography, so to say, is predictable uh, in regard uh, to societies which are composed of very large numbers. There is a fairly high degree of predictability. Uh, any large mass of numbers uh, can, of course, uh, is subject to fairly accurate uh, prediction. We can work out the average behavior of uh, the innumerable particles yes. within those, uh, those large numbers and be pretty certainly right. And naturally, the larger the numbers, the more exact the laws. The numbers involved in even a very large society taken over a very long period are extremely small, of course, compared with the numbers which we deal with in physics. And for this reason, naturally, the, the laws or regularities we find in uh, social uh, masses are much less exact than the laws and regularities we find uh, in societies. Nevertheless, 
there are detectable regularities in societies existing over long periods, and uh, they are certainly significant. Uh, one of the sort of practical demonstrations of the difference between prediction in regard to individuals and prediction in regard to large numbers is illustrated by a consideration of fortune tellers on the one hand and insurance companies on the other. Uh, both are concerned with the business of foretelling the future, but whereas, as far as I know, <clears throat> no fortune teller has ever ended up as a millionaire, no insurance company, if it's reasonably well managed, has ever gone bankrupt. So that, that we see that there is a profound uh, practical difference between uh, the two uh, types of prediction. Where very large numbers are, are involved, we can predict sufficiently well uh, for insurance companies to become immensely rich and to own practically everything in, in a huge country like this. Whereas uh, fortune tellers, even the best of them, uh, are extremely hit and miss in their prediction, and as I say, never end up uh, by making great fortunes. Uh, of course, in relationship to uh, uh, large numbers, to societies, there is this, uh, one can say of them, that the nature of uh, physical, of uh, social laws, social regularities, cannot be discovered by means of empathy with individuals, by feeling into their state of mind, or even making inquiries about them. This will not tell us about the social regularities of the historical group of which they are members. Uh, conversely, uh, neither will the regularities which are detectable in the large groups tell us much about the uh, destiny of any given individual. The actuarial the actuaries of insurance companies will tell us that uh, the average uh, death age of a man is whatever it is, 69, of a woman, 72. Uh, but uh, this does not uh, permit us to say that uh, Mr. Jones will die punctually at 69 or that Mrs. Jones will live on for three years longer. This is merely uh, the statement of a regularity of a, of a, a, which can be observed when we look at very large numbers. And, of course, as it's uh, now been realized since the time of Boltzmann, uh, almost all general um, law, laws of nature are essentially statements of averages concerned with very large numbers. And <clears throat> that uh, th there is, therefore, this uh, uh, profound difference between the, the laws governing these uh, great numbers of large societies enduring for a long period of time, and the laws governing uh, individuals. Now, let us examine specifically uh, what is the relationship uh, between the individual and his society enduring in time. Uh, any individual, of course, is surrounded by history and his life runs parallel with a section of history. Uh, but to what extent is he in history? Uh, to what extent can he experience uh, this process which is going on on this large scale in relationship to great masses of people? Uh, now, first of all, let us inquire what is history. This, of course, m m many historians have brought up different um, definitions of history, but I would like to cite one of them, the, the definition of history given by a contemporary philosophic historian, Arnold Toynbee. Uh, what uh, Toynbee says is this, and where he begins by asking a question, what will be singled out as the salient event of our time by future historians? Not any of the tragic, sensational, catastrophic events that fill the headlines and occupy our minds, rather the impact of Western civilization on other cultures and the reaction of those cultures on Western civilization and the ultimate emergence of a religion affirming the unity of mankind. Well, this is one 
a way of looking at history, one philosophical way, needless to say there are many others, but all of them, I think, tend to take this extremely wide and generalized view of history. And the problem then, of course, is what is the uh, relationship between an ordinary individual and this kind of history? Obviously, if we consider uh, Toynbee's view of the important historical events of our time, uh, nobody now living is aware of this history. This is a, such a uh, this is a process on such a very large scale and over such a very long period uh, that uh, no single individual can really be uh, conscious of it. So that uh, in this sense, the, uh, the individual is not living in the history which seems important to the philosophical historian. He, the only sort of history he is consciously uh, living in is the kind of, uh, of catastrophic uh, history of the headlines, and we shall go into the, his relationship to those a little bit later. The philosophical historian, of course, is in the curious condition of, uh, of a situation where he has to lead a double life. As a, an ordinary family man and citizen, he is living as a molecule, obviously, but he is thinking as a gas, or trying to think as a gas. And um, uh, this, I think, does, in a sense, produce a kind of schizophrenia in him, which uh, uh, must be, I think, very uncomfortable, but nevertheless it is something which I think we all have to undergo, this kind of schizophrenia, of the, of the immediacy of um, individual uh, life and um, the, uh, the width uh, and gener generality of life on the great scale. But now let us consider what is the relation of the individual, even into the what may be called the semi-gaseous history of the catastrophic events of our time, and quite apart from the emergence of a new religion and the, and the action and reaction of cultures upon one another, what is, uh, in general, the relationship between uh, people, men and women, and uh, these events. Now, before we go into close uh, uh, examination of this, <coughs> let us just ask ourselves the question, how much of any individual life is related to history on either of these scales, on the fully gaseous scale or the semi-gaseous scale? Well, the first thing that strikes us is, of course, a most extraordinary fact that every human being passes a full third of his life completely outside of history and even outside of space and time. That is to say, he spends eight hours a day asleep. Uh, and this is, this is a profoundly important and interesting fact. It is the fact that we can, for one third of our life, escape from our wretched uh, egos and their problems, uh, is oh, the only thing which permits us to remain healthy and sane. It is known perfectly well that if people are cut off from sleep for any length of time, they will have a psychotic break and they will also become physically very ill. And we then pass on from the, the question of sleep uh, to other areas of human life. Um, let me know, let me, before this, let me go on a little bit further with sleep. Uh, this is really, the more one thinks about sleep, the more extraordinary it is. I mean, when one, uh, it's uh, fantastic, really, to, re to remember that for eight hours of each day, even the most violent fanatic, even the most fiendishly steaming devil, becomes, so to say, reconciled with the order of nature. He ceases to be himself and becomes this completely innocent and harmless creature. And I mean, which, thank heaven, does put a certain limit to the amount of harm he can do. <laughs> but even, even a Himmler, even a Stalin, even a, a great uh, financial operator like Jay Gould, 
does spend a third of his life in a state of innocence. So this is, I must say, a very uh, consoling uh, fact. What is less consoling is this, that whereas human beings can refresh themselves and uh, gain new insights and new vitality during their sleep, organizations never sleep. They are like electronic machines which have been programmed in a certain way and which go on doing this thing indefinitely until somebody comes along and either smashes the machine or puts in a new program. But meanwhile, they go on in a state of chronic insomnia, grinding out this particular thing that they were programmed to do. And I think this is one of the reasons why, when we examine the history of, of states and churches, we find so often that uh, uh, their, the records of their doing seem to be those of a kind of organized insanity. Uh, I remember when uh, I was at school, we used to sing a hymn which went, uh, how did it go? It went, uh, we thank thee that thy church unsleeping, while earth rolls onward into light, through all the world her watch is keeping, and rests not now by day or night. Well, this, of course, may account for the extremely unfortunate nature of a great deal of ecclesiastical history. Eat the church. The church never sleeps and is therefore gets no sort of direct uh, refreshment. I mean, fortunately, its individual members sleep and have uh, kind of inspirations from the from the beyond their own egos, and with immense difficulties can introduce reforms. But there is no way in which an organisation, however holy it may appear, can uh, itself refresh itself through sleep. That there, there is this profound uh, difference uh, b between uh, the, the, the individual and these large-scale organizations, uh, and that the, 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 the fact of sleep, I think, is of enormous importance, which we can't uh, overlook. Uh, now, from sleep, let us pass to some of the other aspects of human life, which are to a very large extent outside of history. Obviously, birth and infancy are almost completely outside of history, and even a great deal of childhood seems to go on with virtually no relation with the great historical processes going on. And the same thing is true of death. The decrepitude preceding death and death itself are again uh, factors outside of history. The the um, decrepit uh, person is not aware of the great historical processes going on around him and even relatively little aware of the short-range history. He is mainly aware with the diminution of his powers, the narrowing of his attention, uh, the, the general closing in uh, of everything around him. Uh, some consciously historical figures have tried very hard to to die in a historical way. It is reported, for example, of Daniel Webster, that when he was dying, and he was on his deathbed, he talked almost incessantly to his friends and ended up uh, shortly before expiring by turning to them and saying, have I said anything unworthy of Daniel Webster? And uh, after that, uh, of course, the the silence closed in, and that even the the most historically minded person has to yield finally to the ultimate facts of physiology and the spirit. Uh, and the in the end, as Lucretius says, eripitur persona manet res, the mask is mask is ripped off, and only the reality remains. And now, um, the um, uh, not merely uh, childhood and uh, old age uh, are outside history, but even considerable parts of um, of sickness. I mean, where the, the, the many people spend quite a number of years of their life uh, in ill health, and while they're in this state, they are again much uh, 
really profoundly out of touch with the cultural and historic life of their times, much more completely preoccupied with their own bodily feelings and the sense of diminution which is going on in their, uh, in their life. And when we add up the amount of time which is spent, I mean, in an, uh, in, say, in a lifespan of 70 years, how much time is spent outside of history? We find that adding sleep to childhood and the average period of decrepitude and of, uh, and of um, sickness, we find that about 40 years of our 70-year lifespan are spent outside of history. Now, this, this I do think, is a, is a very strange and interesting fact that uh, here we are immersed in history, we are, here we are the component molecules of a great social gas, and yet, as far as our consciousness is concerned, more than half our lifespan is passed entirely away from this, this world. But then we come <clears throat> to the question of private life. I mean, even when we are mature and fully awake, we have the choice between uh, living in a sort of continuous contact with the historical mo movements going on around us, or living a strictly private life. The best definition of a desirable private life that I know of uh, was given by Rosanov, the uh, Russian essayist who died shortly after the revolution, very curious and interesting writer, who described a desirable private life as picking one's nose and looking at the sunset. And I, the more one thinks of this, the better it is, actually. It's a, it's a wonderful definition, because it, 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 you can generalize it and point out that private life, enjoyable private life, is, of course, the enjoyment of physiological processes on one side and of aesthetic and intellectual and uh, aesthetic processes on the other. And uh, it, it, the, his, Rosanov's definition, I think, sums up a, a great, uh, great deal of, um, uh, of what our life is. Uh, we can, of course, go further into this. I mean, it's, it's quite clear, for example, that the sexual life is profoundly non-historical. There are many... <laughs> our cultural arrangements do their best to regulate uh, uh, marriage and sexual life in general, but the uh, direct experience of sexual life and the reason why it seems so profoundly important to people, I think, is precisely because, like sleep, it takes us out of history, out of uh, cultural relationships, uh, out of the sort of boring pattern of even out of our personal identity. And uh, this, of course, uh, th this final fact of, of sex being a kind of holiday from personal identity and from cultural and historical values was stressed again and again by D. H. Lawrence in his books. I mean, his the kind of religious, uh, the religion of the dark gods, the kind of uh, mystical... Uh, materialism of, of Lawrence's books are essentially uh, about this, about the possibility of escaping through the uh, the blood, as he calls it, into this uh, non-historical and even non-personal world. And of course, <clears throat> over and above these uh, various uh, physiological uh, escapes from history and uh, ourselves, there are the various aesthetic and intellectual escapes, which are of immense importance, I think, to a great many people. And it's interesting in this context to to look at uh, look into the history, look into the biographies of um, of people who have understood, be introspective, and have understood the nature of their own lives, and to see what they have said about this fact. Let me quote a, a very remarkable passage from Montaigne, where he says, <clears throat> Can I honestly enough confess with how very trifling a sacrifice of my tranquility and peace of mind I have lived almost half my life 
while my country was in ruins. Uh, Montaigne's life, of course, was contemporary with these unutterably savage religious wars which were going on in France in the later 16th century. And this is a, I mean, Montaigne, of course, was one of the most honest and, uh, and um, self-observant of men. And this is, I think, a very interesting testimony that a man can, by dint of, of living in an intellectual world, live completely apart and unaffected by the uh, catastrophic events of his time. And we see, uh, I mean, it's most interesting to look into the history of a number of great writers and to see the extent to which uh, um, great artists of different types, of the extent to which they seem to have been quite unmoved by the um, savage historical events of their time. I mean, take a great musician of the 17th century, Heinrich Schütz, for Schütz, uh, you read his biography, you spend, find that he spent all his time running away from the Thirty Years' War. He would be in one place and then the tide of battle would roll over and he would hastily go somewhere else. And uh, he, was, uh, he lived a hunted life, uh, trying to get away from these dreadful uh, warring armies who were devastating his country all the time. But you look in his music, and really, I think you find absolutely no trace of this at all. The music simply follows a kind of, of um, logical, it follows its own inner logic. I shall go into this later when, in, uh, when I talk about art. But it is very striking to find that uh, this, um, you would think there would be a, a strong historical determinant in uh, such a life as Schutz's, but not at all. It's uh, uh, the thing which... Uh, which conditions the development of his music is it an internal logic within the music itself and within the music of his immediate predecessors. But then we take a case like um, like that of Wordsworth, uh, the lyrical ballads, the prelude, uh, the great odes were all written uh, between um, between 1795 and 1807, which is of course was one of the most uh, um, alarming periods of, of European history and a period in which his country was at war for most of the time and which a, a tremendous kind of social uh, revolution as well as a, a, a considerable fear of invasion was going on in the mind of Englishmen. And uh, still more extraordinary, of course, uh, are the novels of Jane Austen. Pride and Prejudice was written, I think, um, yeah, 1796-97, and the other novels were written between 1811 and 1816. But one looks in vain in these delightful novels for any reflection of the really terrifying events which were going on while the books were being written. I mean, you have this impression that the life of the English country gentry and their clergy was going on exactly as ever, that they were just picking their noses and looking at the sunsets, in spite of Napoleon and in spite of the, the wild events going on in Europe and the menaces which uh, threatened the islands all the time. Um, another example I would take from the life of a man who has always interested me very much, the French philosopher, the greatest French philosopher of the later 18th and early 19th century, remained a Biron, uh, who left a, a very, very copious diary so that we know exactly what he was feeling and thinking every day of his life almost. But uh, now, th this is a, an entry of the in the early summer of 1794. Well, from a historical point of view, the summer of 1894 is important. It witnessed the execution of Danton and of Hébert, and it witnessed the uh, consummation, the apogee of, uh, of Robespierre's power and the dedication of the terror to the supreme being. Uh, you look in vain in uh, Maine de Biron's diary, really for any reflection of these things. And here is, a, um, here is an entry, which is quite interesting. Uh, he says, um, Today, May 27th, I had an experience too beautiful, beautiful to be ever forgotten. I was walking by myself a few minutes before sunset. Good 
The sight of nature filled me with ecstasy. Ravishment succeeded ravishment. If I could perpetuate this state, I should have found upon this earth the joys of heaven. And once again, uh, some years later, during the Hundred Days, uh, Biron found a retreat from history, which at that time was an extraordinarily uncomfortable thing for him, because he happened to be a convinced royalist who had uh, gone over to the service of the returned kings, and uh, then when they fled uh, during Napoleon's return during the Hundred Days, found himself in a very, very awkward position and uh, in considerable danger. Uh, but uh, what he says here uh, during the Hundred Days, he says, um, um, where, where does he, yes, um, he said, my mind is occupied with abstract speculations, foreign to all the interests of the world. These speculations keep me from thinking about the actions of my fellow men, and this is fortunate. For I cannot think of them except to hate and despise. Uh, one could, uh, I'm quite sure, even in the catastrophic events of the 20th century, we could undoubtedly find innumerable examples of the same kind of, uh, of retreat into private life, and the fact that the retreat into private life was possible even in the, uh, these catastrophic conditions. Um, the only difference, I think, between the present and the past is this, that it is becoming, particularly in the authoritarian states, increasingly difficult for the individual to escape into private life. All the dictators have used every means at their disposal to compel people to give up their private life and to live a public life in continuous relation with the horrible history which the, they, the dictators, are, are manufacturing all the time. <clears throat> and as I say, they use all the resources at their disposal, and their resources are incomparably greater than anything that was disposed of by tyrants in the past. You have only to compare the secret police of any state today with the secret police of Napoleon, to see that uh, Napoleon's police was absolutely childish uh, in comparison with uh, any modern police force. Uh, the modern dictator, and, the, and for that matter the modern democratic government, uh, has at its disposal all the resources for detection and coercion which can be imagined. Um, wiretapping, radio, past cars, or everything. I mean, there, there, there is nothing which they don't have. And, and already this, this figure, this terrifying figure, which Orwell projected into 1984, Big Brother, is in existence. Okay. Uh, in the past, what one can say is that whereas the uh, spirit of tyranny was always more than willing, it's... Um, operational, its uh, organizational and its uh, technological flesh were fortunately weak. And um, I think one can say, without any kind of irony, uh, that the greatest guarantee of liberty in the past was never laws or paper constitutions, it was the blessed inefficiency of governments. But, uh, uh, Liberty seems to become more and more difficult of achievement uh, in an age where governments dispose of such extraordinarily powerful uh, means uh, as any government does today. Now, to illustrate the point which I was saying that uh, dictators, I mean, we have they've had the example of the Nazi dictators and, of course, of the communist dictators, the point that they disliked individuals having private life and made a great effort to keep them continuously in touch with the history they were making. Uh, this fact is clearly illustrated if we compare the press in the totalitarian states with the press in democratic states, whereas in, with a few honorable exceptions, the, uh, most of the press in democratic countries is devoted to the more sordid side 
of private life, such as murders, sex, sport, and so on. Uh, the 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 press in uh, totalitarian countries is consistently uh, devoted to international news and to propaganda. The, the, the minimum of private life is admitted into the totalitarian press, and the reader is continuously having his nose rubbed into the public and uh, historical life of the time. Now, let's pass on to another aspect of the relationship between individuals and history. Now, the fact that most individuals spend a great deal of time outside of history does not mean that exceptional individuals do not exercise a considerable influence upon history. There has, of course, this uh, the notion of what the influence of individuals upon history has been has fluctuated from time to time. We have the sort of Carlylean conception of the hero determining history completely, and we have the conception uh, which was stressed by Herbert Spencer and uh, by some sociologists at the present time, that the individual plays no part at all and that, uh, that only great impersonal forces are somehow pushing people about. I would think that uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that, that historical changes are probably determined by the interaction of three main causes, uh, determined by uh, economic uh, pressures of one kind or another, uh, also by ideas, and also by exceptional individuals. The great uh, impersonal movements are certainly at work, but I think it is, seems to me quite clear that there are many cases in which outstanding individuals direct the, so to say, the energies within these forces into certain channels. Uh, it seems to me fairly obvious that if, uh, say, <clears throat> Bismarck and Hitler and Lenin had all died in infancy, it seems fairly obvious that the, the history of the 19th, later 19th century and of the the middle years of the 20th century would have been different from what it is. It might have been similar, but I think uh, without any doubt it would have been different that these uh, uh, these outstanding men uh, did uh, exercise a profound and very important uh, influence upon us. Uh, the, the speculations of what would have happened if, if what did happen hadn't happened uh, seem rather vain, and yet uh, they are rather interesting. The, the French philosopher Renouvier years ago wrote a book called Euchronia, which is the counterpart of Utopia. It's, it's not about a, a place which doesn't exist, it's about a time which doesn't exist. It's, it postulates that uh, certain events did not occur and uh, tries to uh, deduce what the course of history would have been if those events uh, had not uh, uh, taken place. Well, now I would like to illustrate finally the relationship between the individual and history by a brief consideration of progress. Now, a progress is two things, I would say. Progress is partly a myth, and to some extent, I think it's an observable fact. As a myth, of course, it's a new myth. It's a myth which arose more or less at the time of the Renaissance and reached a high pitch during the 18th and 19th centuries. And it took various forms. We had the sort of conditional progress of the 18th century when it was believed that all you had to do was to get rid of kings and priests and that everything, therefore, would, would go on getting better and better automatically if you did this. And in the 19th century, there was this idea that if you gave people universal education and taught them how to use the new industrial devices, again, the uh, sort of utopian society would inevitably evolve and keep on getting better and better. And then there was a still more mystical idea that whatever you did, there was a, would be an inevitability of progress, that man was in some way predestined to progress towards a, a perfect state. 
Well, I think the, the myths of uh, progress have obviously been dispelled uh, by the terrifying events uh, of the 20th century. I don't think uh, anybody uh, believes uh, as firmly, certainly, in the myths as they were believed in, say, a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. But on the other hand, I think one, one can say that although the myths are not true, uh, there is uh, something in evolutionary and historical change which can be legitimately called progress. I mean, for example, in the evolutionary uh, history of the, of the world, it seems clear that one is justified in saying that the passage from ordinary molecules to giant molecules, which were the basis of life, was a progress, that the, that the <clears throat> um, development of of unicellular creatures, then of multicellular creatures, was a progression, and that the development of uh, greater and greater complexities, which permitted greater and greater independence of the in from the environment, was also a progress, and that the development of an elaborate nervous system, again, was a progress. The interesting point is, of course, that uh, whereas <coughs> the progress is visible at the leading edge, so to speak, of uh, evolution, all the non-progressive forms are still there. I mean, we still have the giant molecules in the form of the viruses. We still have any number of unicellular creatures uh, which can go on quite happily living their life. But at the leading edge, there is this uh, something which does, I would say, uh, which can, deserves the, the name of progress. And in, the, in history, too, in human history, where the... Mm -hmm evolution through natural selection has been to a large extent replaced by a kind of cultural revolu evolution on the psychosocial level. Again, I think we can legitimately speak of progress in certain fields. We can speak of a definite progress in the understanding of, of nature, in the control of nature, to some extent perhaps in the understanding of and uh, self-control of human beings. So this is more dubious, I think. And here again, we have uh, the fact that there is a progress, so to say, at a leading age, uh, and that uh, people with genuinely Paleolithic mentalities can survive uh, in a world directed by 20th century science. This is certainly uh, a fact. But nevertheless, I don't think it, uh, it necessarily uh, invalidates the idea of progress. Now, what we have to ask now is, uh, to what extent uh, uh, do we live with progress? Do we experience it? I think it's clear that it can be observed objectively, but can it be experienced subjectively? And this is, uh, I think, a very interesting point. In regard to, the, of course, evolutionary progress, no, quite obviously it cannot be observed. To start with, there was for the first uh, two times, ten to the ninth years of evolution, there was no mind to observe the thing at all. And even when some kind of minds uh, came into existence, the uh, time span involved in any kind of progressive change was so enormous that it, uh, no individual could experience it subjectively at all. In the <clears throat> lower Paleolithic, I imagine, any kind of progressive change required at least a, a hundred thousand years. In the upper Paleolithic, required about ten thousand years. In Neolithic times, it uh, required about um, a thousand years, I think. And um, then, in um, we get uh, into historical times. Uh, where we get uh, important uh, progressive changes taking place in multiples of centuries until we finally get down to the present day where the uh, changes take place in, in multiples or even fractions of decades. Now, when we have the progress going at this uh, rapid speed, <clears throat> as we have now, it should be possible not merely to observe it uh, uh, objectively, uh, but also to experience it subjectively. But now, again, is this a fact? Do we 
experience uh, progress uh, subjectively. I, th I think we experience it much less than one would think that we do, uh, than one would think we do. Uh, take, after all, an individual human life. This is not a progressive thing. This is not a curve which is keeps on going up and up. It is a, a sort of cocked hat curve which rises to a certain point, remains more or less on the level, and then declines. And you cannot expect <coughs> an old person sinking into decrepitude to be conscious of the world going up and up. I mean, all he is conscious of is himself going down and down. And um, this, I do think, is, is a profoundly important fact, that as individuals we are not a, a progressive, whereas in a certain sense history may be regarded as progressive, we as individuals being non-progressive find it very difficult to have a direct experience uh, of uh, progression. But then there is the fact, of course, that <clears throat> the human beings have an almost infinite capacity for taking things for granted. Uh, we look up at a ceiling, a sort of luminous golden ceiling, and long to get there. But when we get there, we find ourselves walking on a piece of disregarded linoleum. I mean, this is just the floor that we are walking on, and we take it so completely for granted that we we are not conscious of the of the fact that it is a progress from where we were down below. And of course, every individual is born into the world as it is on the, his birthday. I mean, the modern child regards TV and jet planes as part of the nature of things, and he has no basis by which to, uh, nothing to compare them with. I mean, this is just, these things exist, and he is not conscious, therefore, that a great progress has been made um, in, uh, in, this, um, in these fields. Then again, of course, um, private life remains to a very considerable extent unaffected by progress. It is, it, certain aspects of it, of course, are affected, but a great many of the, of the um, factors which make the common life important, uh, private life important to us, simply aren't affected uh, by the uh, general march of progress. That we, we remain in a, a curious way, independent of this thing, which objectively, when we look at it from the outside, is so obviously of immense importance. Um, Dr. Johnson <clears throat> had a couple of lines which are uh, uh, relevant in this context. He says, How small of all that human hearts endure, the parts which kings or laws can cause or cure. Well, to kings and laws, we must add now um, advancing technology and scientific breakthroughs and so on, uh, these still, rem uh, although they are in some sense much more important than kings and laws, they still remain to a considerable extent outside our immediate experience. And Johnson had some, uh, another very nice remarks. He said, public affairs vex no man, and the news of a lost battle never caused any man to eat his dinner the worse. And conversely, the news of a major scientific breakthrough or the news of a new cosmological theory never caused any man to eat his dinner the better. That uh, we do remain in a, a strange way as very isolated from this immensely important factor uh, in our public life. So that um, we see that uh, here, yet again, I, I've used the phrase that man is a multiple amphibian. And we, we, here again we see our amphibious existence, this existence torn between the world of objective progress and the world of, of subjective, no particular progress, the world of private life and the world of history. We remain in this kind of uneasy balance between these, these two worlds. <clears throat> And I shall end with uh, quoting the, this uh, dark and memorable lines of, uh, of Fulk Greville, where he says, O wearisome condition of humanity, born under one law to another bound, 
vainly begot and yet forbidden vanity, created sick, commanded to be sound, what meaneth nature by these diverse laws? And what indeed? And then we let us end with the question, because we simply don't know the answer. Thank you. You've heard the third recorded lecture in a series delivered by Aldous Huxley at Kresge Auditorium while he was Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities at MIT. Next week, the fourth lecture, entitled Symbols and Immediate Experience. The program was produced by WGBH-FM Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters. This is the NAEB Radio Network. The NAEB Radio Network presents Aldous Huxley with the fourth lecture in a series entitled What a Piece of Work is a Man. This lecture, a consideration of symbols and immediate experience, was recorded at Kresge Auditorium for broadcast at this time. He's introduced by Dr. Houston Smith, Professor of Humanities at MIT. The logical introduction into this evening's lecture is by way of last week's New Yorker magazine. Many of you saw there, I am sure, the squib about our speaker. It consisted of a reprint of a statement of Leonard Lyons in the Post, which read as follows. Aldous Huxley is moving to California to teach at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology this fall. <laughs> To which the New Yorker's comment was, well, everybody has his own system. <laughs> it is the privilege of us who have been attending these lectures to get our speaker's system not as reported to the mass media, but from the man directly. Mr. Huxley, we knew that we would be happy that you came to spend these weeks with us, and we certainly are. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking to us this evening on symbols and immediate experience, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Well, my own particular way of doing things, ladies and gentlemen, in regard to this lecture, is to start with some concrete instances, some quotations, because I, I have a, always have had a feeling that the, the best and, in a sense, the most profound way of talking about abstract general subjects is, if possible, to do so in concrete terms, to try to find a biographical uh, illustration of uh, of some kind, which illustr which uh, makes clear the the nature of the generalized idea. So I'm going to uh, begin with uh, several quotations. The first of them is a quotation from Helen Keller's autobiography, which records what happened when an extremely intelligent child who was born who lost, uh, at a very early age, lost both her vision and her hearing, uh, what happened when she suddenly discovered language. This is, a, I think, it's a profoundly touching and profoundly illuminating passage, this. It goes as follows. My teacher brought me my hat, and I knew we were going out into the warm sunshine. This thought, if a wordless sensation can be called a thought, made me leap and skip for joy. We walked down the path to the well house. Someone was pouring wa pumping water, and my teacher placed my hand under the spout. As the cool stream gushed over my hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. Suddenly I felt a misty consciousness 
as of something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. I left the well-house eager to learn. Everything had a name, and each name gave birth to a new thought. As we returned to the house, every object which I touched seemed to quiver with light. That was because I saw everything with the strange new sight that had come to me. Well, this, I think, as I say, is a very touching and very revealing a statement about the immeasurable port importance of language to human beings. Well, now let us hear some quotations from the other side about the limitations of language. And the quotations I shall begin with <clears throat> are from some of the greatest manipulators of language in the history of literature. I shall begin with some quotations from Goethe. After all, there were few people who knew how to handle language better than Goethe did, and it's very interesting to hear what sometimes he thought about this medium in which he was such an amazing master. In one place he says, Gefühl ist alles, Name ist Schall und Rauch. And then there's the famous line out of, uh, of the Faust, Grau teure Freund ist alle Theorie und grün des Lebens goldner Baum. Grey is all theory. Green life's golden tree. And then in the conversations uh, with Eckermann, he has a very interesting uh, series of remarks. He says, we talk too much. We should talk less and draw more. I personally should like to renounce speech altogether and like organic nature, communicate everything I have to say in sketches. That fig tree, this little snake, the cocoon on my window sill, waiting quietly for its future, all these are momentous signatures. Indeed, a person able to decipher their meaning properly will soon be able to dispense with the written and the spoken word altogether. The more I think of it, there is something futile, mediocre, and even foppish about language. And another great manipulator of words, Emerson, has a, has a, speaks about the same problem from another point of view. He says this, Consider that the per per perpetual admonition of nature is, The world is new, untried. Do not believe in the past. I give you the universe new and unhandled every hour. You think in idle hours that there is literature, history, science uh, behind you, so accumulated as to exhaust thought and prescribe your own future and the future in general. In your sane hours you shall see that nothing yet has been written, that for all the poetry there is in the world, your first sensations on entering a wood or standing on the shores of a lake has not been chanted, it has not been chanted yet. It remains for you unwritten. And this, of course, describes the essential ineffability of uh, experience. We're accustomed, of course, in religious literature to be told that the mystical experience is ineffable, that it can't be written about. But in the final analysis, any uh, sensuous experience is ineffable. After all, the color red, this is a purely conventional term. When I say red, you have some notion what I mean, because you have had experiences of red. But this perfectly arbitrary syllable red uh, does not in any way uh, convey the exact quality of the sensation that we have when we are looking at, say, a red rose or a, a, a scarlet um, a poppy. Uh, and... Uh, this this ineffability, I think, is something which all great uh, artists in words have felt. Um, 
uh, I'm going to quote now a very beautiful passage from the Elizabethan poet Drayton, who has uh, four lines on this. He says, They are the smallest portions of the mind that pass the narrow organ of the voice. The great remain behind in that vast void of the apprehension, in that vast orb of the apprehension, and are never born. This is, uh, I think, a, a very beautiful statement of the, of the absolute ineffability, finally, of, uh, of all experience. We, we, this is something I shall have to try to talk about in the succeeding lecture, the problem of how do we convey, how do we communicate uh, uh, in symbolic form these uh, ineffable experiences. Well, we naturally, it can be done to some extent, but it, it, it has always remains for the great artist very frustrating that he cannot do what he wants to do simply because of the limitations of the medium. Well, then let's pass now from the arts to the more practical spheres of life. We find one of the great uh, masters of the practical political life, Talleyrand, saying, the function of words is to conceal thought. And um, he undoubtedly practiced uh, this function to an extraordinary extent. Uh, and uh, then when we turn to another great master, malevolent master of language, it's interesting to see what Hitler has to say about uh, the powers of language. He, of course, by means of, uh, of his uh, propaganda technique, was able to really establish uh, control of 70 million rational people in an uh, unbelievable, unbelievably effective way. And what he says about this technique is, you know, to be effective, propaganda must confine itself to a few very simple ideas expressed in a few uh, stereotyped formulas, constantly repeated. And this, of course, remains uh, in the whole sphere of political propaganda, in the sphere of commercial propaganda and advertising. This is a completely true statement, of the, which illustrates the enormous power of language. And now let us consider uh, the religious field. What have people in the religious field said about the limitations of language? We, uh, again and again, we find in the epistles of St. Paul statements uh, on this subject. I mean, he says, for example, the, the letter killeth and the Spirit give, giveth life. He says we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And uh, meaning that concepts, of course, notions, merely symbolic expressions of ideas, uh, are not the thing that save one. It is only, of course, through an, an immediate experience that the end of religion can be consummated. And in a, his own quite violent and paradoxical way, uh, Meister Eckhart says, uh, Why do you prate about God? Whatever you say about him is untrue. And we find exactly the same kind of statement uh, in the Far Eastern Mahayana Buddhism, in in Chinese Mahayana and in Japanese Zen, we find such statements of, uh, as this. Uh, the Buddha never preached the enlightening truth, the liberating truth. He never preached it for the simple reason that uh, what liberates is not the concepts which we read in the sacred books, but simply the uh, experience of liberation. And the, the Zen masters go so far as to say um, that anybody who keeps on pronouncing the name of Buddha, or to have his mouth washed out with soap, because uh, this is not the way to get to the, to the final the end of, uh, of religion. Well, we have uh, uh, all these examples, and I think um, uh, they, they are a very good introduction to a more generalized discussion of the relationship between the symbols in general, and in particular language, which is the most commonly used and the most elaborately developed of all our symbol systems, uh, they, they form an extremely good introduction. On the one hand, we see that language is all-important. On the other hand, we see that it has limitations. 
and can, in a variety of ways, lead us astray. Well, let us uh, begin by a, a kind of historical and psychological consideration. Uh, the words with which the fourth gospel opened, in the beginning was the word, are profoundly true in relation certainly to human life. I don't think we can't say that they're true in relation to the beginning of the universe, but they are unquestionably true in relation to the beginning of a human, of humanity and human civilization. It was the invention of language by our remote ancestors which finally distinguished man uh, from the, um, uh, the brutes. Uh, and the, the fact, the ways in which a human behavior differs from animal behavior are to an enormous extent conditioned by the fact that man has a conceptual language. The language of animals, of course, is merely a, a series of, of noises, emotionally conditioned noises, about uh, events taking place here and now. They have no conceptual terms, and they can't... Um, uh, they have no words which uh, indicate classes of things or the general resemblance of, of things. And this means that they can't uh, think in generalities, they can't think at all successfully about the past or the future, or about events which are remote from them in space as well as in time. Uh, a very interesting example of this was provided by the, the great uh, German ecologist uh, Köhler, uh, whose apes he found were perfectly capable if a banana was hung out of their reach and a stick was set before them, they were perfectly capable of picking up the stick and knocking the banana down. But if the banana was placed in front of them and the stick was placed behind them, they couldn't do this because they had to see both the things at once in order to be able to do this thing. We have, of course, a name banana and a name stick, and therefore we can hold these two things in our mind simultaneously, even when they are not simultaneously present to our senses. The ape, which lacks these uh, s symbolic concepts for the objects in question, cannot do this. So that we see this, ex this extraordinarily intelligent animal uh, limited in this absurd way. I mean, it, it, it seems absolutely incredible that a creature as intelligent as a chimpanzee should be so ridiculously uh, limited as, uh, as it is through this lack of language. And, of course, it is precisely the existence of language which um, makes the enormous qualitative difference between um, human and animal behavior. Uh, human behavior is, to a large extent, consistent and continuous. I mean, it can be. We, uh, we can go on pursuing a, a single goal for months or years together. This is simply because we have formulated ideals, we have formulated principles, uh, we have uh, this pattern of, uh, of language which acts as a sort of set of tracks along which we can run. The animal does not have anything of the kind, and consequently its behavior is, is extraordinarily intermittent. Uh, we, uh, uh, it's very curious, for example, to observe two cats fighting. You, they were they will spar up against one another and spit and scratch, and then suddenly one will stop and lift a hind leg and start licking itself, and the other will scratch and turn around. Then they will begin fighting again. Uh, and uh, this, of course, among human beings would be impossible because each uh, uh, opponent would have in his head, this devil is, uh, is out to kill me, he belongs to an inferior race, and, uh, and uh, I must uh, suppress him in one way or another. And uh, we have then, uh, this um, language gives us this capacity uh, to be consistent, both for good and for evil in our behavior. I mean, in this context, we can say that language is a device for making it possible for human beings uh, to do in cold blood what uh, animals can do only in the heat of, of passion, either positive passion of affection or love, or else in the negative passions of, of hatred and dislike. Whereas we, because of language, 
can go on behaving either, as I say, in the most extremely intelligent and, uh, and even angelic way, or else in an incredibly stupid and uh, diabolic way of which animals, both of which uh, ways of behaving, animals are, are completely incapable. Uh, this, I think, is, is an extraordinarily important point, uh, that um, we, we have this uh, capacity for behaving much better and much more intelligently than animals, but also behaving much worse and much more stupidly than animals. I mean, no, no animal would be capable of the prolonged uh, diabolism of people inspired by some hideous negative ideal which permits them to go on behaving abominably over years and years. Uh, and nor will, is any animal capable of doing the extraordinarily stupid things which uh, our superstitions and prejudices compel us to do. Um, with the language it makes um, it makes possible the, the, these two uh, extremes of human behavior. As I say, the, the angelic, it, it is possible for a human being to be a saint. It's not possible for an animal to be a saint. It is possible for a human being to be a, a great scientist. It is impossible for an animal to be one. But it is also possible for a, a human being to be a Hitler. Uh, and it is uh, also possible for a human being to uh, cherish the most grotesque and hideous uh, the superstitions and to act upon them in, in a consistent and grotesque manner. Well, uh, over and above this, uh, this control of, uh, of individual behavior, uh, language, of course, is what uh, gives the continuity to any society or culture. Uh, Lamarckism Biologically speaking, is untrue. The uh, inherited, uh, acquired characteristics are not inherited on the biological level, but they are inherited on the psychosocial level. Inasmuch as each generation, thanks to language, can profit by the uh, the knowledge uh, and experience accumulated by the previous generation and its ancestors in general, and can stand on the shoulders of its uh, predecessors and, and go further uh, so that the, we have, so to say, invented a new and much more rapid form of evolution by evolving this, um, uh, this um, extraordinary instrument of language. But again, I think we must stress the point that the uh, language can uh, bequeath to us from one generation to another not only valuable information and, uh, and ethically useful traditions, it can also uh, hand on monstrous superstitions, absurd prejudices, and uh, the most uh, the dreadful kind of prejudices in regard to, uh, to other human beings. So that it is always uh, ambivalent uh, in, its, in its workings. The, uh, in recent years, they, there has been, of course, a, a great stress has been laid in uh, modern philosophical writing on the immense importance of symbols. And it's rather interesting to find that in the Oriental tradition, this goes back a long way, this, this conception of the enormous importance of language. In the Indian tradition, uh, the, the power which creates the strictly human world, the world in which human beings live, is called Nama Rupa, name and fall. And this name is, so to say, the, the um, subjective aspect of form, and form is the objective, uh, the objectification of name and its projection into the outer world. And uh, name and form together uh, create the human world, the all too human world in which we live the world of uh, separate uh, objects, the world of the subject-object relationship, the world of, of, uh, of things uh, often quite unrelated to one another. I mean, there, there's this uh, remarkable fact that we do not, uh, uh, our language doesn't help us by its structure uh, to think of the world as a continuum. We have to think of it in terms of these separate objects, whereas, of course, 
uh, as we tend to discover as the science progresses, the world is a continuum, and it's extremely difficult to think of the world as a continuum in terms of the of the ordinary language. We have to adopt various kinds of uh, mathematical languages in order to be able uh, to think of the world as a continuum. Now, in the mystical traditions, both of the East and the West, uh, enlightenment or salvation or union with God may be described uh, as a, a grammar transcending state of mind where the world is looked at uh, not through the, uh, the kind of lattice work of the local uh, language and, and symbol system, but uh, in a, a direct experience. Um, the, I shall have more to say about this in, um, in a later lecture, but I just want to, to point out this, that, that you find this uh, again and again uh, arising, um, being stressed in the uh, mystical literature, that, that we have to get beyond the conceptual level in order to arrive at the, what the Hindus call moksha, at what the Buddhists call nirvana, at what the Christian mystics would call union with God. Uh, it is necessary to transcend this human and absolutely essential uh, preoccupation with language. Uh, again, here we have the same sense of the ambivalence of language, that it is absolutely necessary. We would not be human without language. But if we want to go to the limits of, of uh, the religious experience, we somehow have to get beyond language. Now, let us uh, briefly consider what, um, how minds work without language. Uh, William James uh, spoke of uh, immediate experience uh, as a, a blooming, buzzing confu confusion. And um, he uh, regarded language as the uh, artificial way in which uh, we impose some kind of order upon the blooming, buzzing confusion. Uh, I think now the, the, the contemporary psychologist and, and uh, neurologist would say that the confusion isn't quite as blooming and buzzing as, uh, as James supposed, that the nervous system itself uh, does a, a curious uh, job of selection and abstraction long before language comes into play. And of course, when we look at the, uh, at the lower species of, of animals, we find the most extraordinary uh, selection and abstraction going on in various species. I mean, actually what any animal is aware of is not the universe as we know it. I mean, it's not aware of the sky, the sea, the wind, the trees. It is just aware of what of those particular objects which are either edible or dangerous uh, to itself. And it lives in this exceedingly limited world. Uh, its nervous system is so constructed that it just selects out of the infinite number of data in the world uh, those aspects which are biologically valuable to it or biologically perilous. And some of these umwelts, as von Uxkill called them, of, of animals, are unutterably strange. It's been established recently, for example, that the world in which the frog lives is profoundly unlike any world of which we are aware. Its eyes are optically, apparently, very, very efficient. But it perceives only that which moves. When things stop moving, it doesn't see them. I mean, it, it, they sit on a lily pad and look down into the water, and when the minnow is moving, it sees the minnow. And when the minnow stops still, the minnow disappears. And so the, this must be a, a, an extremely odd world, to say the least of it. Uh, the difference between our nervous system and that of uh, even quite a, the higher um, animals below us is that uh, although our, our nervous system undoubtedly uh, selects and abstracts, it lets in a great deal more uh, than um, the nervous systems of most animals. Uh, and it lets in, as I say, a great profusion of, um, of data. 
and and a profusion which I think here uh, James is right that uh, if we did nothing about it would certainly seem a confusion. And uh, I think there is some evidence that uh, certain types of mental illness are characterized by an inability on the part of the sick person's nervous system to shut out those aspects of the universe which are unnecessary to him biologically or which are of no special interest to him uh, as a, a social being. I mean, apparently there are uh, some unfortunate people in mental hospitals who are bombarded by incredible number of uh, an incredible number of um, of stimuli of every kind, which uh, produces, uh, needless to say, the most frightful confusion. But even uh, even those whose nervous systems are working well and which uh, cut out a good deal of the external world still uh, let in a lot. And it is here, of course, that language comes in and that we, uh, we impose an order uh, by means uh, of language. Uh, we abstract and categorize and pigeonhole things uh, in uh, their various uh, categories uh, and so are able to, to create this order in, uh, in which we do our living. Now, we not only have this, I think, uh, uh, this kind of inborn capacity, not merely on the neurological level, but also on the linguistic level, for abstracting and then for turning things into symbols, we also quite clearly enjoy the manipulation of symbols. I mean, we, we love the symbols, and we like fitting them together into extraordinarily complex uh, patterns and systems which give us sometimes the reality and sometimes the illusion of understanding what the world is all about. And uh, we do this by, with, a, by, with a kind of play, it's a kind of art for art's sake. I think uh, if we look at the, uh, the symbol systems which uh, men of various cultures have produced, we are greatly struck by the fact that many of them quite clearly have absolutely no uh, biological value at all. They, they are the most um, uh, elaborate kind of, of games which uh, uh, we impose, uh, which we play, and which, uh, through whose rules, uh, we look at the world. And of course, if, when one examines the uh, history and looks into the, what has happened in various cultures, we see that um, these games which we produce, uh, these curious uh, structures, symbolic structures, which we build up for fun, may often be not merely not useful to us, but also may be positively harmful. Uh, for example, I take the, the case of an extraordinarily intelligent people, the Greeks. Uh, in spite of their high rationality and their high development of science, they still believed that astronomy had a kind of special human meaning. Uh, and we see as a, a curious event in history um, that this belief could be absolutely disastrous. Uh, on a certain day, I think it was the 27th of August, uh, 413 BC, uh, there was an eclipse of the moon. Well, at this date, uh, uh, Nicias and the Greek army were besieging Syracuse and they were thinking of going home because they, they were obviously not succeeding in their, their effort. But the, there was an eclipse of the moon and as everybody knew, uh, an eclipse of the moon is extremely unlucky and no one should travel for at least a month after this. Well, the, Nicias decided to remain for another month and in the course of that month his fleet was totally destroyed and all his army was captured and enslaved. Uh, and another uh, disastrous example of what happens when we start playing with our symbol systems and build up these fantastic uh, uh, structures out of them is provided by the Aztecs. The Aztecs also had very curious views about the 
nature of astronomy. They thought that, uh, that the sun would get tired and die if he wasn't constantly supplied with food, and that the best food for the sun was human blood and the hearts of victims. And they, they used to raid their neighbors and, and carry off um, uh, huge numbers of uh, oh, prisoners whom they would rip the heart out of on the, the, the altars dedicated to the sun. Well, what was the consequence of this? The consequence was that when the tiny band of Spaniards arrived, all the neighbors of the Aztecs joined the Spaniards, and that the, the, um, the Aztec regime came to an end very, very rapidly. And we find these, uh, as I say, these uh, uh, extraordinary playful manipulations of, system, of, of symbols built up into all kinds of mythologies and, uh, and pseudo-philosophies and pseudo-sciences at all periods uh, uh, in the history of the world, and, and sometimes they are quite harmless, merely rather absurd, and, uh, but sometimes they are profoundly harmful, and yet men will go on cherish, cherishing them, such is the First of all, the extraordinary psychological inertia of man that he he he, he won't he does he dislikes changing even that which is obviously extremely inconvenient and uh, harmful. Um, and secondly, he has a, of course a, uh, there's a kind of vested interest in these things, and he he tends to regard them in some way as sacred. And uh, as we we see from the case of Socrates and from many of the of the heretics throughout the ages, that it is extremely dangerous to start uh, questioning the validity of these uh, symbol systems. Now, <clears throat> I would like here to uh, speak briefly about the uh, symbol systems which are rather nearer to us. The, um, let us take the case of the Middle Ages. Why didn't the Middle Ages uh, develop anything resembling uh, modern science? Well, the answer to this is given by the great uh, uh, French historian of medieval art, Émile Mal. What he says is this, in the Middle Ages, the idea of a thing was always more real than the thing itself. The study of things for their own sake held no meaning for thoughtful men. The task for the student of nature was to discover the eternal truth which God meant each thing to express. Now, but when we inquire what was the eternal truth which was supposed to be expressed by each thing, we find, of course, that it was not the laws of nature as we, we speak of them, which was not the regularities which can be discovered by observation and also which require for their discovery the sacrifice of many old prejudices and even of common sense, as we're discovering now, uh, far from that, the eternal truths which were to be discovered in things were notions uh, deduced by logicians from other notions uh, and fantasies which could be found in books which were regarded as authoritative. Uh, so that <clears throat> uh, we have, when I must confess that when I read the literature of the Middle Ages, I begin by being entertained and amused by this curious anthropomorphic uh, view of the world, but in a very little while I find myself not merely profoundly bored, but also feeling a sense of terrible oppression. One seems to be shut into a kind of prison. There are no windows in this med medieval world. Everything in, uh, uh, in um, Gerald Manley Hopkins's words, um, um, Wait a minute, what is the phrase? What is it? Um, shares man's smudge and um, shares man's smell. There is this terrible, sort of all too human quality about the world. Um, yes, it wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. Uh, this I do find extremely depressing in the whole medieval world picture. But it was all, it was impossible for human beings, given their symbol system, which they accepted without question, most of them, to get outside this prison. And in a much more recent case, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a very interesting example of the impossibility 
of getting beyond a going symbol system. We have a very good example of this in the history of hypnosis, which is a subject I happen to be very much interested in. Uh, if you look at the history of hypnosis in the first half of the 18th of the 19th century, you are astonished to find that extremely intelligent men refused to believe the evidence of their senses. Uh, they saw these hypnotic phenomena. I mean, for example, eminent doctors would see a hypnotic operation, uh, an operation being carried out, an amputation being carried out under hypnotic anesthesia, and would say that it wasn't true. I mean, they would say that the little man was obviously shamming, just pretending he didn't feel pain in order to annoy the doctors, or that in some way the uh, the operator was bamboozling them. I mean, it is absolutely incredible when you read the, the history of this, and to also to read the way in which great pioneers in this field, who did, who demonstrated, for example, that they, they could reduce the mortality rate of, from, from surgery, which was then 29% uh, to 5% by using hypnotic anesthesia. Men like Esdale were simply hounded out of the medical profession for what they did, instead of being greeted as saviors of society, not at all. They were attacked because it was impossible for these, for their, their orthodox colleagues to get outside the prison of the symbol system in which they had been brought up. And much more recently, uh, there's a, uh, William James, of course, uh, had the same complaint about uh, his colleagues in regard to a subject in which he was deeply interested. Um, ex what is now called extrasensory perception. And he says again and again that the, uh, the evidence, which was considerable then, and which I think is still more considerable now, was simply disregarded because it did not make sense in terms of the Weltanschauung, the, si the symbol system, which was then fashionable. And rather than extend the system so as to embrace the new facts, the new facts were rejected in order to retain the system. And in this context, I would like to quote a, a remark which my grandfather, Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, made about uh, Herbert Spencer. He said that Herbert Spencer's idea of a tragedy uh, was a deduction foully murdered by a fact. And <coughs> Now, it's quite obvious that our present uh, symbol systems are a good deal wider and more comprehensive than those, say, which were current in the Middle Ages. But uh, I think, undoubtedly, the historians of the future will look back and note with astonishment the, the way in which our attachment to our present kind of symbolic uh, picture of the world uh, has blinded us to facts which to them will be completely self-evident. I mean, I don't know what these facts are, but I, I think we can say without any doubt that a, a hundred or two hundred years from now, people will look back and think, well, isn't it incredible that in the middle of the 20th century, when such and such facts were so obvious, staring people in the face, that their attachment to their particular Weltanschauung, their particular symbol system, was so strong that they could not uh, envisage these facts. They could not take them in and incorporate them into the uh, general picture of knowledge. Well, uh, the the moral of all this uh, uh, seems to me clear that we uh, somehow that we have to make the best of both worlds. The best to make the best of the world of immediate experience, uh, which I haven't been able to discuss at any length today, which I hope to discuss in a in a later lecture, the world which we re receive in a, in a state of receptivity. Needless to say, no experience is absolutely immediate because all our experiences are to some extent conditioned by the uh, cultural milieu in which we've grown up, by the symbol system which uh, is imposed upon us by our language. But there are, there are degrees of immediacy. I mean, we can be much more immediate or much less immediate in the way we experience the external world. 
And uh, as I say, the, the problem which uh, seems to me to confront us both collectively and individually is how to make the best of these two worlds, to, to make the best of this fresh world, or the world which uh, uh, the newness of the spirit, as St. Paul says, or the life's golden tree, as Goethe says, to make the best of this world of pure receptivity, and also to make the best of the uh, of the symbolic and above all the linguistic world. And um, our business is first of all, I think, to find methods for training ourselves in being more aware of uh, internal and external data, and also means for continually refining and improving the symbol system which we use in order to impose sense and meaning upon the world. Uh, after all, one of the uh, great uh, intellectual developments of the 20th century has been a development in the field of linguistics. Uh, we do know much more about the nature of language and about the, its limitations uh, and its capacities than was known in the past. And uh, I, I think it is very important that this knowledge should uh, go down right into the roots of education. I mean, that it's possible to teach some of this knowledge to quite small children and to develop the, the teaching as the young people grow up, uh, so as to make them uh, more aware of the relationship between uh, uh, the symbolic world in which they have to do their thinking and the world of immediate experience in which they do their most of their aesthetic and their, uh, their spiritual and phys physiological living. Uh, so that, I mean, in, in fine, I, we just have to stress once more this fact, which I have spoken about several times, that we are amphibians and that it is our business to get on, as, uh, to, to get the maximum out of all the universes uh, to which, owing to our strange amphibious nature, we have access. And this is something I shall uh, go on in uh, an, uh, developing in the later lectures, because, I mean, as I say, we are multiple amphibians. Uh, we are not merely amphibians in relation to, to immediate experience and to, uh, to symbols, but we are amphibians in other respects, too. And um, we, uh, as I say, the, the final morals, as far as I can see, is that we must somehow learn to make the best of all the worlds in which our extraordinarily complex nature uh, predestines us to live. Thank you. You've heard the fourth recorded lecture in a series delivered by Aldous Huxley at Kresge Auditorium while he was Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities at MIT. Next week, the fifth lecture entitled, Why Art? The program was produced by WGBH-FM Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters. This is the NAEB Radio Network. The NAEB Radio Network presents Aldous Huxley with the fifth lecture in a series entitled What a Piece of Work is a Man. This lecture, entitled Why Art, was recorded at Kresge Auditorium for broadcast at this time. Aldous Huxley is introduced by Professor William C. Green of the Humanities Department, MIT. This is the fifth of the lectures of Mr. Huxley. Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities, the Institute, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In his first lecture, he spoke about the antique conception of the psyche, in which he used a figure I thought very nice, a sort of visceral committee system, and stressed also the idea of sort of external possession. In his second speech, he spoke of the more recent conception of the dynamic unconscious, in which I think he stressed, contrary to Mr. Freud's idea of sort of psychopathic evil that comes out of the unconscious, the good that the unconscious sometimes shoves up. In his third speech, he spoke about 
O private and public life, history, progress, the fact that we are too often don't feel history as it passes, and uh, spend our lives largely in privacy and to some degree in sleep with a goal which he suggested in a lovely figure of wishing to sit alone picking our nose and staring at the sunset. In his fourth lecture, he spoke of words as symbols, which do indeed transmit the past, allow us to have new ideas, but which are also to some degree blinders to new ideas and new experience. His lecture tonight is abruptly titled, Why Art? Mr. Huxley. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. why art? Uh, this, of course, is an enormous and extraordinarily difficult subject, but I will begin by asking not merely why art, why science, why philosophy? Uh, I suppose the ultimate answer to these questions is that human beings do seem to have a kind of innate will to order, a kind of urge for imposing order and for finding meanings uh, in an otherwise incomprehensible world, and that in their different ways, uh, science, philosophy, and art uh, help man to to impose this order, to look for this order, to impose it, and to give meaning to what is otherwise a completely mysterious uh, world in which he lives. Animals, I presume, have no need of science and philosophy and art because the process of ordering has been done for them by their nervous systems. It is done in an extremely simple and very effective way, their nervous simply, system simply shut out uh, all elements in the world except those which are strictly necessary to them for biological survival. They live not in the wide and enormous mysterious universe that man lives in, they live in what may be called a tiny verse. Uh, the, the thing is so snug and, uh, and uh, tightly enclosed, that there really no problem arises, and they don't have to uh, invent these uh, elaborate order-giving systems such as science and philosophy and art. Whereas man lives in a world so huge and so pro profuse and, um, and mysterious that he has to devise uh, these methods for uh, imposing order by means of symbolic systems. And of course, science and philosophy, in that various ways, impose order in terms of uh, rational analysis, whereas art imposes another kind of order in terms of beauty uh, embodied in, in uh, significant forms of one kind or another. Well, in the most uh, general way, what are the criteria which we use in judging works of art in terms of this idea of order and meaning? Well, I, I suppose it, let's keep the, these, this matter on the most general level. We can criticize a work of art for having too little order. Mm -hmm. The order is inadequate. The, the work of art is muddled. Or else there may be too much order, too rigid an order, in which case that we feel that the work lacks spirit and vitality. Or on the other hand, the order may be in some way extremely commonplace and boring, uh, or it may be awkward in some way, and in that case we feel that there is a certain vulgarity or an ugliness about the work. And then in regard to, to meaning, the work of art may express a meaning which is either subtle or extremely obvious, uh, either realistic uh, or, or false, 
um, either noble or ignoble. And uh, all these, uh, uh, these distinctions constitute adequate um, criteria of judgment. But then, of course, the, the order and the meaning may be imposed upon an, an experience uh, which may, on the one hand, uh, be shallow and narrow, and on the other hand, uh, may be profound and very wide. And I would think certainly that the greatest works of art are those created by, those, by men and women whose experience, uh, whose power of, of imposing aesthetic order is very great, and whose experience is uh, wide and deep. And of course, this wide and deep experience is essentially based upon uh, great capacities of sensitivity and sympathy. This, I think this, um, this question of sympathy, of being able to feel ourselves into the world around us, is of immense importance to the artist. This has been expressed, uh, uh, for example, there's a very fine passage in Whitman where he says, um, Whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral, dressed in his own shroud. And he says again, I am the man, I suffered, I was there. He identified himself with the, the subjects he was writing about. And in a very different, uh, more classical tone, we find Matthew Arnold saying the same thing in The Strayed Reveller, where he the stray reveler speaks about the the gods and the poets that they both uh, see the world with this this god's eye view uh, of um, uh, humanity at large but whereas the gods do not identify with the world's suffering the poet does and the stray reveler concludes such a price the gods exact for song to become what we sing now, uh, the function of the artist is to become what he sings and then to express by means of extremely penetrating and powerful symbols uh, what he has experienced. Uh, needless to say, all experience is ultimately ineffable. We have, of course, concepts for everything, but they are finally quite inadequate to the experience itself. It is not only mystical experience, but even the most ordinary sens sensory experience is really ineffable. We have these uh, conventional words in which to describe it. And the essence of all poetry, of course, is in some way to, to make the ineffable effable by, uh, instead of uh, trying to express the indescribable in rational terms, but the poet goes about it in a circular way and, so to speak, encloses this, uh, this void of ineffability with a network of symbols uh, whose uh, arrangement is such that, so to say, they take on their quality from the white spaces between the lines, from the, from the emptiness within the network. They, they in some way do create a, a kind of equivalent of, uh, on, symbolic, uh, on a symbolic level of the experience which they express. And this is a very mysterious thing. It's extremely difficult to understand how it is that uh, art at its highest can somehow bypass the essential ineffability of experience and uh, create the, a kind of experiential equivalent in terms of symbols. Nevertheless, however difficult and mysterious this process is, this is precisely uh, what, uh, uh, what happens, I think, when a work of art on a great scale is created, that we do somehow make this equivalent of experience in terms of symbols. Well, now let us consider briefly uh, the relation, the importance of art in relation to ordinary life and society. Why art here? Well, I, I think one of the reasons of why art 
is that um, art is certainly one of the elements which helps to give a style to life. It may either give a good style or a bad style. And good artists, uh, I think, uh, uh, really are uh, benefactors of society in as much as they, they help to improve the general style of living. Because as Oscar Wilde remarked very truly that uh, art uh, doesn't so much imitate nature as nature imitates art. This, is, this happens uh, again, and we see this happening again and again in the history uh, of societies, that they do, that people do take on in their practical living uh, the qualities suggested to them by their works of art. And in this sense, the <clears throat> aesthetic shortcomings uh, may be regarded almost uh, as moral delinquencies. There is a certain justice uh, in the phrase which the crowd cries out in um, Julius Caesar, tear him for his bad verses. They haven't got the right reason there, but there probably are quite good reasons for tearing people for their bad verses, because they do, by producing bad works of art, lower the general style of living. I, I think it would be quite untrue to say that the the work of art is the only factor determining the general style of living within a society, but it is undoubtedly one of the um, uh, of the factors, and as such, it has, I think, a great uh, uh, social importance. And now, <laughs> briefly, I would like to make a digression on another of the functions of art, which is the cathartic function, the therapeutic function. Uh, art, it seems to me, has two functions. One is communicative, where a person of great talent uh, communicates through his power to create expressive symbols, communicates uh, insights which his special talents permit him to have, it communicates qualities within this uh, experience of his which his powers of sensitivity and sympathy uh, allow him to uh, have within himself and to give out. Uh, this is one of the functions of art. And the other function uh, is a, a cathartic and therapeutic function, and many of the great artists, have, of, of course, have often spoken of this cathartic function of art. They have spoken of the way in which the uh, artistic expression uh, does permit the release of tension within the, within the artist himself, uh, and the getting rid of all kinds of painful emotions. And this is the second function of art. Now, I would say that practically everybody would be well advised to practice art for its therapeutic values. Uh, the sort of do-it-yourself painters, the Sunday painters, the, the uh, um, ceramic workers and so on, they are undoubtedly doing something which is extremely good for themselves uh, in uh, getting rid of all kinds of internal troubles in this way. But I think the point which has to be stressed is this, which I think one has to emphasize to all Sunday painters, that although my painting a picture may do me a lot of good, your looking at my picture may not do you any good. <laughs> uh, in fact, it may give you a severe pain and, uh, and make you feel rather seasick. And for this reason, I think one should always advise the, the Sunday painter to confine himself to therapy and not to exhibit. Uh, leave the exhibition of paintings to those who can communicate and who have something to communicate. Unhappily, the world is so unjustly arranged that there are relatively few people who have very much to communicate, uh, and above all, who have this very strange uh, talent for using symbols in such a way that communication can take place. And now, let's consider some of the forms of art. And here, I think it's worth uh, drawing an analogy between uh, the arts and the sciences. Uh, in the history of science, we see two methods of thinking about the, the world, or two types of methodology. There is the atomistic method, first of all, the method of analyzing things down into their constituent uh, parts and elements, <clears throat> and this is represented in 
classical antiquity by um, Democritus, um, and then we see it uh, revived in the uh, period of modern science with Galileo and Newton, and uh, in modern days by the contemporary physicists and chemists. This is the, the analytical method, which of course has been immensely fruitful. But there is also another way of looking at the world, which is the, <coughs> the method of seeing not the component elements, but the general forms or gestalts within nature. And um, this is represented in antiquity by such thinkers as Plato and Aristotle, and uh, in modern times by the comparative anatomists, by the morphologists. Incidentally, the word was invented by a poet, by Goethe, the morphology, uh, and um, by the uh, students of growth, by Gestalt psychologists, and so on. And this is a, uh, a legitimate, and we discover, an extremely fruitful way of looking at the, at the world. Now, in general, it may be said that, um, that art uh, has pursued the second method more than the first. You see, it has been generally a search for forms within the natural world and an and imposition of forms to make the explanation and the comprehension of the world more clear. We have, as I say, not only looked for forms, but we have also in art imposed forms upon uh, our experience. But there has, I think it's true to say, there has also been a considerable experiment, particularly in modern times, with what may be called atomistic uh, art. Uh, in the world of the novel, for example, we see atomistic novels uh, represented by such works as uh, Lawrence's Women in Love, the novels of Dorothy Richardson, uh, of James Joyce, uh, all these as, are, so to say, atomistic narratives carried on rather like the uh, w in the world of physics, of atomic physics, which goes, uh, which uh, considers reality below the level of qualities. Uh, so these atomistic novels consider human beings, so to say, below the level of character. In the same way, we find uh, in uh, in contemporary music such. Uh, uh, composers as Boulez, who are writing music which, so to say, is below the level of melody. And in painting we see uh, phenomena like, uh, such as um, Jackson Pollock, who is painting below the level of geometry, uh, very much as the uh, atomic physicist works uh, on nature below the level of qualities. Uh, and <clears throat> in general, however, I think the art has more often uh, pursued the forms, uh, the gestalts within nature, and as I say, has tried to impose its own uh, system of forms uh, upon the world. Well, of course, there are quite clearly two types of art. There's the type of art, uh, the pictorial and plastic arts, which deal with space. And then there are the other arts whose uh, fundamental medium is time. Uh, the art of music, of poetry, of drama, of n narration. Uh, these are temporal arts, and the others are spatial arts. And uh, within the uh, spatial arts, of course, the, the fundamental uh, forms, the fundamental types of arrangement are, have to do with... Um, symmetry and asymmetry. And it's, um, it's interesting here to, to look at the, the way in which I think it's true to say that uh, this, the arts which deal with space have borrowed a number of their significant symbols from the world of nature. Uh, for example, <clears throat> if we look at the world of nature, we find uh, that um, Everything which we regard as living and dynamic, I mean, the typical uh, animal, from the insect up to the, uh, to the mammal, is uh, bilaterally sy symmetrical, but asymmetrical fore and aft. In other words, it has a head and a tail, and its, uh, its legs on each side are much the same. Uh, and this, this sort of one-pointed symbol, this arrow-like shape, is... Uh, I think one will find in all uh, uh, 
pictorial forms that this is a very powerful dynamic symbol uh, it, uh, whereas the the uh, circular symmetry radial symmetry is found only in plants and in sessile or free floating forms it is not found in forms of animal life which uh, which move of their own volition it is found as i say only in those which are attached to the earth or which float about in water or also in plants which uh, do not move in the same way as animals move and i think this uh, this fact this profound uh, and obvious natural fact is perhaps what accounts for the feeling that we have about the curved form and the pointed form i mean we certainly get as we look at Romanesque ar architecture with its rounded arches, a sense of repose and the domes and so on. And from the Gothic architecture, which is uh, with its um, one pointed uh, drive upwards, uh, this sense of uh, dynamic power. Uh, and I think one could probably, with a little ingenuity, find many other examples of uh, symbols which have been taken from natural objects and incorporated into the symbol vocabulary which artists have used well then within the uh, the temporal arts uh, we find also a certain taking over of uh, the natural forms of um, of rhythm within the world i mean we are perfectly familiar of course with these uh, these temporal natural rhythms there are the astronomical rhythms night and day the circles of the moon the coming and going of the seasons the cycles of vegetation and so on and it's interesting to note too that man has found it necessary to add to these natural divisions of what whitehead calls perpetual perishing of the of the continual flux of time he's found it necessary to supplement these natural divisions with artificial divisions of his own he has imposed the week upon the month he has imposed the he has imposed uh, church holidays national holidays and so on uh, anything in which to uh, to break up the the rather terrifying fact of this continual flux of time to make it seem in some way space like and to uh, to give it this uh, even in the process of living it to give it a certain artistic form well i i think it's it's clear that analogues of this uh, of these natural forms uh, of uh, time divisions have been taken over in the various uh, temporal arts i mean we see the the um uh, of the various types of rhythm within music the the, the curves uh, uh, broken curves or uh, curves of uh, circles of repetition going on within both music and poetry and the drama and narration and uh, there have been i would say quite definitely uh, borrowings of the fundamental forms of, uh, out of nature into art we, i mean we see this curious an interesting fact that the uh, we impose uh, our symbols upon nature but borrow the shape of them in many cases from uh, from nature we take something turn it into a symbol and uh, give it back to nature and a, a problem of course arises here in relation to certain types of, uh, of advanced modern art for example, I've mentioned the music of Boulez just now, and one wonders very much whether a music which um, has so completely transcended and got beyond the ordinary natural rhythms, the rhythms of the heartbeat, the rhythms of respiration and so on, whether such a music, however interesting it may be, can create, form the basis of a new style, whether we do not whether we are not compelled by the very nature of our being uh, to um, conform more than certainly some uh, very advanced forms of modern art do uh, to the, the natural rhythms within us. I, I would 
guess that the, these uh, experiments, which see, seem to betray an extraordinary kind of impatience, as though it were impossible to to spend so much time as is required in listening to the to a music in which the natural rhythms uh, occur, um, whether such a music so telescoped and so, so short, so reduced to a kind of shorthand, can form the basis of a, a flowering, developing musical style. I don't know. I have a, a strong feeling that it, it will be found to be almost impossible to, to keep this going as, a, uh, as the basis of a, of a new music. But I, of course, I may be entirely wrong. Now, uh, let us now pass. Uh, I'm afraid this, this lecture is rather incoherent because I have to talk about such an immense number of things. But I would like to talk very briefly about the creative act. What does the artist do when he prepares himself uh, to make a work of art? Well, I, I think in the most general terms, what he does is to concentrate his mind upon some piece of subject matter, and then open himself up uh, to whatever may come into his, what I have called in an earlier lecture, his positive subconscious, uh, in relation to this subject. I mean, th there will be the, the sort of conscious mind is pursuing a given theme, but the unconscious is providing all kinds of material. It may be associations out of his own la past life, it may be scraps of knowledge, historical knowledge, scientific knowledge, philosophic knowledge, which come in. It may be, in fact, anything which the, is stored up in this immense uh, magazine of the, uh, of the um, unconscious mind. And uh, the, uh, again, I think it's quite clear that the greatest artists have been extraordinarily fortunate in being able to tap an immense reservoir of such material and then to be able to organize it in uh, efficiently, uh, aesthetically satisfying forms. Uh, and the organizing process is, of course, the, well, what we vaguely call uh, the imagination. And I would like here to quote a very famous passage from Coleridge on the nature of the imagination, which I to this day remains one of the best uh, accounts of, of what this strange faculty in man is able to do. Uh, what he says is this, the imagination is the power which reveals itself in the balance or re reconcilement of opposite or discordant qualities, of sameness with difference, of the general with the concrete, of the idea with the image the sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects. Now, uh, made, uh, this, I think, is, uh, is a profound and extremely uh, uh, apposite description of this process of bringing together all this disparate and uh, mutually, mutually inconsequential material uh, and forming it into um, a, a single whole within the, the work of art. And of course, on the uh, s small scale, uh, this process of the imagination of bringing uh, these mutually relevant uh, factors together uh, into a single harmony is brilliantly illustrated in poetic metaphor. Uh, it's worth, I think, in this context, quoting a few vivid metaphors which bring together the most absurdly remote uh, uh, factors and form them into a single, powerfully uh, suggestive unit. Uh, for example, in a sleep that knits up the ravel sleeve of thought. Well, here you see you have a, you combine the idea of embroidery wool or, or silk with the idea of sleep and the, uh, and the workings of the troubled mind. Or you have the uh, metaphor like, uh, uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the Tempest, the strongest oaths are straw to the fire in the blood. Uh, the extremely powerful metaphor, or the, the, the other very bitter and, uh, and savage metaphor, 
describing the violence of desire, where he says, and those milk paps that through the window bars bore at men's eyes, the, this whole sense of the, uh, the breasts are like gimlets boring into the, uh, into the mind of the man filled with desire. And um, then let's hear, quote another one from, uh, from Gerald Manley Hopkins, we're talking about uh, human nature, and I mean, here he, the art of the baker is brought into a connection with the idea of sin and the soul, where he says, uh, self yeast of spirit, a dull dough sours, an extremely powerful metaphor. And, and then, of course, there's the famous metaphor in the Keats, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to quote this very extraordinary sonnet of George Herbert's uh, on prayer, which is a, a long catena of, of metaphors, a very, very strange poem. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to its birth, the soul in, in, uh, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, engine against the Almighty, sinner's tower, reversed thunder, Christ's side piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tune which all things hear and fear, softness and peace, and joy and love and bliss, exalted manner, gladness at the best, Heaven in ordinary, man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise, church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. Yeah. And when one reads a, a piece like this, I, one does realize the extraordinary power of the imagination, this bringing together of mutually irrelevant elements into a, a new and uh, and powerfully moving set of symbols. Well, of course, on the, uh, the this is, as I say, the working of imagination, the reconcilement of opposites and discordances on the smallest level. But of course, on the large level, we see the same thing. Uh, we we see. Um, any great work of art uh, is essentially the bringing together of many disparate elements and forming them into a harmonious whole. And here, I think, we can speak about something which to me is very significant, the idea of the hierarchy of perfections. Many works of art are perfect in their way, but there, I, I think it's true to say that there is a real hierarchy of perfections, that there are some perfections are greater and more significant than others. <clears throat> um, for example, the perfection of a, a haiku, a Japanese haiku, or a, a sonnet, or a Shakespeare song, is not the same, not the equivalent, I would say, as the perfection of a great drama, Full Fathom Five, is not on the same level, although it is perfect in its way, is a perfection inferior to the perfection, say, of, of uh, Hamlet or Macbeth. Uh, that uh, I think one can generalize here and say that uh, uh, those works of art are the greatest and most significant, which do harmonize uh, within uh, a single a harmonious system, the greatest number of significant factors in human living. That you can have a perfection which harmonizes very few factors, I mean, may harmonize only certain aesthetic factors, I mean, which you may have, for example, in perfection of a, of a sung bowl, which is a real perfection. But I would feel certainly that this perfection is not the equal of the perfection of the best Sung landscapes, which harmonize many more elements of our experience, elements of our awareness of the external world, and elements, too, of uh, an awareness of the inner world, for these are 
these great Song landscapes are, in a certain sense, among the greatest religious paintings of all times. They, they, they do express uh, the ki a kind of mystical aspect of the human mind in, a, in a, an extremely powerful way. And uh, in general, I, I think this is one of the bases of the distinction uh, between the what is traditionally known as the fine arts and the arts and crafts. That the there is, of course, an element of snobbery in this distinction. Uh, that the the craftsman was regarded as a person of inferior rank to the great painter. But there, there is also, I would think, a, a real <clears throat> A real a, a true evaluation here that I would think that the great uh, complex work of art, other things being equal, if it, if it has an equal degree of perfection, uh, is a greater work than the, than the perfect uh, song bowl or the perfect carpet or, or what not. Uh, and um, this, I ha hate to say so, uh, but uh, it seems to me that this distinction may apply even to a good deal of uh, of um, non-objective painting. Uh, uh, much of this, I, I do think, is very beautiful and uh, it achieves a kind of perfection, but it does seem to me a limited perfection compared with the perfection, for example, of the, of the great masterpieces of, uh, uh, of pictorial art. I mean, the the nativity of Piero, the Dos de Mayo of, uh, of Goya, and so on. I mean, these harmonized in a single, completely aesthetically satisfying whole, such an immensely much greater number of important aspects of human experience, both aesthetic on, and uh, uh, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual, that I would, without any hesitation, think that the, uh, these uh, works, however perfect they may be, are essentially minor works of art, and that the, the, the great perfections require a more comprehensive uh, taking in of experience. And incidentally, I think there's a great deal to be said for the fact that uh, if you do have elaborate uh, compositions illustrating, for example, a scene in the Bible or, or in Greek mythology, uh, you have opportunities of creating purely aesthetic values much greater than if you are confining yourself to purely non-objective uh, uh, elements. Uh, for example, I mean, <clears throat> take a picture which uh, I happen to like very much a picture by Botticelli called the um, um, Calumny of Apelles, a very, very odd picture indeed. One generally, if one looks at it, one doesn't know what on earth it's about. I actually took the trouble once to look it up in one of the dialogues of Lucian, where the subject matter of this picture is described. And I found that this picture of Botticelli is, among other things, an extremely good and accurate illustration of this story out of Lucian. Well, what, uh, the story is not of great importance, but it, it is very important aesthetically, inasmuch as the necessity of drawing, a, of painting a great many figures, one of whom is naked, the other are clothed, within an architectural background, called upon, made it necessary for Botticelli uh, to organize the purely aesthetic and formal and coloristic uh, elements in his picture, uh, it made it necessary for him to bring in an immense number of these elements and to organize them into an incredibly complicated uh, composition, which I don't think any uh, merely non-representational composition, however elaborate, could ever have approached. I mean, I don't think the, uh, the human mind is so constructed that it can produce anything quite as complex uh, aesthetically uh, or quite as satisfactory as the representation of uh, a complex uh, uh, scene in the outside world. Uh, now, uh, 
Very really briefly, let's talk about uh, different kinds of art. Obviously, what we have learned in recent times is to tolerate and to like very many different kinds of art. Uh, 200 years ago, everything was extremely simple because there was only one kind of art which any civilized person in the Western world could uh, admit to be art, and that was uh, Greco-Roman Renaissance art and its uh, successors. Well, now uh, everything else, of course, was condemned and thought to be ridiculous, uh, and that all other forms of art were regarded as merely as inept efforts to to realize the kind of perfection realized, uh, uh, created by the Greco-Roman and Renaissance artists. Well, now we, uh, uh, we have an immensely much greater knowledge than our parents had. We have photography, which is placed at our disposal, reproductions of, uh, of every kind of work of art. Uh, even in my own lifetime, it's incredible the, what has been opened up when I was a boy, there was no such thing as Sumerian art or as Minoan art. These things were quite unknown. Uh, the Mayan art was virtually unknown. Very little was known about the Incas. Nothing virtually was known about the Africans or the Polynesians. Now all this has entered into our knowledge, into our sphere of, of, uh, of understanding. And we realize quite clearly uh, that uh, all, all these methods of looking at the world are perfectly legitimate, and that there are means of achieving perfection within each of these methods. And I think this is, in one sense, an immense gain for us. In another sense, it poses great difficulties, because in the time when there was only one legitimate art, people were not distracted at all from it. I mean, they knew there was only one way of doing a thing, and they threw aside everything else. And consequently, they were able, for example, with the elements of uh, Greek or Roman architecture, to go on exploring the possibilities of the style from the late 15th century to the middle of the 19th. Uh, and it's incredible what a lot they got out of it, simply by concentrating on this one thing. Today, we know such an immense amount that it seems very difficult for, for any body to concentrate for as long uh, as was done in the past on any single one style. And perhaps this is a, a kind of disadvantage on, from which we suffer. We have what the French call uh, embarras de richesse. We, we are embarrassed by our own wealth. And uh, it may be that uh, in certain respects our more ignorant fathers were better off uh, than we are. But uh, uh, for the rest of us, I think, except for uh, practicing uh, examples, uh, except for practicing artists, I think we, we are all incomparably better off for this immensely wider range of knowledge which uh, is at our disposal. Uh, I would add to the, uh, to the discoveries within my own lifetime, uh, one of the great discoveries, of course, has been the discovery of Paleolithic art, the earliest one. Uh, discoveries were made before I was born, but sir, Many of the, the greatest discoveries have come out within the quite recent years. And, uh, and we realize that here again, even among these extraordinarily primitive people, there were perfections. I mean, anybody who's seen the cave paintings at Lascaux in south central France um, must have been overcome with the extraordinary power of these things. And uh, it also raises it the most interesting psychological problems. I mean, when we compare the, the nature of these extremely naturalistic paintings, which seem to have been based upon a capacity for eidetic imagery, when we compare these with the completely conceptualized paintings of Neolithic times, which in their own way are also extremely perfect, we realize what an immense uh, spectrum the world of art can can cover. I mean, it can cover, as I say, at one end, uh, the art based upon eidetic imagery, perhaps uh, uh, created by people in, with whom language hadn't been much developed yet. I mean, perhaps this was why they were able to, to think in such non-conceptual terms. Uh, the other, at the other end of the scale, we find the Neolithic art, which is so completely conceptualized that it looks as though Men were suddenly reveling in the discovery of language and were projecting onto his, uh, 
painted surfaces, the, these wonderful new verbal ideas, which he, he was able to use, in, uh, uh, which had given new sense to the world. But, uh, and it does show very clearly to what, over what an enormous uh, gamut this, um, uh, this um, extraordinary uh, activity of art can spread. <clears throat> Now, we finally come to the most difficult problem of all, the problem of music. Well, why on earth does uh, music uh, affect us as it does? This is a very mysterious thing, because the, uh, unlike the uh, literary or uh, plastic and pictorial arts, uh, the symbols, the sound symbols of music, they do not represent anything in the external world. They, they do not have a conventional meaning, such as words have. Uh, they don't. They are not onomatopoeic. They, they don't uh, correspond at all closely. I mean, the general rhythms may be analogous to the natural rhythms, but uh, they do. There is nothing which uh, makes music strictly comparable to to literature or to the pictorial and plastic arts. And nevertheless, I don't think anybody can doubt that uh, music has a profound meaning, but what that meaning is, is very difficult to say. It certainly isn't the meaning which is on the program notes. These, uh, I mean, to start with, every program annotator says something different. I mean, says this work was made by Beethoven's heart was breaking for somebody or other. The next one says that uh, this is a work of overpowering gaiety or something of the kind. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, this, uh, this meaning is there uh, and is of um, profound importance. It is worthwhile uh, in this context uh, to see, listen to what uh, great musicians have thought about what they were doing. What did Beethoven, for example, think that music was about? Um, Beethoven's writing is unsatisfactory. I mean, his power of expression was entirely within the realm of music. His letters, on the whole, I think, are rather disappointing as letters. And uh, he, he, his, uh, when he wanted to express it himself, he just had to write music. Consequently, what he has to say about music is, in a sense, rather banal. And yet, it, uh, I think it has very great importance. Like many other composers, he, he seems to think that, uh, that music has a cognitive aspect, that uh, through music, uh, that it was possible for man to come to a special kind of knowledge of the universe, something like the mystic's obscure knowledge, uh, knowledge of the totali totality of, of being. And what he says is this, Music is the sole incorporeal entrance into the higher scale of knowledge which comprehends mankind. It gives prophetic vision and heavenly wisdom. Well, this, of course, is, is, these are gay, as I say, rather banal and not very significant phrases. But I do think this whole idea of the cognitive value of music, and indeed of of all art is probably very important, that uh, in a certain sense, art, as I say, is something which imposes forms upon the uh, flux of reality, uh, gives it meaning, but in a certain sense it is also discovering, not merely forms, but discovering uh, that which, so to say, lies behind the forms. That There, there is a sense, I think, in which uh, and this, after all, is uh, profoundly important in the ideas of Plato, that the, in beauty we do discover something about the nature of the world, that this in some way or other, in an entirely ineffable and inexplicable way, uh, beauty is built into the fundamental nature of things, and that art is uh, a method of discovering this. And music, above all, with its strange capacity for discovering a sort of 
pure incorporeal dynamic essence of, uh, of life does perhaps give the provide the most um, powerful weapon for exploring this uh, the one aspect at least of the ultimate nature of the world and I would like to to finish with this idea it is a I'm afraid extremely vague because I don't understand it myself but I do feel very strongly that this Beethoven's idea of the cognitive value of music and indeed of art in general is a, a, a real thing and that uh, as I say that we do not uh, merely impose forms upon the world we discover them within the world and we also discover that which lies beyond form and that which is the ultimate uh, source of all form which uh, as so to say the creative principle uh, at the upstream from all particular manifestations thank you You've heard the fifth recorded lecture in a series delivered by Aldous Huxley at Kresge Auditorium while he was Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities at MIT. Next week, the sixth lecture entitled Visionary Experience. The program was produced by WGBH-FM Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters. This is the NAEB Radio Network. The NAEB Radio Network presents the sixth lecture in the series, What a Piece of Work is a Man, delivered by Aldous Huxley at Kresge Auditorium, MIT. Mr. Huxley is introduced by Howard R. Bartlett, Professor of Humanities, MIT. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we welcome you to the sixth in the series of lectures by our distinguished guest on the general topic of what a piece of work is man. Tonight, Mr. Huxley speaks to us of a world of experience from which I assume most of us have been excluded by many obstacles. Nevertheless, it is a world fascinating to contemplate. It is a world from which extraordinary, if unpredictable, results may come, since it now seems likely that man may soon be able to enter this world, if he chooses, without serious effects to body or mind. It is the world or visionary experience. Mr. Huxley. And that was a visionary experience. Uh, I want to begin this talk with one of those questions which <clears throat> uh, inquisitive children ask their parents and stump them completely. So a question like, why is grass green? But this is a question uh, about precious stones. Why are precious stones precious? And obviously it's extremely difficult to find any rational reason for this. It's uh, certainly no economic reason no biological reason why people should have spent an immense amount of time, energy, and money uh, on collecting and cutting and setting colored pebbles. And there must be uh, some fun, much deeper psychological reason for this strange behavior. Now, this question was asked many years ago by Santa Yana, who came up with what seems to me a partial explanation, but I don't think it's a complete or the final explanation. He said in, that in his opinion, precious stones were precious because they seemed to men 
to be the nearest approach in this world of perpetual perishing, of, uh, of passing away, they seem to be the nearest approach to the permanent and the eternal. A precious stone does appear to remain exactly as it is generation after generation, and Santa Anna assumed that uh, it was because this was the nearest approach in our world uh, to something that was intrinsically eternal that the precious stone took on its precious quality. Well, I think there is something in this explanation, but I don't think it's by any means the complete story. I think there are other compelling psychological reasons why uh, we value precious stones as we do. And um, I'm going to quote a passage from Plato, which I think throws a lot of light on this subject. It comes from the uh, Phaedon, the dialogue, and it um, is here... Uh, Socrates is talking about the ideal world, which he, he, call, which he says is more beautiful and real than the actual world in which we live. And he says, in this other earth, the colors are much purer and more brilliant than they are down here. The very mountains and stones have a richer gloss and lovelier transparency and intensity uh, of hue. The precious stones of this lower world are highly prized cornelians, jaspers, emeralds, and all the rest, are but the tiny fragments of these uh, stones above. In the other world there is no stone but is precious, and exceeds in beauty every gem of ours. And he goes on to say, the vision of this world is a vision of blessed beholders. But this is, a, a, seems to me, a very interesting passage, in as it, much as it makes perfectly clear that the ideal world of Plato is not a mere metaphysical construction, a kind of inference from uh, the facts of the, the, uh, our present world and its imperfection, uh, it is a, vis a visible world, a world which can be seen with the inner eye and which has certain uh, describable peculiarities, such as the colors being much brighter and the it being filled with stones, which are very like our precious stones. And I find here probably what is the basic psychological reason for our immensely high valuation of precious stones, which is this, that these are the objects in the natural world which most nearly resemble things which are seen with the inner eye by visionary people who have the gift of vision, and which even those who do not consciously have the gift of vision have some kind of unconscious inkling of. It seems to, as it were, remind them of something going on in the back of their minds, which on a subterranean level they know something about. And we get a certain confirmation of this by the greatest of the Neoplatonic philosophers, Plotinus, uh, who says <clears throat> that everything in the intelligible world, the, the, which is much the same as the uh, ideal world of Plato, everything there shines. And he says that for this reason, the most beautiful thing in this world is fire, which is precisely, he, this is a transference, uh, as we see, from the inner facts of the visionary world into the outer fact. This is a, a transference of value from something which is highly esteemed in the inner world into the outer world. And the, what he says, the most beautiful thing in this world is fire. And it's interesting to find, for example, in Ezekiel's description of uh, the Garden of Eden, he speaks of it being filled with gems, filled with what he calls stones of fire. Uh, and uh, uh, as I hope to, to show later on, uh, this um, uh, richness of uh, gem-like uh, qualities, which is, is found in the visionary world, uh, does explain many very strange uh, facts about uh, certain types of art, and many facts about the curious uniform quality of uh, 
religious traditions, folklore traditions, traditions of the nature of the golden age and the afterlife, which are found all over the world. We will talk about that later. Meanwhile, let us speak about the accessibility of this visionary world. Well, we look at the records and we look around and we find that a certain number of people can enter this visionary world spontaneously, that they can go back and forth between the two worlds without any real difficulty, and that probably quite a lot of children inhabit the visionary world for quite a bit of the time. And um, also we find uh, that this visionary world is very highly prized by people and that they, they will go out of their way uh, to get into it, that if they do not visit it spontaneously, they do a great many things which help them to go into it artificially. The visionary experience is so highly prized that uh, throughout the ages of recorded history, uh, people have done their best to induce visions. They've tried to go to this other world by various artificial vehicles. And there are a number of ways which have been worked out for going into the, uh, into the other world. Uh, there are psychological ways, uh, there are um, physiological ways, there are chemical ways. And um, it's worth, I think, uh, just uh, describing a few of these methods. Uh, for example, uh, it is possible to uh, go into the other world uh, through hypnosis. I mean, it's uh, quite a number of, um, of people uh, can, in a certain stage, a rather deep stage of hypnosis, can and do enter some kind of visionary world. It's a very interesting experience if one has ever watched people suddenly passing out of uh, what seems to be a kind of sleep-like stage into a, a world where they are seeing very clearly, very strange and interesting things. They, I, I think this hypnotic visionary world is probably not quite so brilliant and extraordinary as some of the other visionary worlds, uh, the, the other aspects of the visionary world which can be touched in other ways. And then, of course, there are the <clears throat> methods of, uh, of purely psychological methods. Uh, there are the methods of intensive concentration, which we find in the uh, various yogas of the East and uh, in the so-called uh, spiritual practices of the, of the West, uh, which do undoubtedly produce these um, uh, visionary states. Then there is the method which has been employed in many, many parts of the world, the method of complete isolation, the limiting, uh, the cutting down of sensory experiences to the to the greatest possible extent. And now this is a very interesting thing. Within the last few years, a number of experiments have been made in modern uh, psychological and medical laboratories with what is called limited environment. That, uh, for example, people like Hebb at uh, McGill and Dr. Lilly at the National Institute of Health in Washington have. Uh, employed various means for cutting down the input of sensory stimuli to the extreme limit. Uh, Lily, for example, uh, cut down the input of external stimuli to such a point that he, there was nothing um, practically that uh, was affecting him from without. He immersed himself completely in a bath of warm water at a temperature of 94, breathed through a schnorkel so that his face was completely covered, therefore no part of his skin was feeling anything except a uniform temperature. Uh, he was uh, sh shut himself, uh, he tied himself up in a harness which didn't permit him to move more than a tenth of an inch. He was in a light-proof and sound-proof room. But the interesting fact is that within four hours, he and the, those colleagues of his who submitted to this extremely drastic treatment we're seeing very, very strange visions. Uh, and in uh, uh, where the 
the deprivation of external stimuli is not quite so complete as it was in Hebb's experiments, uh, similar visions will be seen within 24 to 36 hours. And now one of the interesting facts here is that the great majority of these visions were extremely unpleasant. Uh, they were so unpleasant that I, uh, I've asked Dr. Lilly what they were, and he has always declined to tell me. I don't know what the, the, they must have been very unpleasant indeed. But uh, now this is extremely interesting in view of the historical facts. We find both in the East and the West a long tradition of isolation that hermits and would-be visionaries have retired to the most desolate places where they could cut off an enormous amount of external stimuli. In the 4th century in the Thebaid in Egypt, immense numbers of hermits and cenobites uh, lived in the desert, uh, cutting themselves off as far as possible from uh, external stimuli. And we see the same thing with the uh, Tibetan lamas and the Hindu monks uh, in caves and in, um, in remote places in the Himalayas. And they did it all for the same reason. And again, what, uh, uh, what is very interesting is that we find from the records that a great many of these monks of the Thebaid had visions and had extremely painful and disagreeable visions. In virtually every picture gallery of the world, you will see paintings of the temptations of St. Anthony, which are diabolic visions which have thronged in upon the saint. He did have a certain number of beatific visions, but he had also a great many of these very unpleasant visions. And it's interesting to find the historical <coughs> records confirming everything that has been found in recent years by laboratory work. Well, then, over and above uh, these psychological methods, there are a number of uh, physiological methods of inducing visions by changing body chemistry. Because this is one of the strange facts, is that the by inducing certain changes in body chemistry, we do appear to open the door, so to say, which separates our ordinary everyday selves from this remote visionary area of the mind. One of the ways, uh, the physiological methods, is of course the method practiced in the Orient, the method of, of breathing exercises. Well, all breathing exercises uh, culminate in in one thing, which is prolonged suspensions of breath, which may last for a minute, several minutes even. But when there are such prolonged suspensions of breath, there is naturally a, an increase of carbon dioxide in the blood. And it is now well known that uh, a, an increase of carbon dioxide, either induced in this way or else uh, in, by in, brought to the blood by inhalation, does produce very strange visionary psychological experiences. So that we see again here that these uh, time-honored yogic methods uh, are, have been again confirmed by recent laboratory work showing that if you do something which, height, which uh, increases the CO2 in the blood, you do automatically may, give, you, give, access, give yourself access to this visionary world. Then again, the, there's the question of fasting. Here, in, in many uh, cultural traditions, uh, fasting has been used precisely for the purpose of creating uh, a visionary experience. The, the red man in this country, then in many Indian tribes, uh, habitually and systematically resorted to fasting for the express purpose of achieving visionary experience. It was one of the initiation rites of young men in many of the of the Indian tribes. And of course, fasting has been used uh, to a very considerable extent in all the major religions. Uh, similarly, uh, lack of sleep, cutting down on sleep, will also produce uh, effects of, the, uh, of this same kind. And even some of the more violent physical austerities, such as self-flagellation, also, I think, produce certain chemical changes which facilitate the coming of visions. The, um, I mean, for example, a, a violent uh, 
self-flagellation will release great quantities of histamine, great quantities of adrenaline, both of which may have profound psychological effects. So that we see that uh, uh, when we look back on the uh, history of religious practices and the desire for visions, which has existed, I think, in, in all um, cultures, we see that these curious ways of facilitating the visionary experience have been employed, and we now know the reasons, uh, in as far as they are uh, biochemical, we know the reasons why uh, these practices were adopted. Um, then, of course, uh, beyond these methods of inducing visionary experiences, there are the directly chemical methods. And here again, where there is an enormous history uh, on this in this field. Anybody who wishes to know the detailed story of it, uh, I recommend to read uh, a, a very interesting book by the French uh, anthropologist Philippe de Felis called Poison Sacré, Sacred Poisons, uh, which is an account of all the uh, bio the pure, purely chemical methods used in both civilized and primitive cultural traditions for the purpose of getting people into the uh, religious, uh, into the visionary state. And every kind of substance has been used for this purpose. And the interesting fact is that in the past, the majority of these substances these mind-changing, vision-inducing substances have been dangerous. Uh, opium, of course, is a dangerous substance. Even dear old alcohol is a dangerous substance when used uh, to the extent which uh, it has been in the various religious traditions. Uh, coca is a dangerous substance. Hashish is a fairly dangerous substance. And many of them uh, have certainly uh, been effective in producing a visionary experience, but have been effective at very considerable cost uh, to the physiology. Uh, that we, people have paid a great price. I mean, even the the uh, traditional Hindu drug, the drug soma, which is described in the Vedas, uh, this produced certain visionary effects without any doubt. But uh, it was so poisonous that even the great god Indra felt extremely ill after taking too much uh, soma, and uh, that ordinary mortals could actually die of it. Well, uh, uh, as was said just now in the introduction, this really startling fact about recent pharmacological uh, developments is that a number of chemical substances have been produced, uh, discovered in recent years, which permit the opening of the door into the uh, visionary world uh, without inflicting serious damage upon the body. Uh, enormous changes in consciousness can be brought about without hurting uh, the body. And this is an extraordinary effect. Uh, some of these substances are, are related to substances existing in nature. For example, the mescaline is, is the active principle now synthesized in the Indian peyote. And incidentally, peyote is one of the few traditional mind-changing drugs which uh, has been taken for many centuries by the Indians and whose use is spreading now throughout the Western United States, right up into Canada. Uh, it has been taken without uh, uh, producing addiction, without uh, causing degeneration among the, those who take it. And uh, beyond the, the, the synthetic mescaline, there are various others, the, the um, lysergic acid, uh, the, um, the most recent of them being the active principle of the sacred Mexican mushroom, uh, which was, uh, last year was synthesized by Hoffman in Basel in Switzerland, uh, and which incidentally I heard from uh, my friend uh, Professor Roger Heim of Paris, the mycologist, uh, he, he told me that uh, he had recently returned from Mexico and had gone down to visit his, an old witch doctoress friend there, bringing her a number of the pills which Hoffman had synthesized 
and had given it, uh, given her some of these pills, which she'd taken and was quite delighted because they, they produced exactly the same effect as the mushrooms, and she was more especially delighted but that now she could practice her magic at every season of the year instead of having to wait for the mushroom season. Mm -hmm. So that this is one of the great triumphs of modern science, that the a witch doctor in Mexico will be able to send a postcard to Dr. Hoffman in Basel saying, have important magic to do, please send 100 capsules for their mail. Uh, these uh, uh, this is, these are some of the uh, of the chemical ways of um, of opening up uh, the, the this door which leads into the into the other part of of the mind. Uh, experiments, of course, have been made by eminent psychologists for a long time. William James, for example, made considerable experiments with the nitrous oxide, and uh, incidentally, was much blamed by some of his. Uh, colleagues for such a frivolous undertaking and for taking it so seriously and was defended by Bergson in his uh, Two Sources of Religion and Ethics where he said we must remember that the nitrous oxide was not the cause of Professor James's e remarkable experiences, it was the occasion that uh, it removed certain obstacles which permitted this other material to come through. The obstacles could have been removed by purely psychological means or by other psychophysical means, but this uh, this particular means did to open the door, and the nature of the experience which came through is not affected by the nature of the key which is used to open the door. And uh, this is a very interesting passage in Bergson, and I think it, it's fundamentally true that uh, although there seems to be something rather discreditable and unfair, so to say, about the possibility of opening the door by a means so simple as, as psilocybin or uh, LSD-25, uh, yet uh, there seems to be no reason to doubt that what comes through is of the same nature as what comes through by a breathing exercises or fasting or any other means. Now, let us uh, briefly talk about the nature of the, of the experience. Now, of course, every visionary experience is unique, as every human being is unique, but uh, th these things do not occur at random. They, um, although they are unique, and although there are considerable variations, yet we do recognize in the majority of these experiences a kind of family likeness. There are the, they belong to a certain class. And we realize this very well if we read such a book as uh, Heinrich Klüver's book, monograph on peyote, Beringer's book on peyote, uh, a whole mass of, uh, of uh, religious literature on visions and so forth, we see that there is a kind of common, uh, a, a kind of resemblance running through this whole family of experiences. And, I think we can say that the highest common factor in all these experiences is the experience of light. Now, the light experience uh, is of several kinds. There is the experience, which is recorded in a great deal of the literature, of what may be called undifferentiated light, just a, an enormous burst of light unembodied in any particular form, just a great flood of light. And in general, I think it would be true to say that this experience of the undifferentiated light is generally associated with what may be called the a full-blown theophany or, or a full-blown mystical experience. And the, the mystical experience, I think we can very briefly define it as, as uh, that experience which uh, transcends the subject-object relationship, which produces a sense of solidarity between the experiencer and the universe, which uh, gives the, the experiencer a sense of the basic all-rightness of the universe, uh, an understanding of such a phrase as occurs in the book of Job, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. This is, a, it seems to me, a characteristic feature 
uh, of the mystical experience. And um, uh, this kind of experience and the, uh, the experience of the same order when associated and interpreted in terms of a, uh, of a theological uh, uh, frame of reference, when the experience is interpreted in Christian terms as the unitive knowledge of God, this kind of experience is, as a matter of uh, fact, uh, generally associated with this experience of undifferentiated light. And, of course, this kind of, um, uh, of uh, light experience is recorded again and again in the, in the literature. The, the, there's the most familiar case is the case of St. Paul on the road to Damascus. We find uh, uh, Muhammad's call to being a prophet uh, came when he woke up in the middle of the night uh, perceiving a light so intense that it caused him to swoon away. Plotinus entered several times into the light and was, as he says, swallowed up in divinity. Uh, we find uh, Dante describing uh, paradise as, as being... Uh, illumined as though by two suns. I mean, there is the ordinary sun, and then there is this other light, which is like a, the light of a much more powerful sun uh, coming through the ordinary sunlight. Then in more, more recent times, we find the tremendous uh, light experience of St. John of the Cross when he was confined by his brethren to prison in Toledo. And um, uh, Jacob Burma records uh, light experiences of this same kind. And one could find, I think, without any difficulty, hundreds, literally hundreds, of such uh, uh, experiences recorded by eminent or less eminent mystics. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, these, this kind of experience is by no means confined to the eminent people who have a great power of expression. As uh, such uh, collectors of, of, uh, of um, experiences, as uh, Dr. Rainer Johnson in his recent book, The Watcher from the Hills, uh, as he has shown, a great many perfectly ordinary people who don't have this, uh, this gift of expression and who have achieved no celebrity as uh, religious leaders, do, in fact, have these experiences of exactly the same kind. I was interested, not more than a week or so ago, I received a letter from an unknown correspondent in England. Uh, she, she described herself as a woman in her 60s, and she was uh, saying, my whole life has been influenced by something that happened to me when I was 16, I was a schoolgirl of 16, I was in the kitchen, I was cutting a slice of bread off a loaf, to toast for tea, and uh, suddenly I became aware of this tremendous light all around me with a sense of the of extraordinary happiness and bliss and a sense of the complete all-rightness of the universe. I was absolutely overpowered by this. It was a dark November afternoon. The whole place was flooded with this light. Uh, the, the experience lasted in clock time perhaps for a minute, then it uh, went away, but it has remained, the memory of it has remained with me ever since and sustained my life ever since, and uh, it has completely abolished any fear of death that I may ever have had. Uh, I adore life, but I am not in any way afraid of death. Well, the, again, these sort of experiences, as one can find uh, set forth in Rainer Johnson's book, are really quite common, I think. A great many people have had uh, these kind of experiences of the undifferentiated light, which, as I say, is associated with something in the nature of the full-blown mystical experience. And here it is quite interesting to go into another um, cultural tradition and to find that in the Buddhist tradition, what is called the clear light of the void, this sort of tremendous uncolored light, is uh, again associated with the ultimate uh, liberation experience, and that the other lesser lights 
particularly the lights which are embodied in forms, are associated with the lower so-called pre-mystical visionary experiences. Well, uh, let us now come down to these, what is strictly the visionary experience, which is the experience of light in its, un, uh, its differentiated form, in its, um, when it is embodied in shapes and in, in personages, in, uh, in landscapes and so on. And here again we find, curiously enough, a certain uniformity. We, we find uh, likenesses running through uh, the various descriptions of this. Uh, for example, they, the experience will very often begin with a, a, a vision of what may be called living geometries, geometrical forms, brilliantly lighted, continuously changing. These may modulate into uh, some kind of geomet geometrical objects, such as, as carpets, as uh, mosaics, and so on. There may then be tremendous visions of landscapes of an extraordinarily brilliant and glowing nature, of architectures often uh, very frequently, it's constantly recorded, which are encrusted with gems. And the landscapes too uh, are frequently recorded as encrusted with gems, which again throws a light on what Plato was saying in the, his dialogue and, and what... Um, uh, and the reason for the uh, why uh, for our high estimation of precious stones, because we we see these things in our visionary experience, and even if we don't know about them consciously, they in some way remind some area of our mind of this strange world, which uh, I think exists in in every mind, although often deeply buried. And then there are sometimes. Uh, uh, visions of figures, strange figures, uh, faces. And here there's a very interesting fact which is recorded again and again both in the spontaneous cases and in the induced cases that when faces are seen they are never the faces of people that the uh, uh, experiencer knows. He does not see the face of his mother, his father, his brothers, his friends. These are entirely new faces, and this, I think, casts a great deal of light on the, this whole uh, uh, conception of angelic figures. I mean, it's in, of course, it's entirely incorrect to suppose that the angels are the spirits of the departed. They are of another species altogether. And this is a very interesting fact that at the sort of antipodes of our mind, in this remote area of our mind, it is so far beyond the personal unconscious that we don't see anything connected with our own private life or even with the, the general life of mankind. We see something quite different. We see these creatures, uh, and uh, when Blake saw these uh, figures, he, he said these are the cherubim and seraphim, and he knew all about them. They were very large. He said the seraphim were 120 feet high, and... Um, they live in these extraordinary landscapes, and he described the landscapes. He says the, the the landscapes and the architectures in which they live are highly organized. They are articulated beyond anything which the mortal and perishing sight could possibly imagine. That they, they were, in some sense, super real. They were more real uh, than ordinary reality. And Blake frequently. I mean, he saw these things all his life, except for a period in the middle life when, for some reason, visions didn't come to him. But this was a, a regular type of experience for him, and he was constantly seeing these faces, which were not faces of anybody he knew, but they, they were these uh, strange figures which go from somewhere else. And the figures, another curious fact about these figures, is that they were never doing anything. Uh, this is one of the things which uh, recurs again and again in the descriptions, that these figures, when seen, are not in action. They sort of uh, are doing nothing in particular. And this again corresponds very closely to the conception of, the, uh, of these angelic uh, entities in the, the other world who are not engaged in action. They are engaged in the 
beatific vision in contemplation. And I think this is one of the reasons why the most powerful and moving religious art is always static art. The great religious symbols like the Khmer Buddhas, like the great uh, Egyptian gods, like the um, primitive Greek statues, uh, they, they are static. They are not doing anything. The great uh, Pantocrateras and, uh, and uh, Madonnas of Byzantine art, they are also completely static, not doing things. And this is precisely the, uh, the, the nature of these beings who are found uh, in, the, uh, in the other world, the world of visions. Uh, now, let me very briefly uh, go into another very interesting fact about the visionary experience, that the visionary experience by no means occurs by no means only behind the closed eyelids. In very many cases, the visionary quality, the quality of the vision, so to say, spills over into the external world so that the experiencer, when he opens his eyes, sees the outer world transfigured, sees it as incomparably more beautiful than he sees it at ordinary time, sees it as glowing with an intensity of light uh, and significance and life, which is uh, something which he do simply does not see at all in his ordinary state. Now, uh, there are plenty, I think, plenty of poets and artists who have spontaneously seen the world in this way. You will find, for example, admirable descriptions uh, of the nature of this transfigured vision of the world in uh, some of the writings of the Irish poet A.E., George Russell, uh, which I recommend very much. These are very subtle and uh, psychologically penetrating descriptions of the kind of things that the visionary sees in the external world. And uh, I think it would be true to say that uh, quite a lot of children probably see the world in this transfigured way. They see it very much, I think, as Wordsworth describes himself as seeing it as a child, describes it in the, in the great ode on the intimations of immortality in childhood. Uh, he, the, he's, as Wordsworth said, he, he looks at the outside world and it has the glory and the freshness of a dream. And he goes on to say that as he grew up, the, the, the dream, this, this glory faded into the light of common day. And uh, this I know, where'er I go, that there has passed a glory from the earth. Yeah. And that it, it, uh, the world became, so to say, very boring once again. And uh, there's a particularly beautiful passage in one of the centuries of meditation of Traherne, a, a book which I'm very glad to say is is being at this moment reprinted. I just have received a copy of a new edition of it. And uh, I would like to, to quote this passage of Traherne's, which describes his experience as a child. He was brought up uh, in Shrewsbury, I think it was, in a small town which had walls around it at that time. And he describes what, what it was like uh, looking out from his home uh, into the world around him. He says, the dust and stones of the street were as precious as gold. The green trees, when I saw them first through one of the city gates, transported and ravished me. Their sweetness and unusual beauty made my heart to leap and almost mad with ecstasy. They were such strange and wonderful things. The men, oh, what reverent and venerable creatures did the aged seem, immortal cherubim, and the young men, glittering and sparkling angels, and maids, strange seraphic pieces of life and beauty, boys and girls tumbling in the street and playing were like moving jewels. Eternity was manifested in the light of the day, and something infinite behind everything appeared. And then, with much ado, I was corrupted and made to learn the dirty devices of the world, which now I unlearn, and become as a little child again, that I may enter into the kingdom of God. And he goes on to say that the kingdom of God is already here, if we would only allow ourselves to see it. He says, the world is a mirror of infinite beauty, yet no man sees it. 
It is a temple of majesty, yet no man regards it. It is a region of light and peace, but did not men disquiet it. It is the paradise of God. It is the place of angels and the gate of heaven. Well, this was... Uh, Traherne, I think, describes a, a state of mind which uh, is relatively common. I, I mean, I think there are many more people who have this, have had in childhood and even have occasionally in their adult life glimpses of this uh, transfigured world, who realize that the, the world is incomparably more beautiful and more interesting than they normally give it any credit for. And uh, uh, then uh, you will find a number of these uh, uh, references to this kind of visionary experience of the external world in Wordsworth. I mean, he talks, it's a very beautiful poem where he speaks of the effect of, of sunset, how this sort of added extra transfiguring power evokes this, uh, this sense of, uh, of visionary otherness. Um, this, uh, this poem goes, No sound is uttered, but a deep and solemn harmony pervades the hollow vale from steep to steep and penetrates the glades. Far distant images draw nigh, called forth by wondrous potency of beamy radiance that in, imbues whate'er it strikes with gem-like hues. In vision exquisitely clear, herds range along the mountain side, and glittering antlers are descried, and gilded flocks appear. Thine is the tranquil hour, purpureal eve. But long as godlike wish or hope divine informs my spirit, ne'er can I believe that this magnificence is wholly thine. From worlds not quickened by the sun, a portion of the gift is won. An intermingling of heaven's pomp is spread on grounds that English shepherds tread. Uh, then <clears throat> let's go very briefly now into the uh, question of the relationship of these kinds of visionary experience with art and with a traditional religion. In the sphere of art, uh, I think it would be true to say that whereas by no means all art is of a visionary nature, there are quite important aspects of art which uh, have a visionary quality in which owe their power precisely to this reminder of the, the visionary, the reminder which they bring to the beholder of the visionary world. Uh, it is very significant, for example, that the, the Holy of Holies in almost every religion, the furniture of the altar, is always composed of what may be called vision-inducing materials. It is composed of gems, it is composed of glittering metals, of polished marble, and so forth. And uh, there is evidently something in this, in works of art made of these vision-inducing materials, which, uh, which is itself vision inducing um, and then another um, let me go over this very briefly because we haven't got very much time but uh, another essentially vision, vision inducing art which played a great part at one time uh, in our own civilization is the art of the stained glass window now anybody who's been into the saint chapelle in paris or into chartres cathedral uh, must realize the extraordinary visionary power which uh, uh, these windows have. It is possible by means of stained glass windows to turn the whole of a vast building into one single jewel. One is inside a great jewel. And the effect is, I think, most extraordinary. And it's a very significant fact. It's recorded uh, by the abbot of Saint-Denis, Suget, uh, that uh, in the 12th and early 13th century, there were always two collecting boxes in the churches, one for the poor and one for the setting up of stained glass windows. And whereas the boxes for the poor were often empty, the boxes for the stained glass windows were generally full, showing what an, ex an enormous, uh, how, how highly these, uh, uh, these vision-inducing uh, 
uh, the objects of the stained glass windows, how highly they were prized. Uh, I can't go into the, uh, the the many of the other types of visionary art, but there are quite a number of them, and uh, it's not difficult to uh, to sort them out from the ordinary run of art. Uh, they have a, a peculiar quality, and I think they owe uh, their great power uh, to uh, this uh, capacity which they have for evoking within us a kind of memory, a kind of awareness of that which lies at the back of our minds, and which uh, we then see realized in front of us in the external world. Uh, then. <clears throat> Now let us go again uh, to another curious uh, feature in art. Uh, a, 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 curious, a very interesting and curious fact is that many of the popular arts have been essentially visionary arts. That the, it's as though the, the, the ordinary unlettered people had a peculiar predilection for the visionary experience as manifested in art. I mean, take some of the, the most uh, ordinary and everyday of, uh, of popular arts. Take, for example, the art of fireworks. Well, this goes back to a very long way in China, and it goes back into the later Roman Empire. There are descriptions in the poetry of Claudian of the most fantastic firework displays, which are at least as, as elaborate as any display we see today. But of course they were not as good as the displays today because the, there was not the, at that time, the knowledge of chemistry which we now have, which permits us to uh, put into our fireworks an immense range of colors, which was undoubtedly quite impossible for the Romans to, to duplicate. Well then another popular art which uh, has played a great part throughout history is the art of pageantry. And this has been used, of course, by kings and prelates from time immemorial to impress people. I mean, the, this is a visionary art, and it, has the, uh, the, it impresses the beholders to such an extent that uh, it has been regularly used by men in authority to transform de facto power into de jure power. I mean, the, uh, they are, in fact, powerful. But the, the, the whole art of pageantry, the, coronations of kings, the processions, the state entries, um, processions of popes and so on. All these things are methods for persuading people by this kind of visionary magic that the brute fact of power is in some way uh, power by right divine. And it's just, I think there's no question that this, the whole history of, of pageantry it has played it has played an enormous part in the uh, consolidation of power and of course in our own day we have seen the extraordinary power exercised by the pageantry devised by the nazis i never saw the nuremberg rally each year but those who saw it say that this was possibly the most extraordinary uh, ballet ever put on any stage by anybody that this was one of the most magnificent uh, pure spectacles. And closely related to pageantry and ritual, of course, uh, is a theatrical spectacle. I mean, the theatrical performances are of two kinds. There's the, the drama, and then there is spectacle. And very often, I, I regret to say, in uh, contemporary productions of, of old plays, of Shakespeare, for example, the spectacle is often made to interfere with the drama, but both have their legitimate place. And it is, if you look at the history of it, it's very interesting to see uh, what enormous time and trouble and money has been used, has been expended on spectacles. The Elizabethan and Jacobean masks, for example, were fantastically elaborate. And there's a record of one mask put on for Charles I by the Inns of Court, which cost over £20,000. Uh, of money of, of of the 17th century, which must be multiplied by at least 10 now, for a single night's entertainment. So that we see the, again here, this is an extraordinary fact that quite senselessly people will spend this 
go to this immense trouble, spend this immense amount of money for this curious kind of experience, which uh, incidentally the adjective which is often applied to it is very significant here, it is called a transporting experience. It transports you, takes you out of this world, puts you into the other world. And of course the, the whole art of spectacle has developed with the advancing technology. The, the spectacles of the 16th and 17th century were limited by candles, so this was the brightest light you could possibly put on anything. Uh, and it was not till, it was not even till the middle of the 18th century that you could have an oil lamp which uh, would burn without smoking and stinking. Uh, the the argand wick and the and the um, uh, glass chimney are quite late inventions. But then, by the beginning, the very end of the century, in the beginning of the of the 19th, we begin to get tremendous uh, technological advances which permit. Uh, enormous increases of uh, of um, uh, visionary spectacle. We get the invention of the parabolic mirror, first used in lighthouses, then very quickly used in theatres for projecting beams. We get gas at about 1800. We get limelight about 1820. And then by the 1880s, we get uh, electricity and the possibility of creating prodigious effects of light which uh, to this day uh, fascinate people. I mean, after all, the successes of the, of, uh, of the modern musical are entirely successes due to the strange visionary quality of, the, of um, these performances. And another very significant name, uh, which was, is the instrument which was invented in the 17th century by Athanasius Kircher, the magic lantern. This device for projecting colored images in a dark room upon a white screen received this name instantly. I mean, it was given this name, it has carried it ever since. It was felt to be an absolutely appropriate name, that it was something magical, something out of another world, which was uh, thrown uh, uh, into this world. Now, let us still more briefly just br discuss the relevance of these facts of visionary experience uh, to the literature of uh, religion and folklore. In all the uh, religious traditions, the paradises and other worlds have precisely the qualities which are given in the descriptions of, uh, by, of the visionaries. The paradise is a garden, it is gem-like, it's full of the stones of fire, as Ezekiel says. Uh, it is um, uh, where there are buildings, there are buildings made of precious stones, as in the New Jerusalem, and is in all the Buddhist and Hindu and Japanese paradises. Again and again you will find these descriptions, which correspond exactly to the descriptions given by Weir Mitchell and Havelock Ellis of the, of the peyote experience or given in the various accounts of visionaries of their spontaneous experiences. So I think there is no doubt at all that the, the, all this kind of folkloric and popular religious tradition stems directly from this, uh, this strange visionary experience, which plays, uh, has played a very important part, I think, in the creation of the uh, these ideas of the other world. And another quite interesting fact is where precious stones uh, are not common, but where glass is known, glass becomes an extremely important visionary uh, adjunct. I mean, even in the New Jerusalem, where the walls are actually made of precious stones, glass plays a very important part. There is a sea of glass in the center. The streets are made of gold as of gla as glass, uh, transparent gold, glass-like gold. In the Celtic traditions, the islands of the dead, where the dead go, is called Inisvetrin, the island of glass. In the Teutonic tradition, the dead go to a place called Glassberg, the glass mountain. And uh, again, these curious uh, uh, uniformities keep running, cropping up, in all the various literatures, and to my mind there can be no doubt at all that uh, all this can be fitted into this same picture which we 
so found at the beginning of this lecture uh, in the description of Plato of the ideal world, that this is part of the natural history of the mind, that uh, we have these kind of experiences, that even those of us who don't have them normally and only catch perhaps occasional glimpses or perhaps never have glimpses of them, yet have some kind of, uh, of obscure knowledge of them at the back of our minds, so that when we read about these things or see them represented in works of art, they do strike a chord and evoke something. Uh, so that we see, there's, it's, a, it's a very strange thought, I think, that we see a continuous spectrum uh, running all the way from such popular arts as fireworks and pageantry and theatrical spectacle, right through uh, religious, uh, popular religion, right through the, the visionary experience of those having what are now called pre-mystical states, right through to the undifferentiated light, which uh, has, as a matter of historical and psychological facts, always been associated with the full-blown mystical state. So that, as I say, the, there is this full, complete spectrum, this gamut of, um, of experience from the simplest and, uh, and uh, what's seemingly the most childish to the extreme limit of, uh, the, of the religious experience. And uh, I, for one, find this, this fact profoundly interesting. It seems to me one of the most curious and, and fascinating uh, topics which one can discuss in relation to this strange piece of work, which is a man. Thank you. Aldous Huxley has just concluded the sixth lecture in the series, What a Piece of Work is a Man, recorded at Kresge Auditorium while he was Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities at MIT. Next week, Mr. Huxley will consider human potentialities. The program was produced by WGBH-FM Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters. This is the NAEB Radio Network. The NAEB Radio Network presents Aldous Huxley with the seventh lecture in a series entitled What a Piece of Work is a Man. This lecture, a consideration of human potentialities, was tape recorded at Kresge Auditorium, MIT, for broadcast at this time. Aldous Huxley is introduced by Professor Roy Lamson of the Department of Humanities at MIT. Ladies and gentlemen, even from the first lecture, no introduction to Aldous Huxley was necessary. This one, too, uh, would be superfluous except as an opportunity to thank him for being here at MIT these last two months. I know I bring the sincere thanks of the Institute and the MIT community to him. And I also bring the thanks of the seniors and the staff of Course 21 who have had the opportunity of discussing with him the lectures that you've all heard. And I think I bring the thanks of those who have sat in quiet without chairs and those who, in Avernus below, have listened without seeing. While I'm on this business of thanks, I'd like to thank Voodoo, <laughs> MIT's comic magazine, for those of you who don't know, which has immortalized the MIT freshman by having him carry an Aldous Huxley banner as a sign of the beginning of his intellectual life. <laughs> Along with our thanks, we also welcome Aldous Huxley back here to MIT during the centennial next April. On occasion, it is characteristic of Aldous Huxley to begin a lecture with a few quotations from authors East and West, near and far, past and present. In introducing him in the final lecture of this year, as Carnegie visiting Centennial Professor of Humanities, I should like to quote one author. His name is Bishop Joseph Hall, an English churchman, satirist, and moralist. Bishop Hall, some 300 years ago, published a book called Characters of Virtues and Vices. And in those essays, he characterized men, the wise man, the honest man, the valiant man, and so forth. And from his writing, I quote a prophetic, 
although partial description of the speaker tonight. Bishop Hall wrote in his good seventeenth-century prose, There is nothing that he desires not to know. He loves to be guessed at, not known, and to see the world unseen. He loves rather to give than to take honor. His free discourse runs back to the ages past, and recovers events out of memory, and then cometh before time in flying forward to future things. Then comparing one with the other, he can give a verdict well near prophetical, wherein his conjectures are better than another's judgments. He walks ever in all, and dares not but subject every work and action to a high and just censure. The title of the lecture tonight is Human Potentialities. Well, I'll reserve my thanks to the end, and I think I'd better start directly with this large and complicated subject of human potentialities. Let us begin by asking a question. What would have happened? Uh, what would have happened to a child of a uh, 170 IQ born into a Paleolithic family at the time of, say, the cave paintings of Lascaux? Well, quite obviously, I mean, even if he was as intelligent as Professor Wiener, he could have hardly have developed cybernetics at that period. Uh, he could have been nothing except a, a hunter and a food gatherer. There was no other opportunity for him to be anything else. And now the interesting fact is, of course, that the biologists assure us that um, physiologically, anatomically, we are very much the same as we were 20,000 years ago, and that we are using fundamentally the same equipment as the Aurignacian man you know, to uh, produce incredibly different results that we have in the course of these 20,000 years uh, actualized an immense number of things which at that time and for many, many centuries thereafter were wholly potential and latent in man. And this, I think, gives us reason for a tempered optimism in regard to the future. I think there are still a great many potentialities of a desirable kind, of course also of an undesirable kind, but I think there are still great potentialities for rationality, for affection and kindliness, for creativity, are still lying latent in man. And it may be, since everything has speeded up so enormously in recent years, it may be that we shall find methods for going almost as far beyond the point where we have reached now. Uh, we may find methods for going beyond it within a few hundred years, to go beyond it as far as we have succeeded in going beyond our Ignatian ancestors uh, in 20,000 years. I, I think this is not an entirely uh, fantastic belief. Uh, the uh, neurologists assure us that uh, nobody, no human being, has ever made use of more than perhaps as much as 10% of all the neurons in his brain. And perhaps, uh, if we set about it in the right way, we may be able to produce extraordinary uh, things out of this strange piece of work that a man is. Well, uh, there are, of course, geneticists who talk about the possibilities of, uh, of eugenics, and quite clearly it would be possible to, to breed a more efficient type of man, but I think this is so far out of any uh, question of practical politics at the moment that it's not worth discussing, and, and also we, uh, at present we really don't know what to breed for. We, we all the the most that we can say is that there are certain undesirable things which we would like to breed against, but when it comes to the positive side, we don't, I think, know enough to be uh, practical geneticists yet. So I won't uh, talk about that at all, but consider what can be done with the kind of human beings that we are at present. Now, I would think that one of the most important things we have to think about 
uh, in relation uh, to human beings and to the possibility of actualizing more of our desirable potentialities. One of the important uh, points which we should stress, I feel, more than we do now, is the fact of human differences. Now, uh, human differences are in their way just as important as human similarities. Uh, human beings are unique. We, the, the species is more variable than any other species. And every type of human being, every individual who can be, of course, he can be categorized as a continuous in a system of continuous variables within a three-pole system. Every individual has a right to his own place in the system and a right to develop according to his own constitution and temperament. And I, I think that uh, this, we shall find increasingly, is a matter of, of very great importance in getting the best out of human beings. Uh, that is to say, uh, recognizing the fact of their intrinsic difference and trying in each case to work out means by which they can, every individual can be helped to actualize his potentialities in his particular place uh, in the general scheme of human beings. And now, of course, this fact has been recognized from time immemorial that uh, no, no single one ideal uh, is suitable for all human beings. After all, within the Christian tradition, we have the two ideals of the way of Martha and the way of Mary, the way of action and the way of contemplation. And within the Oriental framework, we have, a, I think, a rather more realistic division of uh, human beings, uh, where there, there are three main ideals. In the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna says that there are three ways of coming to uh, enlightenment, to salvation. There is the way of bhakti, the way of, uh, of devotion, there's the way of karma yoga, the way of, of selfless action, and there is the way of jnana yoga, the way of contemplation. And these three polar extremes correspond very closely, I think, to some of the mo most recent uh, uh, ideas about the categorizing of human beings. They correspond to the French idea which was uh, popular in the earlier half of the 19th century of the, of the three types, what was called the digestive type, the muscular type, the cerebral type, and uh, correspond closely to the idea of the three poles of hu possible viable human variability which uh, Sheldon has outlined, the, uh, the um, endomorph, mesomorph, and ectomorph. Uh, and I think it, <clears throat> we shall find that probably, in due course, it will be found valuable to develop types of differential education for children of, uh, uh, certainly for those uh, at the extreme limits uh, of these uh, polar distinctions. Uh, we, after all, now have seen the value of differential education in regard to the, uh, both to the intellectually uh, highly gifted and to the intellectually under gifted. But I think we shall find it valuable to ha have differential education not merely, so to say, on the vertical level, but also on the horizontal level. That it will be useful to take children according to the, their uh, nature of their temperament and give them slightly different kinds of training. One of the valuable things I think will be to uh, to so to say, temper the wind to the shorn lamb, above all, to not to plunge the extreme, linear, thin, sensitive, introverted child into the midst of husky, extroverted uh, mesomorphs, which causes a great deal of, of suffering on the part of the child. And there are, of course, I mean, we live in a world where People like Freud have said that, uh, extra, uh, that, uh, that extroversion is the way of health for everybody. Well, this is obviously simply not true, that uh, it happened to be true for Freud, who was a, an extremely driving kind of, of um, extrovert. But it is not true for very many people. And in fact, we see throughout civilization, various histories of civilization, that extremely ingenious devices have been made, A, for protecting the 
the introvert from too violent from his too violent fellows and also for finding means for providing safety valves and outlets for the violent people aggressive people without uh, their doing too much harm to other people after all the whole monastic system was in a sense a device for saving the valuable introverted people from too much contact with the uh, feudal classes and devices like the Teutonic Knights and the Templars were methods for canalizing these tremendous aggressive energies of the uh, of the, these types of people into ways which though they might be harmful for inf infidels were not harmful for the, their own societies and these were well, these were very ingenious devices which I think we can certainly profitably imitate in our own way now before I go on to the problems of, of education, uh, I would like to talk about um, some ways of um, developing, of actualizing desirable potentialities, which may have nothing to do with education at all. Uh, these are the ways with, which uh, are essentially chemical and pharmacological. Uh, two or three years ago, it was announced that the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences was engaged uh, on a five-year plan to try to improve um, the intellectual efficiency by pharmacological means. Now th this sounds a little fantastic but I have talked to pharmacologists about this matter and uh, a number of them say this is probably quite possible but it may be possible to <coughs> by pharmacological means which will do and no harm to the organism as a whole, to increase the span of attention, to increase the powers of, of concentration, uh, perhaps to cut down on the necessity for sleep, and various other things, which, uh, which may lead to a very considerable um, increase in uh, general mental efficiency. Uh, seeing the extraordinary rate at which pharmacology is advancing at the present time, I would not be at all surprised if within the next 10 or 20 years something of this kind did become possible and that it, it, may, it may be conceivable that uh, people will be made mentally more efficient by the pharmacological means. But then there is another possibility, uh, which is this, that uh, somebody may discover a really good euphoric something which will make people feel happy without uh, damaging the, their physical organism. Well, psychologically, we know what the two best conditions for uh, effective accomplishment are. The most favorable condition is crisis. People in crisis will do the most extraordinary things, uh, but you can't keep up crisis. So that, uh, you know, the essence of crisis it lasts for a very short time. If it lasts for too long, then it becomes excessive strain and people break down under it. But the other, uh, the other condition under which people uh, function at a very high level in general is a condition of happiness. People who are contented and, and happy, uh, I think that it very frequently happens, I think, that these, this mood of happiness, so to say, lowers the barrier between the conscious and the pre-conscious self, between the the ego and the creative powers, and permits the person to do more and better than he would have uh, uh, if he had not been happy. And also, <coughs> uh, there are other points here. Uh, I mean, I think that it, we may find that uh, if we have a good and completely harmless euphoric, that actually people may be more moral. Uh, Bertrand Russell has pointed out frequently that that the contented and happy people are generally much more virtuous and kindly than unhappy people. And that uh, here again we may see uh, in an indirect way this um, the pharmacological advances contributing to uh, the realization, the actualization of, um, uh, um, of uh, desirable potentialities. Well, now let's come to the <coughs> problem of education. Here, of course, I mean, the, the thing which, of course, is a burning question 
here at MIT and of course at many other uh, places of higher learning is the problem of um, scientific specialization and what is to be done about it. But we cannot, quite obviously, we cannot escape from uh, specialization. And the problem is, how is it to be offset and mitigated? How are the undesirable effects of extreme specialization to be avoided? Well, the um, answer up to the present, of course, has been that it should be that the scientific specialization uh, should be mitigated by courses in the humanities. And this is very good. It is excellent that there should be courses in the humanities. But when we uh, examine the matter a little more closely, we find that, after all, uh, courses in the humanities are courses in the world of symbols, of language. That so that to, uh, a man, as I've kept on repeating in these lectures, is an amphibious creature, and uh, among the worlds in which he lives, the d disparate worlds which he inhabits, are the worlds of immediate experience, more or less immediate, and uh, the worlds of symbols and language. Now, uh, both these worlds of the scientific world and the uh, world of the humanities are both sim worlds of symbols and language. Uh, so that a specialization in one type of symbols is being offset by a specialization in another type of symbols. So that <clears throat> I think we find here that uh, this is finally not very satisfactory, that what we need, perhaps, is uh, some kind of mitigation of all this symbolic uh, specialization in symbolic subject matter by some kind of direct training of the mind body which has to use the symbols and do the living and form concepts and, and thoughts. And um, th this, it seems to me, uh, is one of the, the major problems which confronts us. How are we to find a, a method of teaching people, so to say, the non-verbal humanities uh, in some way to counteract the excessive specialization on uh, the, in the on the level of symbols, both in science and in the conventional uh, liberal arts courses. And incidentally, it's interesting to to reflect that uh, the, the liberal arts of the medieval curriculum were all, with the exception of astronomy and music, were all verbal arts. They were all concerned with words, and even music was treated as a science rather than as a, as a uh, as a pleasure and a, a, and a, an emotional appreciation. And of course, astronomy was was also highly abstract and moralistic. So that almost the entire curriculum in medieval times was it was fully devoted to the uh, to to a verbal training uh, on the level of symbols. And we still inherit this. I mean, we are, I think, a good deal better than the medieval people were in regard to training outside the world of symbols, but we haven't, it seems to me, yet gone far enough in this direction. And here I would um, would like to quote again uh, uh, something which I quoted before, this uh, remarkable phrase of, um, of uh, Spinoza's, where he says, um, uh, teach the body to become capable of many things, in this way, you will perfect the mind and permit it to come to the intellectual love of God. But this is, I, I, the more one reflects on this phrase, the more remarkable it is. And uh, this, I would say, it w would be the kind of, um, of slogan, so to say, the kind of first axiomatic statement of what this, uh, this type of nonverbal education should be. Well, now let's consider the ways in which we could apply this kind of non-verbal humanistic education uh, to uh, human beings. Uh, first of all, we would start, I suppose, with, uh, with perception, which is completely ba basic to all uh, uh, intellectual life. I mean, I think all good thinking good feeling, good willing, uh, are finally dependent upon 
good perception. And we do remarkably little, I think, in the way of, uh, uh, of training uh, the perceptions. Uh, we do something in the realm of music, do quite a lot in the realm of music. We don't do very much in regard to the other special senses. Uh, and we don't do very much, I think, in the realm of seeing, which is probably is the, uh, the most important uh, area of perception, the one which we make use of the most. And <clears throat> there is uh, plenty of work which has been done, which indicates that uh, a proper uh, training in the perceptions, the training above all in seeing, uh, can be of great value uh, to people. It uh, can be used to, um, to help the human being in all kinds of ways, to, to make the, the body more capable of many things. And, and let me, I would like to make a short digression, because I've forgotten a point here, which I think is important to make, that this, um, this type of special uh, training of the non-verbal humanities, the training of the mind-body, is probably particularly important at this time when advancing technology has made a great many of the skillful uses of correlated hand, mind, and eye unnecessary. Uh, if you look at the what we used to be called master works, which were the works uh, masterpieces, a masterpiece was a, a piece of work done by an apprentice to prove that he had learned everything that uh, was to be known about his trade and was fit to become himself a master. Well, the interesting thing about all these, uh, uh, these uh, special skills was that extremely primitive and simple tools were used with immensely skillful hands and eyes and minds to produce very complicated results. Today, we have excessively complicated tools which can produce even more extraordinary results, but with a minimum of, uh, of hand-eye-mind correlation, and often with no hand-mind and eye at all if the, if the machine is completely automatic and foolproof. And this word foolproof is very important, because a foolproof machine or a foolproof organization, it is not only foolproof, it is also spontaneity-proof. It is also inspiration-proof. It is also virtuoso-proof. Uh, so that uh, I, this means, I think, that we are now more than ever in need of this special kind of, of training the body to have uh, these uh, non-verbal skills, because there are so many areas of our life where this is not imposed upon us by the structure of our society and the nature of our technology, uh, that, that we must do consciously what was done to a very large extent unconsciously in the past. Well, now to get back to this, uh, this question uh, of uh, training the perceptions. Now, uh, quite a lot of work, as I say, has been done in this field. I, I know only a little of it, but I've been very struck, for example, by the work which is, was done at the University of Ohio by Professor Samuel Renshaw uh, in the training of, uh, of all the special senses, above all of vision, and uh, by another man at the University of Ohio, Professor Hoyt Sherman, who employed Renshaw's methods uh, in relation to the teaching of art with the very greatest success. And here are two extremely valuable techniques. I can't go into the details of them now, but they have been fully developed. And one of the interesting things uh, seems to be uh, the, when these techniques uh, were applied to elementary schools, it was found that the, the children who underwent this kind of training of the visual sense uh, were developed uh, more rapidly, they, they seemed to be more intelligent, they, they, uh, the, their scholastic performance was better, they were more interested in what they were doing, they, um, and therefore they behaved better. So that uh, there was a great advantages on every level seemed to accrue from this type of training. And as I say, there, uh, a lot of work in these fields has been done, and I think there's a, a very good case for, 
looking into this and seeing what more can be done. Now, of course, the training of the perceptions is only a special aspect of the general training in awareness. Now, I would regard awareness as one of the, the so to say, the absolute values of, of human life. I, I think it's a, it is an absolute good to increase awareness. Um, this is an act of faith, but I, I think that uh, awareness ranks with uh, kindliness and intelligence as uh, as one of the uh, as one of the basic goods which we should try to realize. And of course, from time immemorial, uh, philosophers have been saying, "Know thyself, gnoskite ipsum." But it, it is, of course, very characteristic of our strange civilization that philosophic and moral precepts are given, like "Know thyself." the ideal of self-knowledge, but no means whereby these, this ideal can be implemented or the precept obeyed. No means are offered. And um, it is for this reason of extreme importance that we examine the means. I mean, we, we're, we're full of high ideals and full of noble precepts, but we're extremely short of methods whereby we can fulfill these ideals and obey the precepts. And this is why uh, recent advances uh, in this field seem to me to be particularly welcome. Now, I have been greatly impressed recently by a, a book which uh, published nearly ten years ago uh, by Pearls, Hefferlein and Goodman called Gestalt Therapy, which is, uh, among other things, a huge compendium of means by which uh, awareness can be heightened and extended in every direction. Uh, the uh, therapeutic value of this is quite clear. Uh, what is, is uh, the attempt is being made not to dredge up materials out of the past, but to get people to live in the present. Uh, neurosis, after all, in one of its aspects can really be defined as a person reacting to present challenges in terms of reactions which were appropriate at some time in the past when he had some traumatic or other experience, but which are wholly inappropriate now. And the standard uh, therapeutic method, of course, is to dig up these events out of the past and try to abreact them and get the person to understand them. But an equally good and probably rather better method is to get people here and now to live in the present. And this is precisely what the Gestalt therapists are trying to do. They propose any number of, uh, of very interesting exercises for increasing the people's awareness of the here and now, of events outside themselves, events going on within their bodies, the, the nature of their fantasies, their wills, and so on. Now, this, of course, is, is by no means an entirely new discovery. It's, it's interesting to note that to one of the most successful therapists, a man with a European reputation while he was working, he died in 1925, was the, the Swiss psychotherapist Dr. Vitos, whose methods were essentially the same as those of the, of the um, Gestalt therapists. He uh, treated neuroses, and he treated them by all accounts, even more successfully than the uh, majority of his fellows using these other dredging in the past methods, simply by getting people to be aware of what was going on outside them, what was going on within themselves, or being aware of such a simple act as raising the hand, for example, being aware of, uh, of external things in a completely receptive way, with the minimum of imposition of ideas upon them, but to uh, he, what he encouraged above all in the matter of perception was this matter of pure receptivity. And he did this not merely as a therapeutic method, but he did it also as a way for increasing the enjoyment of life, for teaching people to live better and more satisfactorily. And he summed up his, uh, his philosophy in these words, when you have learned to become more receptive, you will have a greater enjoyment of life, and everything will interest you more. Now here, let me repeat this thing which I've mentioned before about happiness. 
I would say that enjoyment is is a is a categorical imperative in this sense that that um, if we can be interested in things and enjoy them, we shall be freed from many of the temptations for of delinquency. Here again, uh, uh, Russell has. Uh, uh, underlined the fact that the, this chronic boredom in which so many people live uh, certainly encourages to small-scale delinquency and probably also even encourages the fact that and people still tolerate the the idea of war because war is so exciting that they that it's an immense relief from the boredom of ordinary life and of course, it is an extraordinary and I think a very appalling fact that uh, the suicide rate regularly falls in wartime. That uh, it takes a war to make life sufficiently interesting for people not to kill themselves. And this happens even in neutral countries which are not at war. I mean, people are so interested to see what tomorrow's paper will contain that they delay the or put off completely the their ideas of suicide. And it's a, it's a terrible thing that it requires a, a war to make life seem worthwhile and meaningful to immense numbers of people who, to, for whom the ordinary humdrum life of peace seems unutterably boring uh, and who therefore require some kind of, of delinquency to liven things up. And uh, I think Vito's is probably right that uh, if one has been trained uh, to become intensely aware receptively of the of the world and of what is going on life becomes extremely interesting and that many things which seem very dull are seem to be seen to be exciting and beautiful and uh, this um, uh, this i do think is a very important point well we there of course are other areas in which awareness can be trained. Uh, I mean, I think the, the whole area of imagination is one which we do very little to train now, and it is an area of immense importance. Uh, very valuable work has been done in this field uh, by um, Herbert Reed in his uh, Education Through Art. This is a, a very remarkable book which um, shows the, the how the, the faculties of imagination can be you, trained in such a way as to foster the creativity of the uh, person who trains them. And in uh, Gestalt therapy, we find uh, many recipes for the training of the imagination. And uh, there are a number of other books that uh, I happen to have read, and I'm sure there are many more that I haven't read. Uh, I know an excellent little book, for example, for the training of of the imagination of children. It's called Imagination Games uh, by a man called de Mille, uh, which is extremely useful uh, as showing, first of all, how to get children to use their imagination to get more fun out of life, but also what is very, very valuable is to show them how to use their imagination in a preventive and therapeutic way so that they can get out of all kinds of obsessive and painful situations. I mean, for example, a simple device would be in relation to some grown-up who, of whom they are frightened, where they can use their imagination in such a way that they can make this grown-up in their fancy perform ridiculous acts, climb on trees like monkeys, they, they can multiply them, have 20 of them dancing a jig, uh, they can finally throw them into the sea in their imagination. And this is a very valuable procedure, which will... Which will uh, certainly help a great many children to get out of uh, many of their fears. And in the same way, in Gestalt therapy, there are many exercises of the imagination designed precisely to decondition oneself, to get out of the obsessive ruts which we tend to have been, have been, which have been pushed into by our education. And uh, this is a, an immensely powerful instrument which, uh, which can be uh, used. Uh, uh, to uh, help us in innumerable ways. But well, then let me very briefly touch on another uh, 
move, another exercise, another technique of awareness, which is a technique which um, Don Dewey greatly recommended, a technique d devised by the late F.M. Alexander, <clears throat> which is a technique of being aware of what, uh, what uh, Alexander called the use of the self, of being aware of the wrong use of the self, and of taking lessons in the right use, which, uh, uh, again, is too complicated to describe at length. But uh, Dewey was uh, so convinced of its uh, enormous value that in one of the prefaces that he wrote to Alexander's books, he says that uh, Alexander's technique is to education what education is to life in general. It proposes an ideal and provides means whereby that ideal can be realized. But this is obviously extremely high praise. And yet the extraordinary fact is that although Dewey has had an immense influence on you know, education and the minds of educators in general, nobody has paid the slightest attention to this, and that uh, Alexander remains almost unknown. I'm glad to say there is in this area a tiny oasis of Alexanderism at, at Tufts University, and, uh, where some quite interesting research, very interesting research, is going on in relation to his work. But it seems very strange that a method so highly recommended by the this man who after all produced a revolution in education, John Dewey, should have been so totally uh, neglected. Now, finally, before I leave this subject, uh, let me say that the I've mentioned the Gestalt therapy and the work of Vito's in our century. But actually, of course, these kind of techniques go back to an enormous distance into the past, above all in the in Oriental literature. One can find, for example, there's an extraordinary tantric text, which I suppose goes back, I don't know, probably to the beginning of our era, uh, where it, uh, the text is introduced by a kind of interview between Fever and his divine consort, Parvati, the goddess, and the goddess asks him, what is the secret of your kind of um, enlightened consciousness? And he answers by giving her a list of 118 exercises uh, in consciousness, which will help to go forward into this ultimate uh, transforming consciousness. Into uh, They are exercises in psychology for the purpose of uh, developing the end products of what Kumaraswamy called ortology, the science of the self with the large S, the science of the pure ego, the science of the Atman. And uh, in these exercises, which uh, outline methods for becoming conscious of, of every type of human activity, even down to sneezing and, and eating and going to sleep, uh, he suggests so he anticipates um, almost everything that Vito's and the Gestalt therapists uh, uh, have done, and it, it provides a sort of complete curriculum, actually, this of, of what can be uh, done in this uh, field for uh, developing the, um, the mind body, for teaching the body, or we should better state the mind body, to become capable of many things, as uh, as Spinoza put it. Well, now we have to go on to uh, a very important point, which is the the problem of um, actualizing bene benevolence, actualizing love and kindliness, and if possible, preventing the, the opposites from being actualized. Uh, this, of course, is one of the major problems which has always confronted every society. How do we encourage love and benevolence? And how do we prevent uh, these impulses to violence and brutality from uh, breaking out and uh, doing their appalling harm? Well, here again, it's interesting to find that Whereas every, all the great world religions have inculcated love and kindliness and benevolence, virtually none have 
provided means whereby uh, these uh, qualities can be actualized, can be built into the child. And it's a very curious fact that it, it has remained for an extremely obscure, very savage tribe in New Guinea, a tribe described by Margaret Mead, to develop an extremely effective method for building an attitude of love into the child during infancy. Margaret Mead describes uh, this, these methods of the Arapesh. And the Arapesh, unfortunately, uh, the, on this side, they were entirely admirable, but they were a bit sloppy otherwise. They, they seem to lack uh, uh, the ability to do things very well, but I don't think there's any incompatibility between love and, and uh, efficiency. I think it's by no means past the wit of man to combine the two. But the methods which she describes are extremely interesting. The, the, the infant is held by its mother. Is, while it is being nursed, she talks to it, plays with it, caresses it, and uh, to, uh, periodically brings the child into physical contact with, sometimes with other members of the family, other members of the tribe, sometimes with the domestic animals, and always murmuring as she does so the word good, good, well, the child doesn't understand it yet, but of course the tone means something, and when the child learns to speak, uh, this, uh, the uh, significance of the word good will enter its mind, and a real conditioned reflex of an extraordinarily valuable nature will have been built up, and Margaret Mead records how extraordinary it was to discover these uh, children, these Arapesh children, would naturally be alarmed when uh, she came into the hut. I mean, she was of a different color. She was dressed in a wholly different way. She was came from somewhere right outside the tribe. And for a moment, the child would be very frightened. But then the mother would just say, good, good. And the child would immediately run to Margaret Mead and let itself be picked up. And uh, the general attitude towards the other human beings and towards animals was one of trustful affection and um, and liking and benevolence and their their whole pattern of life uh, of the Arapesh uh, was uh, deeply influenced by this uh, this early training. Well, I, we should certainly not be too proud to learn from people, however primitive they may seem, because this seems to be an extraordinarily brilliant invention, and was heaven knows we have need enough of love in the in the this extremely loveless world which we live in. Now, the converse, of course, is, is the problem of how do we uh, deal with the aggressive elements in man, the tendencies towards violence and brutality, which are apt to be very strong. And this is something which has uh, certainly preoccupied people from time immemorial. It is, of course, quite useless to make exhortations and say be good and so on, unless one offers some means whereby these uh, tendencies can somehow be worked off in a harmless way. Well, here again we can probably learn quite a lot from earlier civilizations. Uh, the violent uh, dancing of the Greeks, the Dionysiac orgies, undoubtedly all these things helped greatly to, to get rid of a great deal of aggressive uh, uh, tendencies in man. And um, the problem, of course, is a, is a very, a very grave one. Uh, Professor Gordon Allport has, um, has uh, talked about the extreme difficulties of, uh, of getting rid of prejudice. I mean, he's uh, written at great length on this subject. Uh, and he's reviewed the various things which have been done, for example, to diminish ethnic prejudice, prejudice against uh, racial groups. And he does come to a rather pessimistic conclusion that uh, very few of these methods are really effective, that uh, probably the only really effective one is some kind of individual therapy. Well, obviously you can't individually therapize, therapize millions of people. And... Um, uh, 
we obviously must find some way in which these kind of uh, of uh, violent uh, drives which evidently give a profound psychological re pleasure to people i mean they, uh, these kind of violences pay so to say a high psychological dividend uh, as blake said years ago damn braces bless relaxes and people like being braced rather than relaxed uh, and there is a a real satisfaction to be got out of this i mean which we understand now quite well what the physiological basis of this is that there is a release of the adrenaline which many people find very satisfactory in fairly small quantities i mean i think there are many people who are genuine adrenaline addicts but, uh, so they fly into a rage and do very violent things because they get a real kick out of it. And we, we have to discover ways by which this kind of desire for having lots of adrenaline can be got rid of. In the past, after all, it was all very simple because we lived in a, an extremely dangerous world, running away from animals, running away from, from other savage men. And we got rid of our adrenaline in that way. But in a world where everybody is virtually sedentary people are sitting in cars on foam rubber this uh, presents a very very serious problem and we quite clearly have to discover ways by which this kind of of physiological product of violence which is also a cause of all kinds of of uh, evil tendencies can be worked off now years ago um, William James wrote an essay, which is still very interesting, called The Moral Equivalence of War, where he laid out some ideas for finding some kind of equivalence and which would satisfy people instead of war. But I, his suggestions, I don't think, go nearly far enough. And I think unquestionably we have to work out a great many new uh, devices uh, for uh, getting rid of, uh, of these uh, dangerous and, uh, and disturbing factors in man. Um, as I say, we, I think there are plenty of precedents in earlier civilizations, some among primitive people, some among quite highly civilized people, which we could probably examine and reinterpret in the light of what we now know about the hormones and uh, other physiological uh, aspects of, of the body. And I think it is perfectly possible that we could uh, develop uh, a means whereby a lot of the, what seem to be now quite normal, drives towards violence and uh, cruelty could be uh, got rid of with, uh, uh, without doing much harm to other people. Well, I think I've said enough to show that there, there is a great deal to be done that uh, I have naturally been able to touch only on a few aspects of this enormous subject. But I think I've said enough to show that there, there would be a very good case for a systematic examination uh, of these various fields I've touched upon, and no doubt of other fields too, to see where we could find material which would be of value to us in this task of realizing desirable potentialities. I could envisage one of the uh, big uh, foundations, for example, uh, setting up a research project. It, I don't think it would be necessarily very expensive, uh, for, simply for examining what has been found empirically to work in these various fields. They would have to be prepared to look into material which wasn't exclusively scientific. Some of it would seem rather queer and phony and, and primitive. But after all, truth lives at the bottom of a well, and the well is very often muddy. And we mustn't be put off by the mud, because the truth may be sitting there. And um, my own feeling is that if this were looked into, uh, if all the empirical findings were found, if the general principles underlying the findings were, were determined, because undoubtedly there are general principles underlying these uh, different uh, methods of 
of helping people to realize their potentialities. And then if uh, systems could be worked out experimentally whereby uh, these findings could be applied on every level of education from the kindergarten uh, upwards to the grave, uh, then I think uh, an enormous uh, revolution in education, not merely of children but of adults, could be achieved. And uh, my own view is that this is not um, um, merely utopian fantasy, that it is, it is, so to say, topian. I mean, utopian means no place, and then the opposite of that is, is topian, a place. I mean, that it is conceivable that it would work here and now in the sort of place we live in. I, I don't see any reason why this sort of thing, if it were carefully investigated and experimented with, should not yield something which would be extremely helpful, which would, once it got started, would probably develop in all kinds of, of new ways. So that, as I say, I am, in a tempered way, extremely optimistic about what could be done if we, if we would only pay attention to what has to have attention paid to it, and systematically try to discover what has been done, what might be done, how it could be applied on a large scale. And um, in this way, I do think we should be able to be of um, great help in making a better world for ourselves and in making it possible for more people to realize more of the potentialities which undoubtedly still lie latent in, in practically, and uh, no, not practically everybody, in everybody. Well, with this, let me close and end by thanking everybody for the great kindness which has been shown to me here. I, the, the only thing I've had to have to complain about here is that I, I've had to talk too much. One should never talk excessively. I won't spend more time listening than talking, but this has been my function here. But I have, thank goodness, had uh, many opportunities of listening to extremely interesting people, both uh, on the undergraduate and on the level and among the faculty. And I'm very grateful for, for this and very grateful too for, uh, as Dr. Lampson said, for these people who have sat so quietly without chairs. Thank you. Aldous Huxley has just concluded the seventh and final lecture in the series, What a Piece of Work is a Man. These lectures were recorded at Kresge Auditorium while he was Carnegie Visiting Professor of Humanities at MIT. The programs were produced by WGBH-FM Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters. This is the NAEB Radio Network.